section one of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World performed in Her Majesty's ships The Resolution and Adventure in the years 1772, 1773, 1774 and 1775, written by James Cook, commander of the Resolution, in which is included Captain Furneaux's narrative of his proceedings in the adventure during the separation of the ships in two volumes, illustrated with maps and charts and a variety of portraits of persons and views and places, drawn during the voyage by Mr. Hodges and engraved by the most eminent masters. Volume 2, Book 3, From Ulitea to New Zealand, Chapter 1. Passage from Ulitea to the Friendly Islands, with a description of several islands that were discovered and the incidents which happened in that trek. 1774 June. On the 6th, being the day after leaving Ulitea, at 11 o'clock a.m., we saw land bearing northwest which, upon a nearer approach, was found to be a low reef island about four leagues in compass and of a circular form. It is composed of several small patches connected together by breakers, the largest lying on the northeast part. This is Howe Island, discovered by Captain Wallace, who, I think, sent his boat to examine it, and, if I have not been misinformed, found a channel through within the reef near the northwest part. The inhabitants of Litea speak of an uninhabited island about this situation, called by them Mopea, to which they go at certain seasons for turtle. Perhaps this may be the same, as we saw no signs of inhabitants upon it. Its latitude is 16 degrees 46 minutes south, longitude 154 degrees 8 minutes west. From this day to the 16th we met nothing remarkable, and our course was west southerly. The winds variable from north round by the east to southwest, attended with cloudy, rainy, unsettled weather and a southerly swell. We generally brought to or stood up on a wind during night, and in the day made all the sail we could. About half an hour after sunrise this morning, land was seen from the top mast head, bearing north-northeast. We immediately altered the course, and steering for it, found it to be another reef island, composed of five or six woody inlets, connected together by sandbanks and breakers enclosing a lake, into which we could see no entrance. We ranged the west and northwest coasts, from its southern to its northern extremity, which is about two leagues, and so near the shore that at one time we could see the rocks under us. Yet we found no anchorage, nor saw we any signs of inhabitants. There were plenty of various kinds of birds, and the coast seemed to abound with fish. The situation of this isle is not very distant from that assigned by Mr. Dalrymple for La Sagittaria, discovered by Quiros, but by the description the discoverer has given of it, it cannot be the same. For this reason, I looked upon it as a new discovery and named it Palmerston Island in honour of Lord Palmerston, one of the Lords of the Admiralty. It is situated in latitude 18 degrees 4 minutes south, 
longitude 163 degrees 10 minutes west. At four o'clock in the afternoon we left this isle and resumed our course to the west by south with a fine steady gale easterly till noon on the 20th at which time being in latitude 18 degrees 50 minutes longitude 168 degrees 52 minutes we thought we saw land to south southwest and hauled up for it accordingly but two hours after we discovered our mistake and resumed our course west by south soon after we saw land from the masthead in the same direction and as we drew nearer found it to be an island which at five o'clock bore west distant five leagues here we spent the night plying under the topsails and at daybreak next morning bore away steering to the northern point and ranging the west coast at a distance of one mile till near noon then perceiving some people on the shore and landing seeming to be easy we brought two and hoisted out two boats with which i put off to the land accompanied by some of the officers and gentlemen as we drew near the shore some of the inhabitants who were on the rocks retired to the woods to meet us as we supposed and we afterwards found our conjectures right we landed with ease in a small creek and took post on a high rock to prevent a surprise here we displayed our colours and mr forster and his party began to collect plants etc the coast was so overrun with woods bushes plants stones etc that we could not see forty yards round us i took two men and with them entered a kind of chasm which opened away into the woods we had not gone far before we heard the natives approaching upon which i called to mr forster to retire to the party as i did likewise we had no sooner joined than the islanders appeared at the entrance of a chasm not a stone's throw from us we began to speak and make all the friendly signs we could think of to them which they answered by menaces and one of two men who were advanced before the rest threw a stone which struck mr sparman on the arm upon this two muskets were fired without order which made them all retire under cover of the woods and we saw them no more after waiting for some little time until we were satisfied nothing was to be done here the country being so overrun with bushes that it was hardly possible to come to parley with them we embarked and proceeded down along shore in hopes of meeting with better success in another place after ranging the coast for some miles without seeing a living soul or any convenient landing place we at length came before a small beach on which lay four canoes here we landed by means of a little creek formed by the flat rocks before it with a view of just looking at the canoes and to leave some medals nails etc in them for not a soul was to be seen the situation of this place was to us worse than the former a flat rock lay next to the sea behind it a narrow stone beach this was bounded by a perpendicular rocky cliff of unequal height whose top was covered with shrubs two deep and narrow chasms in the cliff seemed to open a communication into the country in or before one of these lay the four canoes which we were going to look at but in the doing of this i saw we should be exposed to an attack from the natives if there were any without being in a situation proper for defence to prevent this as much as could be and to secure a retreat in case of an attack i ordered the men to be drawn up upon the rock from whence they had a view of the heights and only myself and four of the gentlemen went up to the canoes we had been there but a few minutes before the natives 
I cannot say how many, rushed down the chasm out of the wood upon us. The endeavours we used to bring them to a parley were to no purpose, for they came with the ferocity of wild boars and threw their darts. Two or three muskets, discharged in the air, did not hinder one of them from advancing still further and throwing another dart, or rather a spear, which passed close over my shoulder. His courage would have cost him his life had not my musket missed fire, for I was not five paces from him when he threw his spear and had resolved to shoot him to save myself. I was glad afterwards that it happened as it did. At this instant, our men on the rock began to fire at others who appeared on the heights, which abated the ardour of the party we were engaged with and gave us time to join our people when I caused the firing to cease. The last discharge sent all the islanders to the woods from whence they did not return so long as we remained. We did not know that any were hurt. It was remarkable that when I joined our party, I tried my musket in the air, and it went off as well as a piece could do. Seeing no good was to be got with these people or at the isle, as having no port, we returned on board, and having hoisted in the boats, made sail to the west-south-west. I had forgot to mention in its proper order that having put ashore a little before we came to this last place, three or four of us went upon the cliffs where we found the country as before, nothing but coral rocks all overrun with bushes so that it was hardly possible to penetrate into it. And we embarked again with intent to return directly on board till we saw the canoes being directed to the place by the opinion of some of us who thought they heard some people. The conduct and aspect of these islanders occasioned my naming it Savage Island. It is situated in the latitude 19 degrees 1 minute south, longitude 169 degrees 37 minutes west. It is about 11 leagues in circuit, of a round form and good height, and hath deep waters close to its shores. All the sea coast, and as far inland as we could see, is wholly covered with trees, shrubs, etc., amongst which were some coconut trees, but what the interior parts may produce we know not. To judge of the whole garment by the skirts, it cannot produce much for so much as we saw of it consisted wholly of coral rocks, all overrun with woods and bushes. Not a bit of soil was to be seen, the rocks alone supplying the trees with humidity. If these coral rocks were first formed in the sea by animals, how came they thrown up to such a height? Has this island been raised by an earthquake, or has the sea receded from it? Some philosophers have attempted to account for the formation of low isles, such as are in the sea, but I do not know that anything has been said of high islands, or such as I have been speaking of. In this island, not only the loose rocks which cover the surface, but the cliffs which bound the shores are of coral stone, which the continual beating of the sea has formed into a variety of curious caverns, some of them very large. The roof or rock over them being supported by pillars, which the foaming waves have formed into a multitude of shapes and made more curious than the caverns themselves. In one we saw light was admitted through a hole at the top. In another place we observed that the whole roof of one of these caverns had sunk in, and formed a kind of valley above, which lay considerably below the circumjacent rocks. I can say but little of the inhabitants, who I believe are not numerous. They seem to be stout, well-made men, 
were naked except around the waists, and some of them had their faces, breasts, and thighs painted black. The canoes were precisely like those of Amsterdam, with the addition of a little rising like a gunwale on each side of the open part, and had some carving about them, which showed that these people are full as ingenious. Both these islanders and their canoes agree very well with the description Monsieur de Bougainville has given of those he saw off the Isle of Navigators, which lies nearly under the same meridian. After leaving Savage Island, we continued to steer west-southwest with a fine easterly trade wind till the 24th in the evening, when, judging ourselves not far from Rotterdam, we brought to, and spent the night plying under the topsails. At daybreak next morning we bore away west, and soon after saw a string of islands extending from south-southwest by the west to north-northwest. The wind being at northeast, we hauled to northwest, with the view of discovering more distinctly the isles in that quarter but presently after we discovered a reef of rocks ahead, extending on each bow further than we could see. As we could not weather them, it became necessary to tack and bear up to the south to look for a passage that way. At noon the southernmost isle bore southwest, distant four miles. North of this isle were three others, all connected by breakers, which we were not sure did not join to those we had seen in the morning, as some were observed in the intermediate space. Some islands were also seen to the west of those four, but Rotterdam was not yet in sight. Latitude 20 degrees 23 minutes south, longitude 174 degrees 6 minutes west. During the whole afternoon we had little wind, so that at sunset, the southernmost isle bore west-northwest, distant five miles, and some breakers we had seen to the south bore now south-southwest, half-west. Soon after it fell calm, and we were left to the mercy of a great easterly swell, which, however, happened to have no great effect upon the ship. The calm continued until four o'clock the next morning, when it was succeeded by a breeze from the south. At daylight, perceiving a likelihood of a passage between the islands to the north and the breakers to the south, we stretched in west, and soon after saw more islands, both to the southwest and northwest, but the passage seemed open and clear. Upon drawing near the islands, we sounded and found forty-five and forty fathoms a clear sandy bottom. I was now quite easy, since it was in our power to anchor in case of a calm, or to spend the night if we found no passage. Towards noon some canoes came off to us from one of the isles, having two or three people in each, who advanced boldly alongside and exchanged some coconuts and shaddocks for small nails. They pointed out to us Anamoka, or Rotterdam, an advantage we derived from knowing the proper names. They likewise gave us the names of some of the other isles, and invited us much to go to theirs, which they call Cornango. The breeze freshening, we left them astern, and steered for Anamoka, meeting with a clear passage, in which we found unequal sounding, from forty to nine fathoms, depending, I believe, in a great measure, on our distance from the isles which form it. As we drew near the south end of Rotterdam, or Anamaka, we were met by a number of canoes laden with fruit and roots, but as I did not shorten sail, we had but little traffic with them. The people in one canoe inquired for me by name, a proof that these people have an intercourse with those of Amsterdam. They importuned us much to go towards their coast, letting us know, as we understood them, that we might anchor there. This was on the southwest side of the island, where the coast seemed to be sheltered from the south and southeast winds. 
but as the day was far spent, I could not attempt to go in there, as it would have been necessary to have sent first a boat to examine it. I therefore stood for the north side of the island, where we anchored about three-fourths of a mile from shore, the extremes of it bearing south, 88 degrees east to southwest, a cove with a sandy beach at the bottom of it, south 50 degrees east. End of section 1「Section 2 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2 by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 2 Reception at Anamoka, A Robbery and Its Consequences, with a Variety of Other Incidents Departure from the Island A Sailing Canoe Described Some Observations on the Navigation of These Islanders A Description of the Island and of Those in the Neighbourhood with some account of the inhabitants and nautical remarks. 1774 June Before we had well got to an anchor, the natives came off from all parts in canoes, bringing with them yams and shaddocks, which they exchanged for small nails and old rags. One man, taking a vast liking to our lead and line, got hold of it, and in spite of all the threats I could make use of, cut the line with a stone, but a discharge of small shot made him return it. Early in the morning I went ashore with Mr. Gilbert to look for fresh water. We landed in the cove above mentioned, and were received with great courtesy by the natives. After I had distributed some presents amongst them, I asked for water, and was conducted to a pond of it that was brackish, about three-fourths of a mile from the landing place, which I supposed to be the same that Tasman watered at. In the meantime, the people in the boat had laden her with fruit and roots, which the natives had brought down, and exchanged for nails and beads. On our return to the ship, I found the same sort of traffic carrying on there. After breakfast, I went ashore with two boats to trade with the people, accompanied by several of the gentlemen, and ordered the launch to follow with casks to be filled with water. The natives assisted us to roll them to and from the pond, and a nail or a bead was the expense of their labour. Fruits and roots, especially shaddocks and yams, were brought down in such plenty that the two boats were laden, sent off, cleared, and laden a second time before noon, by which time also the launch had got a full supply of water, and the botanical and shooting parties had all come in, except the surgeon, for whom we could not wait, as the tide was ebbing fast out of the cove. Consequently, he was left behind. As there is no getting into the cove with a boat, from between half ebb to half flood, we could get off no water in the afternoon. However, there is a very good landing place without it, near the southern point, where boats can get ashore at all times of the tide. Here some of the officers landed after dinner, where they found the surgeon, who had been robbed of his gun, having come down to the shore some time after the boats had put off, he got a canoe to bring him on board. But as he was getting into her, a fellow snatched hold of the gun and ran off with it. After that, no one would carry him to the ship, and they would have stripped him, as he imagined, had he not presented a toothpick case, which they, no doubt, thought was a little gun. As soon as I heard of this, I landed at the place above mentioned, 
and the few natives who were there fled at my approach. After landing, I went in search of the officers, whom I found in the cove, where we had been in the morning, with a good many of the natives about them. No step had been taken to recover the gun, nor did I think proper to take any, but in this I was wrong. The easy manner of obtaining this gun, which they now, no doubt, thought secure in their possession, encouraged them to proceed in these tricks, as will soon appear. The alarm the natives had caught being soon over, they carried fruit, etc., to the boats, which got pretty well laden before night, when we all returned on board. Early in the morning of the 28th, Lieutenant Clark, with the master and 14 or 15 men, went on shore in the launch for water. I did intend to have followed in another boat myself, but rather unluckily deferred it till after breakfast. The launch was no sooner landed than the natives gathered about her, behaving in so rude a manner that the officers were in some doubt if they should land their casks. But as they expected me on shore soon, they ventured, and with difficulty, got them filled and into the boat again. In the doing of this, Mr. Clerk's gun was snatched from him and carried off, as were also some of the Cooper's tools, and several of the people were stripped of one thing or another. All this was done, as it were, by stealth, for they laid hold of nothing by main force. I landed just as the launch was ready to put off, and the natives, who were pretty numerous on the beach, as soon as they saw me, fled, so that I suspected something had happened. However, I prevailed on many to stay, and Mr. Clark came and informed me of all the preceding circumstances. I quickly came to a resolution to oblige them to make restitution, and for this purpose ordered all the marines to be armed and sent on shore. Mr. Forster and his party being gone into the country, I ordered two or three guns to be fired from the ship in order to alarm him, not knowing how the natives might act on this occasion. These orders being given, I sent all the boats off but one, with which I stayed, having a good many of the natives about me, who behaved with their usual courtesy. I made them so sensible of my intention that long before the marines came, Mr. Clark's musket was brought, but they used many excuses to divert me from insisting on the other. At length, Mr. Edgecombe arriving with the Marines, this alarmed them so much that some fled. The first step I took was to seize on two large double sailing canoes, which were in the cove. One fellow making resistance, I fired some small shot at him and sent him limping off. The natives being now convinced that I was in earnest, all fled. But on my calling on them, many returned, and presently after, the other musket was brought and laid down at my feet. That moment I ordered the canoes to be restored to show them on what account they were detained. The other things we had lost being of less value, I was the more indifferent about them. By this time the launch was ashore for another turn of water, and we were permitted to fill the casks without anyone daring to come near us, except one man who had befriended us during the whole affair and seemed to disapprove of the conduct of his countrymen. On my returning from the pond to the cove, I found a good many people collected together, from whom we understood that the man I had fired at was dead. This story I treated as improbable and addressed a man who seemed of some consequence for the restitution of a cooper's ads we had lost in the morning. He immediately sent away two men as I thought for it, but I soon found that we had greatly mistaken each other, for instead of the ads they brought the wounded man stretched out on a board and laid him down by me to all appearance dead. I was much moved at the sight, but soon saw my mistake 
and that he was only wounded in the hand and thigh. I, therefore, desired that he might be carried out of the sun and sent for the surgeon to dress his wounds. In the meantime, I addressed several people for the ads, for as I now had nothing else to do, I determined to have it. The one I applied the most to was an elderly woman who had always a great deal to say to me from my first landing, but on this occasion she gave her tongue full scope. I understood but little of her eloquence, and all I could gather from her arguments was that it was mean in me to insist on the return of so trifling a thing. But when she found I was determined, she and three or four more women went away, and soon after the ads was brought me, but I saw her no more. This I was sorry for, as I wanted to make her a present, in return for the part she had taken in all our transactions, private as well as public. For I was no sooner returned from the pond, the first time I landed, then this old lady presented to me a girl, giving me to understand she was at my service. Miss, who probably had received her instructions, wanted as a preliminary article a spike nail or a shirt, neither of which I had to give her, and soon made them sensible of my poverty. I thought by that means to have come off with flying colours, but I was mistaken for they gave me to understand I might retire with her on credit. On my declining this proposal, the old lady began to argue with me and then abuse me. Though I comprehended little of what she said, her actions were expressive enough, and showed that her words were to this effect, sneering in my face, saying, What sort of man are you thus to refuse the embraces of so fine a young woman, for the girl certainly did not want beauty, which, however, I could better understand than the abuses of this worthy matron, and therefore hastened into the boat. They wanted me to take the young lady aboard, but this could not be done, as I had given strict orders, before I went ashore, to suffer no woman, on any pretense whatever, to come into the ship, for reasons which I shall mention in another place. As soon as the surgeon got ashore, he dressed the man's wounds and bled him, and was of opinion that he was in no sort of danger, as the shot had done little more than penetrate the skin. In the operation, some poultice being wanting, the surgeon asked for ripe plantains, but they brought sugar cane and having chewed it to a pulp, gave it him to apply to the wound. This being of a more balsamic nature than the other, proves that these people have some knowledge of simples. As soon as the man's wounds were dressed, I made him a present, which his master, or at least the man who owned the canoe, took most probably to himself. Matters being thus settled, apparently to the satisfaction of all parties, we repaired on board to dinner, where I found a good supply of fruit and roots, and therefore gave orders to get everything in readiness to sail. I now was informed of a circumstance which was observed on board, several canoes being at the ship, when the great guns were fired in the morning, they all retired, but one man, who was bailing the water out of his canoe, which lay alongside directly under the guns. When the first was fired, he just looked up, and then, quite unconcerned, continued his work. Nor had the second gun any other effect upon him. He did not stir till the water was all out of his canoe, when he paddled leisurely off. This man had several times been observed to take fruit and nuts out of other canoes and sell them to us. If the owners did not willingly part with them, he took them by force, by which he obtained the appellation of custom house officer. One time after he had been collecting tribute, 
he happened to be lying alongside of a sailing canoe which was on board. One of her people seeing him look another way, and his attention otherwise engaged, took the opportunity of stealing somewhat out of his canoe. They then put off and set their sail. But the man, perceiving the trick they had played him, darted after them, and having soon got on board their canoe, beat him who had taken his things, and not only brought back his own, but many other articles which he took from them. This man had likewise been observed making collections on shore at the trading place. I remember to have seen him there, and, on account of his gathering tribute, took him to be a man of consequence, and was going to make him a present. But some of their people would not let me, saying that he was now Arika, that is chief. He had his hair always powdered with some kind of white dust. As we had no wind to sail this afternoon, a party of us went ashore in the evening. We found the natives everywhere courteous and obliging, so that, had we made a longer stay, it is probable we should have had no more reason to complain of their conduct. While I was now on shore, I got the names of twenty islands, which lie between the northwest and northeast, some of them in sight. Two of them, which lie most to the west, viz. Atafoa and Agao, are remarkable on account of their great height. In Amatafoa, which is the westernmost, we judged there was a volcano by the continual column of smoke we saw daily ascending from the middle of it. Both Mr. Cooper and myself being on shore at noon, Mr. Wales could not wind up the watch at the usual time, and as we did not come on board till late in the afternoon, it was forgotten till it was down. This circumstance was of no consequence, as Mr. Wales had had several altitudes of the sun at this place before it went down, and also had opportunities of taking some after. At daybreak on the 29th, having got under sail with a light breeze at west, we stood to the north for the two high islands, but the wind scanting upon us carried us in among the low isles and shoals, so that we had to ply to clear them. This gave time for a great many canoes to get up with us. The people in them brought for traffic various articles, some roots, fruits and fowls, but of the latter not many. They took in exchange small nails and pieces of any kind of cloth. I believe before they went away, they stripped the most of our people of the few clothes the ladies at Otaheite had left them, for the passion for curiosities was as great as ever. Having got clear of the low isles, we made a stretch to the south, and did but fetch a little to windward of the south end of Anamoka, so that we got little by this day's plying. Here we spent the night making short boards over that space with which we had made ourselves acquainted the preceding day. On the 30th at daybreak, stretched out for Matafoa, with a gentle breeze at west-south-west. Day no sooner dawned than we saw canoes coming from all parts. Their traffic was much the same as it had been the day before, or rather better, for out of one canoe I got two pigs, which were scarce articles here. At four in the afternoon, we drew near the island of Amatafoa, and passed between it and Ogao, the channel being two miles broad, safe and without soundings. While we were in the passage, we had little wind and calms. This gave time for a large sailing double canoe, which had been following us all the day, as well as some others with paddles, to come up with us. I now had an opportunity to verify a thing I was before in doubt about, which was, whether or no some of these canoes did not, in changing tacks, only shift the sail, 
and so proceed with that end foremost, which before was the stern. The one we now saw wrought in this manner. The sail is latin, extending to a latin yard above and to a boom at the foot. In one word, it is like a whole mizzen, supposing the whole foot to be extended to a boom. The yard is slung nearly in the middle, or upon an equipoise. When they change tacks, they throw the vessel up in the wind, ease off the sheet, and bring the heel or tack end of the yard to the other end of the boat, and the sheet in like manner. There are notches or sockets at each end of the vessel, in which the end of the yard fixes. In short, they work just as those do at the Ladrone Islands, according to Mr. Waters' description. Footnote. See Lord Anson's Voyage. End footnote. When they want to sail large or before the wind, the yard is taken out of the socket and squared. It must be observed that all their sailing vessels are not rigged to sail in the same manner. Some, and those of the largest size, are rigged so as to tack about. These have a short but pretty stout mast, which steps on a kind of roller that is fixed to the deck near the forepart. It is made to lean or incline very much forward. The head is forked, on the two points of which the yard rests, as on two pivots, by means of two strong pleats of wood secured to each side of the yard, at about one-third its length from the tack or heel, which, when under sail, is confined down between the two canoes by means of two strong ropes, one, two, and passing through a hole at the head of each canoe. For it must be observed that all the sailing vessels of this sort are double. The tack being thus fixed, it is plain that, in changing tacks, the vessels must be put about. The sail and boom on the one tack will be clear of the mast, and on the other it will lie against it, just as a whole mizzen. However, I am not sure if they do not sometimes unlace that part of the sail from the yard which is between the tack and masthead, and so shift both sail and boom leeward of the mast. The drawings which Mr. Hodges made of these vessels seem to favour this supposition. The outriggers and ropes used for shrouds, etc., are all stout and strong. Indeed, the sail, yard, and boom are altogether of such an enormous weight that strength is required. The summit of Amatafoa was hid in the clouds the whole day, so that we were not able to determine with certainty whether there was a volcano or no. But everything we could see concurred to make us believe there was. This island is about five leagues in circuit. Ogao is not so much, but more round and peaked. They lie in the direction of north-northwest, half-west from Anamaka, eleven or twelve leagues distant. They are both inhabited, but neither of them seemed fertile. We were hardly through the passage before we got a fresh breeze at south. That moment all of the natives made haste to be gone, and we steered to the west, all sails set. I had some thoughts of touching at Amsterdam, as it lay not much out of the way, but as the wind was now, we could not fetch it, and this was the occasion of my laying my design aside altogether. Let us now return to Anamoka, as it is called by the natives. It is situated in the latitude of 20 degrees 15 minutes south, longitude 174 degrees 31 minutes west, and was first discovered by Tasman, and by him named Rotterdam. It is of a triangular form, each side whereof is about three and a half or four miles. A saltwater lake in the middle of it occupies not a little of its surface, and in a manner cuts off the southeast angle. Round the island, that is from the northwest to the south, round by the north and east, 
lie scattered a number of small isles, sandbanks and breakers. We could see no end to their extent to the north, and it is not impossible that they reach as far south as Amsterdam or Tonga Tabu. These, together with Middleburg or Iaawi and Pilestart, make a group containing about three degrees of latitude and two of longitude, which I have named the Friendly Islands or Archipelago, as a firm alliance and friendship seems to subsist among their inhabitants, and their courteous behaviour to strangers entitles them to that appellation, under which we might perhaps extend their group much further, even down to Boscawen and Keppel's Isles, discovered by Captain Wallace, and lying nearly under the same meridian, and in the latitude of 15 degrees 53 minutes. For, from the little account I have had of the people of these two isles, they seem to have the same sort of friendly disposition we observed in our archipelago. The inhabitants, productions, etc. of Rotterdam, and the neighbouring isles, are the same as at Amsterdam. Hogs and fowls are, indeed, much scarcer, of the former having got but six, and not many of the latter. Yams and shaddocks were what we got the most of. Other fruits were not so plenty. Not half of the isle is laid out in enclosed plantations, as at Amsterdam, but the parts which are not enclosed are not less fertile or uncultivated. There is, however, far more wasteland on this isle, in proportion to its size than upon the other, and the people seem to be much poorer, that is, in cloth, matting, ornaments, etc., which constitute a great part of the riches of the South Sea Islanders. The people of this isle seem to be more affected with the leprosy or some scrofulous disorder than any I have seen elsewhere. It breaks out in the face more than any other part of the body. I have seen several whose faces were ruined by it and their noses quite gone. In one of my excursions, happening to peep into a house where one or more of them were, one man only appeared at the door or hole by which I must have entered, and which he began to stop up by drawing several parts of a cord across it. But the intolerable stench which came from his putrid face was alone sufficient to keep me out, had the entrance been ever so wide. His nose was quite gone and his whole face in one continued ulcer, so that the very sight of him was shocking. As our people had not all got clear of a certain disease they had contracted at the Society Isles, I took all possible care to prevent its being communicated to the natives here, and I have reason to believe my endeavours succeeded. Having mentioned a house, it may not be amiss to observe that some here differ from those I saw at the other isles, being enclosed or walled on every side, with reeds neatly put together, but not close. The entrance is by a square hole, about two feet and a half each way. The form of these houses is an oblong square, the floor or foundation every way shorter than the eave, which is about four feet from the ground. By this construction, the rain that falls on the roof is carried off from the wall, which otherwise would decay and rot. We did not distinguish any king or leading chief or any person who took upon him the appearance of supreme authority. The man and woman before mentioned, whom I believe to be man and wife, interested themselves on several occasions in our affairs but it was easy to see that they had no great authority. Amongst other things which I gave them as a reward for their service was a young dog and bitch, animals which they have not, but are very fond of, and know very well by name. They have some of the same sort of earthen pots we saw at Amsterdam, and I am of opinion they are of their own manufacture, 
or that of some neighbouring isle. The road, as I have already mentioned, is on the north side of the isle, just to the southward of the southernmost cove, for there are two on this side. The bank is of some extent, and the bottom free from rocks, with twenty-five and twenty fathoms water, one or two miles from the shore. Firewood is very convenient to be got at, and easy to be shipped off, but the water is so brackish that it is not worth the trouble of carrying it on board, unless one is in great distress for want of that article, and can get no better. There is, however, better not only on this isle, but on others in the neighbourhood, for the people brought us some in coconut shells, which was as good as need be, but probably the springs are too trifling to water a ship. I have already observed that the southwest side of the island is covered by a reef or reefs of rocks and small isles. If there be a sufficient depth of water between them and the island, as there appeared to be and a good bottom, this would be a much securer place for a ship to anchor in than that where we had our station. End of section 2 Section 3 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 3, A Passage from the Friendly Isles to the New Hebrides, with an account of the discovery of Turtle Island, and a variety of incidents which happened both before and after the ship arrived in Port Sandwich, in the island of Milicolo. A description of the port, the adjacent country, its inhabitants, and many other particulars. 1774 July. On the 1st of July, at sunrise, a Matafoa was still in sight, bearing northeast, distant 20 leagues. Continuing our course to the west, we, the next day at noon, discovered land bearing northwest by west, for which we steered, and upon a nearer approach, found it to be a small island. At four o'clock it bore from northwest half-west to northwest by north, and at the same time breakers were seen from the masthead, extending from west to southwest. The day being too far spent to make farther discoveries, we soon after shortened sail, hauled the wind, and spent the night making short boards, which at daybreak we found to have been so advantageous that we were farther from the island than we expected, and it was eleven o'clock before we reached the northwest or lee side, where anchorage and landing seemed practicable. In order to obtain a knowledge of the former, I sent the master with a boat to sound, and, in the meantime, we stood on and off with the ship, at this time, four or five people were seen on the reef, which lies round the isle, and about three times that number on the shore. As the boat advanced, those on the reef retired and joined the others, and when the boat landed, they all fled to the woods. It was not long before the boat returned, when the master informed me that there were no soundings without the reef over which, in one place only, he found a boat channel of six feet water. Entering by it, he rode in for the shore, thinking to speak with the people, not more than twenty in number, who were armed with clubs and spears. But the moment he set his foot on shore, they retired to the woods. 
he left on the rocks some medals nails and a knife which they no doubt found as some were seen near the place afterwards this island is not quite a league in length in the direction of northeast and southwest and not half that in breadth it is covered with wood and surrounded by a reef of coral rocks which in some places extend two miles from the shore it seems to be too small to contain many inhabitants and probably the few whom we saw may have come from some isle in the neighborhood to fish for turtle as many were seen near this reef and occasioned that name to be given to the island which is situated in latitude nineteen degrees forty eight minutes south longitude one seventy eight degrees twenty one minutes west seeing breakers to the south southwest which i was desirous of knowing the extent of before night i left turtle isle and stood for them at two o'clock we found they were occasioned by a coral bank of about four or five leagues in circuit by the bearing we had taken we knew these to be the same breakers we had seen the preceding evening hardly any part of this bank or reef is above water at the reflux of the waves the heads of some of the rocks are to be seen near the edge of the reef where it is the shoalest for in the middle is deep water in short this bank wants only a few little islets to make it exactly like one of the half-drowned isles so often mentioned it lies southwest from turtle island about five or six miles and the channel between it and the reef of that isle is three miles over seeing no more shoals or islands and thinking there might be turtle on this bank two boats were properly equipped and sent thither but returned without having seen one the boats were now hoisted in and we made sail to the west with a brisk gale at east which continued till the ninth when we had for a few hours a breeze at northwest attended with squalls of rain this was succeeded by a steady fresh gale at southeast with which we steered northwest being at this time in the latitude of twenty degrees twenty minutes south longitude one seventy six degrees eight minutes east on the fifteenth at noon being in the latitude of fifteen degrees nine minutes south longitude one seventy one degrees sixteen minutes east i steered west the next day the weather was foggy and the wind blew in heavy squalls attended with rain which in this ocean within the tropics generally indicates the vicinity of some high land this was verified at three in the afternoon when high land was seen bearing southwest upon this we took in the small sails reefed the topsails and hauling up for it at half past five we could see it extend from south southwest to north northwest half west soon after we tacked and spent the night which was very stormy in plying our boards were disadvantageous for in the morning we found we had lost ground this indeed was no wonder for having an old suit of sails bent the most of them were split to pieces particularly a foretopsail which was rendered quite useless we got others to the yards and continued to ply being desirous of getting round the south ends of the lands or at least so far to the south as to be able to judge of their extent in that direction for no one doubted that this was the australia del espiritu santo of quiros which monsieur de bougainville calls the great cyclades and that the coast we were now upon was the east coast of aurora island whose longitude is one sixty eight degrees thirty minutes east the gale kept increasing till we were reduced to our low sails so that on the eighteenth at seven in the morning i gave over plying set the topsails double reefed bore up for and hauled round the north end of aurora island and then stretched over for the isle of lepers 
under close reefed topsails and courses with a very hard gale at northeast. But we had now the advantage of a smooth sea, having the Isle of Aurora to windward. At noon, the north end of it bore northeast half north, distant four leagues. Our latitude found by double altitude and reduced to this time was 15 degrees 1 minute 30 seconds south, longitude 168 degrees 14 minutes east. At 2 o'clock p.m., we drew near the middle of the Isle of Lepers and tacked about two miles from land in which situation we had no soundings with a line of seventy fathoms. We now saw people on the shore and many beautiful cascades of water pouring down the neighbouring hills. The next time we stood for this isle, we came to within half a mile of it, where we found thirty fathoms, a sandy bottom. But a mile off we found no soundings at seventy fathoms. Here two canoes came off to us, in one of which were three men, and in the other but one. Though we made all the signs of friendship, we could not bring them nearer than a stone's throw, and they made but a short stay before they retired ashore, where we saw a great number of people assembled in parties and armed with bows and arrows. They were of a very dark colour, and accepting some ornaments at their breast and arms, seemed to be entirely naked. As I intended to get to the south, in order to explore the land which might lie there, we continued to ply between the Isle of Lepers and Aurora, and on the 19th at noon, the south end of the last mentioned isle, born south 24 degrees east, and the north end north, distant 20 miles, latitude observed 15 degrees 11 minutes. The wind continued to blow strong at southeast, so that what we got by plying in the day, we lost in the night. On the 20th at sunrise, we found ourselves off the south end of Aurora, on the northwest side of which the coast forms a small bay. In this we made some trips to try for anchorage, but found no less than 80 fathoms water, the bottom a fine dark sand, at half a mile from shore. Nevertheless, I am of opinion that, nearer, there is much less depth and secure riding, and in the neighbourhood is plenty of fresh water and wood for fuel. The whole island, from the seashore to the summit of the hills, seemed to be covered with the latter, and every valley produced a fine stream of the former. We saw people on the shore and some canoes on the coast, but none came off to us. Leaving the bay just mentioned, we stretched across the channel, which divides Aurora from Whitsuntide Island. At noon we were abreast the north end of this latter, which bore east-north-east, and observed in 15 degrees, 28 minutes and a half. The Isle of Aurora bore from north to north, east, half east, and the Isle of Lepers from north by west to half west to west. Whitsuntide Isle appeared joined to the land to the south and southwest of it, but in stretching to southwest we discovered the separation. This was about 4 o'clock p.m., and then we tacked and stretched in for the island till near sunset, when the wind veering more to the east made it necessary to resume our course to the south. We saw people on the shore, smokes in many parts of the island, and several places which seemed to be cultivated. About midnight, drawing near the south land, we tacked and stretched to the north in order to spend the remainder of the night. At daybreak on the 21st, we found ourselves before the channel that divides Whitsuntide Island from the Southland, which is about two leagues over. At this time, the land to the southward extended from south by east round to the west, farther than the eye could see, and on the part nearest to us, which was of considerable height, 
we observed two very large columns of smoke, which I judged ascended from volcanoes. We now stood south-southwest, with a fine breeze at south-east, and at ten o'clock discovered this part of the land to be an island, which is called by the natives Ambrim. Soon after, an elevated land appeared off the south end of Ambrim, and after that another still higher, on which is a high-peaked hill. We judged these lands to belong to two separate islands. The first came in sight at southeast, the second at east by south, and they appeared to be ten leagues distant. Holding on our course for the land ahead, at noon it was five miles distant from us, extending from south-southeast to northwest by west, and appeared to be continued. The islands to the east bore from northeast by east to southeast by east, latitude observed 16 degrees 17 minutes south. As we drew nearer the shore, we discovered a creek, which had the appearance of being a good harbour, formed by a low point or peninsula projecting out to the north. On this, a number of people were assembled who seemed to invite us ashore, probably with no good intent, as the most of them were armed with bows and arrows. In order to gain room and time to hoist out and arm our boats, to reconnoitre this place, we tacked and made a trip off, which occasioned the discovery of another port about a league more to the south, having sent two armed boats to sound and look for anchorage. On their making the signal for the latter, we sailed in south-south-west and anchored in eleven fathoms water, not two cables length from the south-east shore and a mile within the entrance. We had no sooner anchored than several of the natives came off in canoes. They were very cautious at first, but at last trusted themselves alongside and exchanged for pieces of cloth arrows, some of which were pointed with bone and dipped in some green gummy substance, which we naturally supposed was poisonous. Two men, having ventured on board, after a short stay, I sent them away with presents. Others, probably induced by this, came off by moonlight, but I gave orders to permit none to come alongside, by which means we got clear of them for the night. Next morning early, a good many came round us, some in canoes and others swimming. I soon prevailed on one to come on board, which he no sooner did, then he was followed by more than I desired, so that not only our deck, but rigging, was presently filled with them. I took four into the cabin, and gave them various articles, which they showed to those in the canoes, and seemed much pleased with the reception. While I was thus making friends with those in the cabin, an accident happened that threw all into confusion but in the end, I believe, proved advantageous to us. A fellow in a canoe, having been refused admittance into one of our boats that lay alongside, bent his bow to shoot a poisoned arrow at the boat keeper. Some of his countrymen prevented him doing it that instant, and gave time to acquaint me with it. I ran instantly on deck, and saw another man struggling with him, one of those who had been in the cabin and had leaped out of the window for this purpose. The other seemed resolved, shook him off, and directed his bow again to the boatkeeper, but on my calling to him, pointed it at me. Having a musket in my hand loaded with small shot, I gave him the contents. This staggered him for a moment, but did not prevent him from holding his bow, still in the attitude of shooting. Another discharge of the same nature made him drop it, and the others, who were in the canoe, to paddle off with all speed. At this time some began to shoot arrows on the other side. A musket discharged in the air had no effect, 
but a four-pound shot over their heads sent them off in the utmost confusion. Many quitted their canoes and swam on shore. Those in the great cabin leaped out of the windows, and those who were on the deck and on different parts of the rigging all leaped overboard. After this we took no farther notice of them, but suffered them to come off and pick up their canoes, and some of them even ventured alongside of the ship. Immediately after the great gun was fired, we heard the beating of drums on shore, which was probably the signal for the country to assemble in arms. We now got everything in readiness to land, to cut some wood, which we were in want of, and to try to get some refreshments, nothing of this kind having been seen in any of the canoes. About nine o'clock we put off in two boats, and landed in the face of four or five hundred people who were assembled on the shore. Though they were all armed with bows and arrows, clubs and spears, they made not the least opposition. On the contrary, seeing me advance alone, with nothing but a green branch in my hand, one of them, who seemed to be a chief, giving his bow and arrows to another, met me in the water, bearing also a green branch, which, having exchanged for the one I held, he then took me by the hand and led me up to the crowd. I immediately distributed presents to them, and in the meantime the marines were drawn up upon the beach. I then made signs, for we understood not a word of their language, that we wanted wood and they made signs to us to cut down the trees. By this time, a small pig being brought down and presented to me, I gave the bearer a piece of cloth, with which he seemed well pleased. This made us hope that we might soon have some more, but we were mistaken. The pig was not brought to be exchanged for what we had, but on some other account, probably as a peace offering. For all we could say or do did not prevail on them to bring down, after this, above half a dozen coconuts and a small quantity of fresh water. They set no value on nails or any sort of iron tools, nor indeed on anything we had. They would now and then exchange an arrow for a piece of cloth but very seldom would part with a bow. They were unwilling we should go off the beach, and very desirous we should return on board. At length, about noon, after sending what wood we had cut on board, we embarked ourselves, and they all retired, some one way and some another. Before we had dined, the afternoon was too far spent, to do anything on shore, and all hands were employed setting up the rigging and repairing some defects in it. But seeing a man bring along the strand a boy, which they had taken in the night from the kedge anchor, I went on shore for it, accompanied by some of the gentlemen. The moment we landed it was put into the boat by a man who walked off again without speaking one word. It ought to be observed that this was the only thing they took, or even attempted to take from us by any means whatever. Being landed near one of their plantations and houses, which were just within the skirts of the wood, I prevailed on the man to conduct me to them. But though they suffered Mr. Forster to go with me, they were unwilling any more should follow. These houses were something like those of the other isles, rather low and covered with palm thatch. Some were enclosed or walled round with boards, and the entrance to those was by a square hole at one end, which at this time was shut up, and they were unwilling to open it for us to look in. There were here about six houses, and some small plantations of roots, etc., fence round with reeds as at the friendly isles. There were likewise some breadfruit, coconut and plantain trees 
but very little fruit on any of them. A good many fine yams were piled up upon sticks, or a kind of raised platform, and about twenty pigs and a few fowls were running about loose. After making these observations, having embarked, we proceeded to the southeast point of the harbour, where we again landed and walked along the beach, till we could see the islands to the southeast already mentioned. The names of these we now obtained, as well as the name of that on which we were. This they called Malicolo, footnote, or Malicola. Some of our people pronounce it Manicolo or Manicola, and thus it is also written in Quiros Memorial, as printed by Dalrymple, volume 2, page 146, end of footnote. The island that first appeared over the south end of Ambrin is called Api, and the other with the hill upon it, Paum. We found on the beach a fruit like an orange, called by them Abimora, but whether it is fit for eating, I cannot say, as this was decayed. Proceeding next to the other side of the harbour, we there landed near a few houses at the invitation of some people who came down to the shore but we had not been there five minutes before they wanted us to be gone we complied and proceeded up the harbour in order to sound it and look for fresh water of which as yet we had seen none but the very little that the natives brought which we knew not where they got nor was our search now attended with success but this was no proof that there is not any the day was too far spent to examine the place well enough to determine this point night having brought us on board i was informed that no soul had been off to the ship so soon was the curiosity of these people satisfied as we were coming on board we heard the sound of a drum and I think of some other instruments, and saw people dancing. But as soon as they heard the noise of the oars, or saw us, all was silent. Being unwilling to lose the benefit of the moonlight nights, which now happened, at 7 a.m. on the 23rd, we weighed, and with a light air of wind and the assistance of our boats, proceeded out of the harbour, the south end of which at noon, bore west-south-west, distant about two miles. When the natives saw us under sail, they came off in canoes, making exchanges with more confidence than before, and giving such extraordinary proofs of their honesty as surprised us. As the ship at first had fresh way through the water, several of them dropped astern after they had received our goods and before they had time to deliver theirs in return. Instead of taking advantage of this, as our friends at the Society Isles would have done, they used their utmost efforts to get up with us and to deliver what they had already been paid for. One man in particular followed us a considerable time and did not reach us till it was calm and the thing was forgotten. As soon as he came alongside, he held up the thing, which several were ready to buy, but he refused to part with it till he saw the person to whom he had before sold it, and to him he gave it. The person, not knowing him again, offered him something in return, which he refused, and showed him what he had given him before. Pieces of cloth and marble paper were in most esteem with them, but edge tools, nails and beads they seemed to disregard. The greatest number of canoes we had alongside at once did not exceed eight, and not more than four or five people in each, who would frequently retire to the shore all of a sudden, before they had disposed of half their things, and then others would come off. At the time we came out of the harbour it was about low water, and great numbers of people were then on the shoals or reefs which lie along the shore, looking, as we supposed, for shell or other fish. 
Thus our being on their coast and in one of their ports did not hinder them from following the necessary employments. By this time they might be satisfied we meant them no harm, so that, had we made a longer stay, we might soon have been upon good terms with this ape-like nation. For, in general, they are the most ugly, ill-proportioned people I ever saw, and in every respect different from any we had met with in this area. They are a very dark-coloured and rather diminutive race, with long heads, flat faces, and monkey countenances. Their hair, mostly black or brown, is short and curly, but not quite so soft and woolly as that of a negro. Their beards are very strong, crisp and bushy, and generally black and short. But what most adds to their deformity is a belt or cord which they wear round the waist and tie so tight over the belly that the shape of their bodies is not unlike that of an overgrown pismire. The men grow quite naked, except a piece of cloth or leaf used as a wrapper. Footnote. The particular manner of applying the wrapper may be seen in Wafer's Voyage, which mentions this singular custom as existing, though with some little variation, amongst the Indians of the Isthmus of Darien. See Wafer's Voyage, page 140. End of footnote. We saw but few women, and they were not less ugly than the men. Their heads, faces, and shoulders are painted red. They wear a kind of petticoat, and some of them had something over their shoulders like a bag, in which they carry their children. None of them came off to the ship, and they generally kept at a distance when we were on shore. Their ornaments are earrings made of tortoiseshell and bracelets. A curious one of the latter, four or five inches broad, wrought with thread or cord and studded with shells, is worn by them just above the elbow. Round the right wrist they wear hog's tusks, bent circular, and rings made of shells, and round their left a round piece of wood, which we judged was to ward off the bowstring. The bridge of the nose is pierced, in which they wear a piece of white stone, about an inch and a half long. As signs of friendship, they present a green branch, and sprinkle water with the hand over the head. Their weapons are clubs, spears, and bows and arrows. The two former are made of hard or iron wood. Their bows are about four feet long, made of a stick split down the middle, and are not circular. The arrows, which are a sort of reeds, are sometimes armed with a long and sharp point, made of the hard wood and sometimes with a very hard point made of bone. And these points are all covered with a substance which we took for poison. Indeed, the people themselves confirmed our suspicions by making signs to us not to touch the point, and giving us to understand that if we were prickled by them, we should die. They are very careful of them themselves, and keep them always wrapped up in a quiver. Some of these arrows are formed with two or three points, each with small prickles on the edges, to prevent the arrow being drawn out of the wound. The people of Malicolo seem to be a quite different nation from any we had yet met with, and speak a different language of about 80 words, which Mr. Forster collected, Hardly one bears any affinity to the language spoken at any other island or place I have ever been at. The letter R is used in many of their words, and frequently two or three being joined together, such words we found difficult to pronounce. I observed that they could pronounce most of our words with great ease. They expressed their admiration by hissing like a goose. To judge of the country by the little water we saw of it, it must be fertile, 
but I believe their fruits are not so good as those of the society or friendly isles. Their coconut trees, I am certain, are not, and their breadfruit and plantains did not seem much better. But their yams appeared to be very good. We saw no other animals than those I have already mentioned. They have not so much as a name for a dog, and consequently have none, for which reason we left them a dog in a bitch, and there is no doubt they will be taken care of, as they were very fond of them. After we had got to sea, we tried what effect one of the poisoned arrows would have on a dog. Indeed, we had tried it in the harbour the very first night, but we thought the operation was too slight, as it had no effect. The surgeon now made a deep incision in the dog's thigh, into which he laid a large portion of the poison, just as it was scraped from the arrows, and then bound up the wound with a bandage. For several days after, we thought the dog was not so well as it had been before, but whether this was really so, or only suggested by imagination, I know not. He was afterwards as if nothing had been done to him, and lived to be brought home to England. However, I have no doubt of this stuff being of a poisonous quality, as it could answer no other purpose. The people seemed not unacquainted with the nature of poison, for when they brought us water on shore, they first tasted it, and then gave us to understand we might with safety drink it. This harbour, which is situated on the north-east side of Malicolo, not far from the south-east end, in latitude 16 degrees 25 minutes 20 seconds south, longitude 167 degrees 57 minutes 23 seconds east, I named Port Sandwich. It lies in southwest by south about one league, and is one third of a league broad. A reef of rocks extends out a little way from each point, but the channel is of a good breadth and hath in it from forty to twenty-four fathoms water. In the port the depth of water is from twenty to four fathoms, and it is so sheltered that no winds can disturb a ship at anchor there. Another great advantage is you can lie so near the shore as to cover your people who may be at work upon it. End of section three. Section four of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 4. An Account of the Discovery of Several Islands and an Interview and Skirmish with the inhabitants upon one of them, the arrival of the ship at Tanna, and the reception we met with there. 1774 July. Soon after we got to sea, we had a breeze at east-south-east, with which we stood over for Ambrin till three o'clock in the afternoon, when, the wind veering to the east-north-east, we tacked and stretched to the southeast, and weathered the southeast end of Malicolo, of which we discovered three or four small islands that before appeared to be connected. At sunset, the point bore south 77 degrees west, distant three leagues, from which the coast seemed to trend away west. At this time, the Isle of Ambrim extended from north 3 degrees east to north 65 degrees east. The Isle of Paun, from north 76 degrees east to south 88 degrees east, 
and the Isle of Appy from south 83 degrees east to south 43 degrees east. We stood for this last isle, which we reached by midnight, and then brought to till daybreak on the 24th, when we made sail to the southeast, with a view of plying up to the eastward on the south side of Appy. At sunrise we discovered several more islands, extending from the southeast point of Appy to the south as far as southeast by south. The nearest to us we reached by ten o'clock, and not being able to weather it, we tacked a mile from its shore in fourteen fathoms water. This island is about four leagues in circuit, is remarkable by having three high peaked hills upon it, by which it has obtained that name. In the PM, the wind veering more to the north, we resumed our course to the east, and having weathered three hills, stood for the group of small isles which lie off the southeast point of Appy. These I called Shepherd's Isles, in honour of my worthy friend Dr. Shepherd, Plumian Professor of Astronomy at Cambridge. Having a fine breeze, I had thoughts of going through between them, but the channels being narrow and seeing broken water in the one we were steering for, I gave up the design and bore up in order to go about, or to the south of them. Before this could be accomplished, it fell calm, and we were left to the mercy of the current, close to the isles, where we could find no sounding for the line of an 180 fathoms. We had now land or islands in every direction, and were not able to count the number which lay round us. The mountain on Paun was seen over the east end of Api, bearing north-northwest at eight o'clock. A breeze at southeast relieved us from the anxiety the calm had occasioned, and we spent the night in making short boards. The night before we came out of Port Sandwich, two reddish fish, about the size of large bream, and not unlike them, were caught with hook and line. On these fish most of the officers and some of the petty officers dined the next day. The night following, every one who had eaten of them was seized with violent pains in the head and bones, attended with a scorching heat all over the skin and numbness in the joints. There remained no doubt that this was occasioned by the fish being of a poisonous nature and having communicated its bad effects to all who partook of them, even to the hogs and dogs. One of the former died about 16 hours after. It was not long before one of the latter shared the same fate, and it was a week or ten days before all the gentlemen recovered. These must have been the same sort of fish mentioned by Quiros. Footnote, Dalrymple's Collection of Voyages, Volume 1, pages 140-141, end footnote, under the name of Pargos, which poisoned the crews of his ships, so that it was some time before they recovered, and we should doubtless have been in the same situation had more of them been eaten. At daybreak on the 25th, we made a short stretch to the east of Shepherd's Isles till after sunrise, when, seeing no more land in that direction, we tacked and stood for the island we had seen in the south, having a gentle breeze at southeast. We passed to the east of three hills, and likewise of a low isle, which lies on the southeast side of it, between a remarkable peak rock, which obtained the name of Monument, and a small isle named Two Hills, on account of two peaked hills upon it disjoined by a low and narrow isthmus. The channel between this island and the monument is near a mile broad and 24 fathoms deep. Except this rock, which is only accessible to birds, we did not find an island on which people were not seen. 
At noon, we observed in latitude 17 degrees, 18 minutes 30 seconds, longitude made from Port Sandwich, 45 minutes east. In this situation, the monument bore north 16 degrees east, distant 2 miles. Two hills bore north 25 degrees west, distant 2 miles and in a line with the southwest part of three hills and the islands to the south extended from south 16 degrees 30 minutes east to south 42 degrees west continuing our course to the south at 5 p.m we drew near the southern lands which we found to consist of one large island whose southern and western extremities extended beyond our sight and three or four smaller ones lying off its north side the two northernmost are much the largest having a good height and lie in the direction of east by south and west by north from each other distant two leagues i named the one montague and the other hinchinbrook and the large island sandwich in honour of my noble patron, the Earl of Sandwich. Seeing broken water ahead, between Montague and Hinchinbrook Isles, we tacked, and soon after it fell calm. The calm continued till seven o'clock the next morning, when it was succeeded by a breeze from the westward. During the calm, having been carried by the currents and a southeast swell, four leagues to the west-northwest we passed hinchinbrook isle saw the western extremity of sandwich isle bearing south-southwest about five leagues distant and at the same time discovered a small island to the west of this direction after getting the westerly breeze i steered southeast in order to pass between montague isle and the north end of sandwich isle at noon we were in the middle of the channel and observed in latitude 17 degrees 31 minutes south the distance from one island to the other is about four or five miles but the channel is not much above half that breadth being contracted by breakers we had no soundings in it with a line of 40 fathoms as we passed montague isle several people came down to the seaside and by signs seemed to invite us ashore some were also seen on sandwich island which exhibited a most delightful prospect being spotted with woods and lawns agreeably diversified over the whole surface it hath a gentle slope from the hills which are of a moderate height down to the sea coast this is low and guarded by a chain of breakers so that there is no approaching it at this part but more to the west beyond hinchinbrook island there seem to run it in a bay sheltered from the raining winds the examining it not being so much an object with me as the getting to the south in order to find the southern extremity of the archipelago with this view i steered south south east being the direction of the coast of sandwich island we had but just got through the passage before the west wind left us to variable light airs and calms so that we were apprehensive of being carried back again by the currents or rather of being obliged to return in order to avoid being driven on the shoals as there was no anchorage a line of a hundred and sixty fathoms not reaching to the bottom at length a breeze springing up to southwest we stood to southeast and at sunset the monument bore north fourteen degrees thirty minutes west and montague island north twenty eight degrees west distant three leagues we judged we saw the southeast extremity of sandwich island bearing about south by east we continued to stand southeast till 4 a.m. on the 27th, when we tacked to the west. At sunrise, having discovered a new land bearing south, and making in three hills, 
this occasioned us to tack and stand towards it. At this time, Montague Isle bore north 52 degrees west, distant 13 leagues. At noon, it was nearly in the same direction, and the new land extended from south a half east to south by west, and the three hills seemed to be connected. Our latitude by observation was 18 degrees 1 minute south, and the longitude made from Port Sandwich, 1 degree 23 minutes east. We continued to stand to the southeast with a gentle breeze at southwest and south southwest till the 28th at sunrise, when, the wind veering to the south, we tacked and stood to the west. The three hills mentioned above we now saw, belonging to one island, which extended from south 35 degrees to 71 degrees west, distant about 10 or 12 leagues. 1774 August. Retarded by contrary winds, calms and the currents that set to northwest, we were three days in gaining this space, in which time we discovered an elevated land to the south of this, it first appeared in detached hummocks, but we judged it to be connected. At length, on the 1st of August, about 10 a.m., we got a fine breeze at east-south-east, which soon after veered to northeast, and we steered for the northwest side of the island. Reaching it about 2 p.m., we ranged the west coast at one mile from shore, on which the inhabitants appeared in several parts and by signs invited us to land. We continued to sound without finding bottom, till we came before a small bay or bending of the coast, where, near a mile from shore, we found thirty and twenty-two fathoms water, a sandy bottom. I had thoughts of anchoring here, but the wind almost immediately veered to northwest, which, being nearly on shore, I laid this design aside. Besides, I was unwilling to lose the opportunity that now offered of getting to the southeast, in order first to explore the lands which lay there. I therefore continued to range the coast to the south at about the same distance from shore, but we soon got out of soundings. About a league to the south of this bay, which hath about two miles extent, is another more extensive. Towards the evening, the breeze began to abate, so that it was sunset before we got the length of it. I intended not to stop there, and to stand to the south under an easy sail all night, but at eight o'clock, as we were steering south-south-east, we saw a light ahead, not knowing but it might be on some low detached isle, dangerous to approach while dark, we hauled the wind, and spent the night standing off and on, or rather driving to and fro, for we had but very little wind. At sunrise on the second we saw no more land than the coast we were upon but found that the currents had carried us some miles to the north, and we attempted to little purpose to regain what we had lost. At noon we were about a league from the coast, which extended from south-south-east to north-east, latitude observed, 18 degrees 45 minutes south. In the afternoon, finding the ship to drift not only to the north, but inshore also, and being yet to the south of the bay, we passed the day before, I had thoughts of getting to an anchor before night, while we had it in our power to make choice of a place. With this view, having hoisted out two boats, one of them was sent ahead to tow the ship, in the other Mr. Gilbert went to sound for anchorage. Soon after, the towing boat was sent to assist him, so much time was spent in sounding this bay that the ship drove past, which made it necessary to call the boats on board 
to tow her off from the northern point. But this service was performed by a breeze of wind, which that moment sprang up at southwest, so that as the boats got on board, we hoisted them in, and then bore up for the north side of the island, intending once more to try to get round by the east. Mr. Gilbert informed me that at the south part of the bay he found no sounding still close to a steep stone beach where he landed to taste a stream of water he saw there, which proved to be salt. Some people were seen there, but they kept at a distance. Farther down the coast, that is to the north, we found twenty, twenty-four, and thirty fathoms, three-fourths of a mile or a mile from shore, the bottom of fine dark sand. On the third at sunrise, we found ourselves abreast a lofty promontory on the southeast side of the island and about three leagues from it. Having but little wind and that from the south, right in our teeth, and being in want of firewood, I sent Lieutenant Clark with two boats to a small islet, which lies off the promontory, to endeavour to get some. In the meantime, we continued to ply up with the ship, but what we gained by our sails, we lost by the current. At length, towards noon, we got a breeze at east, south, east, and east with which we could lie up for the head, and soon after Mr. Clark returned, having not been able to land on account of a high surf on the shore. They met with no people on the isle, but saw a large bat and some birds, and caught a water snake. At six o'clock p.m. we got in with the land under the northwest side of the head, where we anchored in seventeen fathoms water, the bottom of fine dark sand, half a mile from shore, the point of the head bearing north eighteen degrees east, distant half a league, the little islet before mentioned, northeast by east a half east, and the northwest point of the bay, north thirty two degrees west. Many people appeared on the shore and some attempted to swim off to us. But having occasion to send the boat ahead to sound, they retired as she drew near them. This, however, gave us a favourable idea of them. On the fourth at daybreak, I went with two boats to examine the coast, to look for a proper landing place, wood and water. At this time the natives began to assemble on the shore, and by signs invited us to land. I went first to a small beach, which is towards the head, where I found no good landing on account of some rocks which everywhere line the coast. I, however, put the boat's bow to the shore, and gave cloth, medals, etc., to some people who were there. For this treatment they offered to haul the boats over the breakers to the sandy beach, which I thought a friendly offer, but had reason afterwards to alter my opinion. When they found I would not do as they desired, they made signs for us to go down into the bay, which we accordingly did, and they ran along shore abreast of us, their number increasing prodigiously. I put into the shore in two or three places, but, not liking the situation, did not land. By this time, I believe, the natives conceived what I wanted, as they directed me round a rocky point, where, on a fine sandy beach, I stepped out of the boat without wetting a foot, in the face of a vast multitude, with only a green branch in my hand which I had before got from one of them. I took but one man out of the boat with me, and ordered the other boat to lie to at a little distance off. They received me with great courtesy and politeness, and would retire back from the boat on my marking the least motion with my hand. A man 
whom I took to be a chief, seeing this, made them form a semicircle round the boat's bow, and beat such as attempted to break through this order. This man I loaded with presents, giving likewise to others, and asked by signs for fresh water, in hopes of seeing where they got it. The chief immediately sent a man for some, who ran to a house, and presently returned with a little in a bamboo, so that I gained but little information by this. I next asked by the same means for something to eat, and they as readily bought me a yam and some coconuts. In short, I was charmed with their behaviour, and the only thing which could give the least suspicion was that most of them were armed with clubs, spears, darts, and bows and arrows. For this reason, I kept my eye continually upon the chief, and watched his looks as well as his actions. He made many signs to me to haul the boat up upon the shore, and at last slipped into the crowd, where I observed him speak to several people, and then returned to me, repeating signs to haul the boat up, and hesitating a good deal, before he would receive some spike nails, which I then offered him. This made me suspect something was intended, and immediately I stepped into the boat, telling them by signs that I should soon return. But they were not for parting so soon, and now attempted by force, what they could not obtain by gentler means. The gang board happened unluckily to be laid out for me to come into the boat. I say unluckily, for if it had not been out, and if the crew had been a little quicker in getting the boat off, the natives might not have had time to put their design in execution, nor would the following disagreeable scene have happened. As we were putting off the boat, they laid hold of the gangboard and unhooked it off the boat's stern. But as they did not take it away, I thought this had been done by accident and ordered the boat in again to take it up. Then they themselves hooked it over the boat's stern, and attempted to haul her ashore. Others at the same time snatched the oars out of the people's hands. On my pointing a musket at them, they were in some measure desisted, but returned in an instant, seemingly determined to haul the boat ashore. At the head of this party was the chief. The others, who could not come at the boat, stood behind with darts, stones, and bows and arrows in hand, ready to support them. Signs and threats having no effect, our own safety became the only consideration. And yet I was unwilling to fire on the multitude, and resolved to make the chief alone fall a victim to his own treachery but my musket at this critical moment missed fire. Whatever idea they might have formed of the arms we held in our hands, they must now have looked upon them as childish weapons, and began to let us see how much better theirs were, by throwing stones and darts, and by shooting arrows. This made it absolutely necessary for me to give orders to fire. The first discharge threw them into confusion, but a second was hardly sufficient to drive them off the beach, and after all they continued to throw stones from behind the trees and bushes, and every now and then to pop out and throw a dart. Four lay, to all appearance, dead on the shore, but two of them afterwards crawled into the bushes. Happy it was for these people, that not half our muskets would go off, otherwise many more must have fallen. We had one man wounded in the cheek with a dart, the point of which was as thick as my finger, and yet it entered above two inches, which shows that it must have come with great force, though indeed we were very near them. An arrow struck Mr. Gilbert's naked breast, who was about thirty yards off, 
but probably it had struck something before, for it hardly penetrated the skin. The arrows were pointed with hard wood. As soon as we got on board, I ordered the anchor to be weighed, with a view of anchoring near the landing place. While this was doing, several people appeared on the low rock point, displaying two oars we had lost in the scuffle. I looked on this as a sign of submission, and of their wanting to give us the oars. I was, nevertheless, prevailed on to fire a four-pound shot at them, to let them see the effect of our great guns. The ball fell short, but frightened them so much that none were seen afterwards, and they left the oars standing up against the bushes. It was now calm, but the anchor was hardly at the bow before a breeze sprung up at north, of which we took the advantage set our sails and plied out of the bay as it did not seem capable of supplying our wants with that conveniency i wished to have besides i always had it in my power to return to this place in case i should find none more convenient farther south these islanders seemed to be a different race from those of malicolo and spoke a different language they are of the middle size, have a good shape and tolerable features. Their colour is very dark and they paint their faces, some with black and others with red pigment. Their hair is very curly and crisp and somewhat woolly. I saw a few women and I thought them ugly. They wore a kind of petticoat made of palm leaves or some plant like it. But the men, like those of Malicolo, were in a manner naked, having only the belt about their waist, and the piece of cloth or leaf used as a wrapper. Footnote. The particular manner of, of applying the wrapper may be seen in Wafer's Voyage, who mentions this singular custom as existing, though with some little variation, amongst the Indians of the Isthmus of Darien. See Wafer's Voyage, page 140. End footnote. I saw no canoes with these people, nor were any seen in any part of this island. They live in houses covered with thatch, and their plantations are laid out by a line and fenced round. At two o'clock in the afternoon, we were clear of the bay, bore up round the head, and steered south south east for the south end of the island, having a fine breeze at northwest. On the southwest side of the head is a pretty deep bay, which seemed to run in behind the one on the northwest side. Its shores are low, and the adjacent lands appeared very fertile. It is exposed to the southeast winds, for which reason, until it be better known, the northwest bay is preferable because it is sheltered from the rainy winds, and the winds to which it is open fizz from northwest by north to east by north, seldom blow strong. The promontory or peninsula which disjoins these two bays I named Traitor's Head from the treacherous behaviour of its inhabitants. It is the northeast point of the island, situated in the latitude 18 degrees 43 minutes south, longitude 169 degrees 28 minutes east, and terminates in a saddle hill, which is of height sufficient to be seen 16 or 18 leagues. As we advanced to south-southeast, the new island we had before discovered began to appear over the southeast point of the one near us, bearing south a half east, distant 10 or 12 leagues. After leaving this one, we steered for the east end of the other, being directed by a great light we saw upon it. At one o'clock the next morning, drawing near the shore, we tacked and spent the remainder of the night making short boards. At sunrise, we discovered a high tableland, an island, 
bearing east by south, and a small low island in the direction of north-north-east, which we had passed in the night without seeing it. Traitor's Head was still in sight, bearing north 20 degrees west, distant 15 leagues, and the island to the south extended from south 7 degrees west to south 87 degrees west, distant 3 or 4 miles. We then found that the light we had seen in the night was occasioned by a volcano, which we observed to throw up vast quantities of fire and smoke, with a rumbling noise heard at a great distance. We now made sail for the island, and presently after, discovered a small inlet, which had the appearance of being a good harbour. In order to be better informed, I sent away two armed boats, under the command of Lieutenant Cooper, to sound it, and in the meanwhile we stood on and off with the ship to be ready to follow or give them any assistance they might want. On the east point of the entrance we observed a number of people and several houses and canoes, and when our boats entered the harbour they launched some and followed them, but came not near. It was not long before Mr. Cooper made the signal for anchorage and we stood in with the ship. The wind being at west and our course south-southwest, we borrowed close to the west point and passed over some sunken rocks, which might have been avoided by keeping a little more to the east or about one-third channel over. The wind left us as soon as we were within the entrance and obliged us to drop an anchor in four fathoms water. After this, the boats were sent again to sound, and in the meantime, the launch was hoisted out in order to carry out anchors to warp in by as soon as we should be acquainted with the channel. While we were thus employed, many of the natives got together in parties on several parts of the shore, all armed with bows, spears, etc. Some swam off to us, Others came in canoes. At first they were shy and kept at the distance of a stone's throw. They grew insensibly bolder, and at last came under our stern and made some exchanges. The people in one of the first canoes, after coming as near as they durst, threw towards us some coconuts. I went into a boat and picked them up giving them in return some cloth and other articles. This induced others to come under the stern and alongside, where their behaviour was insolent and daring. They wanted to carry off everything within their reach. They got hold of the fly of the ensign and would have torn it from the staff. Others attempted to knock the rings off the rudder, but the greatest trouble they gave us was to look after the boys of our anchors, which were no sooner thrown out of our boats or let go from the ship than they got hold of them. A few muskets fired in the air had no effect, but a four-pounder frightened them so much that they quitted their canoes that instant and took to the water. But as soon as they found themselves unhurt, they got again into their canoes, gave us some halloos, flourished their weapons, and returned once more to the boys. This put us to the expense of a few musketoon shot, which had the desired effect. Although none were hurt, they were afterwards afraid to come near the boys. Very soon all retired on shore, and we were permitted to sit down to dinner undisturbed. During these transactions, a friendly old man in a small canoe made several trips between us and the shore, bringing off each time a few coconuts or a yam, and taking in exchange whatever we gave him. Another was on the gangway when the great gun was fired, but I could not prevail on him to stay there long. Towards the evening, after the ship was moored, I landed at the head of the harbour in the southeast corner with a strong party of men, without any opposition being made, 
by a great number of the natives who were assembled in two parties, the one on our right and the other on our left, armed with clubs, darts, spear slings and stones, bows and arrows, etc. After distributing to the old people, for we can distinguish no chief, and some others, presents of cloth, medals, etc., I ordered two casks to be filled with water out of a pond about twenty paces behind the landing place, giving the natives to understand that this was one of the articles we wanted. Besides water, we got from them a few coconuts, which seemed to be in plenty on the trees, but they could not be prevailed upon to part with any of their weapons. These they held in constant readiness and in the proper attitudes of offence and defence, so that little was wanting to make them attack us. At least we thought so by their pressing so much upon us, and in spite of our endeavours to keep them off. Our early re-embarking probably disconcerted their scheme, and after that they all retired. The friendly old man before mentioned was in one of these parties, and we judge from his conduct that his temper was pacific. End of section four. Section five of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 5, Part 1. An intercourse established with the natives, some account of the island, and a variety of incidents, that happened during our stay at it. August 1774. As we wanted to take in a large quantity, both of wood and water, and as, when I was on shore, I had found it practicable to lay the ship much nearer the landing place than she now was, which would greatly facilitate that work, as well as over all the natives, and enable us better to cover and protect the working party on shore. With this view, on the 6th, we went to work to transport the ship to the place I designed to moor her in. While we were about this, we observed the natives assembling from all parts and forming themselves into two parties, as they did the preceding evening, one on each side the landing place, to the amount of some thousands armed as before. A canoe, sometimes conducted by one, and at other times by two or three men, now and then came off, bringing a few coconuts or plantains. These they gave us without asking for any return, but I took care they should always have something, their chief design seemed to invite us on shore. One of those who came off was the old man, who had already ingratiated himself into our favour. I made him understand by signs that they were to lay aside their weapons, took those which were in the canoe and threw them overboard, and made him a present of a large piece of cloth. There was no doubt but he understood me, and made my request known to his countrymen. For as soon as he landed, we observed him to go first to the one party, and then to the other. Nor was he ever after, seen by us with anything like a weapon in his hand. After this, three fellows came in a canoe under the stern, one of them brandishing a club, with which he struck the ship's side, and committed other acts of defiance, but at last offered to exchange it for a string of beads and some other trifles. 
These were sent down to him by a lion, but the moment they were in his possession, he and his companions paddled off in all haste, without giving the club or anything else in return. This was what I expected, and indeed what I was not sorry for, as I wanted an opportunity to show the multitude on shore the effect of our firearms without materially hurting any of them. Having a fowling piece loaded with small shot, number three, I gave the fellow the contents, and when they were above musket shot off, I ordered some of the musketoons or war pieces to be fired, which made them leap out of the canoe, keep under her offside, and swim with her ashore. This transaction seemed to make little or no impression on the people there. On the contrary, they began to halloo and to make sport of it. After mooring the ship by four anchors with her broadside to the landing place, hardly musket shot off, and placing our artillery in such a manner as to command the whole harbour, I embarked with the marines and a party of seamen in three boats and rowed in for the shore. It hath been already mentioned that the two divisions of the natives were drawn up on each side the landing place. They had left a space between them of about thirty or forty yards, in which were laid to the most advantage a few small bunches of plantains, a yam, and two or three roots. Between these and the water were stuck upright in the sand, for what purpose I never could learn, four small reeds, about two feet from each other, in a line at right angles to the shore, where they remained for two or three days after. The old man before mentioned, and two more, stood by these things, inviting us by signs to land. But I had not forgot the trap I was so near being caught in at the last island, and this looked something like it. We answered by making signs for the two divisions to retire farther back and give us more room. The old man seemed to desire them so to do, but no more regard was paid to him than to us. More were continually joining them, and except two or three old men, not one unarmed. In short, everything conspired to make us believe they meant to attack us as soon as we should be on shore, the consequence of which was easily supposed. Many of them must have been killed and wounded, and we should hardly have escaped unhurt. Two things I equally wished to prevent. Since, therefore, they would not give us the room required, I thought it better to frighten them into it than to oblige them by the deadly effect of our firearms. I accordingly ordered a musket to be fired over the party on our right, which was by far the strongest body, but the alarm it gave them was momentary. In an instant they recovered themselves and began to display their weapons. One fellow showed us his backside in a manner which plainly conveyed his meaning. After this I ordered three or four more muskets to be fired. This was the signal for the ship to fire a few great guns, which presently dispersed them, and then we landed and marked out the limits on the right and left by a line. Our old friend stood his ground, though deserted by his two companions, and I rewarded his confidence with a present. The natives came gradually to us, seemingly in a more friendly manner, some even without their weapons, but by far the greatest part brought them. And when we made signs to lay them down, they gave us to understand that we must lay down ours first. Thus all parties stood armed. The presents I made to the old people 
and to such as seemed to be of consequence, had little effect on their conduct. They indeed climbed the coconut trees and threw us down the nuts, without requiring anything from them, but I took care that they should always have something in return. I observed that many were afraid to touch what belonged to us, and they seemed to have no notion of exchanging one thing for another. I took the old man, whose name we now found to be Pao Wang, to the woods and made him understand I wanted to cut down some trees to take on board the ship, cutting some down at the same time, which we put into one of our boats, together with a few small casks of water, with a view of letting the people see what it was we chiefly wanted. Pao Wang very readily gave his consent to cut wood, nor was there any one who made the least objection. He only desired the coconut trees might not be cut down. Matters being thus settled, we embarked and returned on board to dinner, and immediately after they all dispersed. I never learnt that any one was hurt by our shot, either on this or the preceding day, which was a very happy circumstance. In the afternoon, having landed again, we loaded the launch with water, and having made three hauls with the same, caught upwards of three hundred pounds of mullet and other fish. It was some time before any of the natives appeared, and not above twenty or thirty at last, amongst whom was our trusty friend Pao Wang, who made us a present of a small pig, which was the only one we got at this isle, all that was offered to us. During the night the volcano, which was about four miles to the west of us, vomited up vast quantities of fire and smoke, as it had also done the night before, and the flames were seen to rise above the hill which lay between us and it. At every eruption it made a long rumbling noise like that of thunder, or the blowing up of large mines. A heavy shower of rain, which fell at this time, seemed to increase it, and the wind blowing from the same quarter, the air was loaded with its ashes, which fell so thick that everything was covered with the dust. It was a kind of fine sand or stone, ground or burnt to powder, and was exceedingly troublesome to the eyes. Early in the morning of the 7th, the natives began again to assemble near the watering place, armed as usual, but not in such numbers as at first. After breakfast we landed, in order to cut wood and fill water. I found many of the islanders more inclined to be friends with us, especially the old people. On the other hand, most of the younger were daring and insolent, and obliged us to keep to our arms. I stayed till I saw no disturbance was like to happen, and then returned to the ship, leaving the party under the command of lieutenants Clark and Edgecombe. When they came on board to dinner, they informed me that the people continued to behave in the same inconsistent manner as in the morning but more especially one man, whom Mr. Edgecombe was obliged to fire at, and believed he had struck with a swan shot. After that the others behaved with more discretion, and as soon as our people embarked they all retired. While we were sitting at dinner, an old man came on board, looked into many parts of the ship, and then went ashore again. In the afternoon, only a few of those who lived in the neighbourhood, with whom we were now upon a tolerable footing, made their appearance at the watering place. Pao Wang brought us an axe, which had been left by our people, either in the woods or on the beach, and found by some of the natives. A few other articles were afterwards returned to us, which either they had stolen or we had lost by our negligence, so careful were they now 
not to offend us in this respect. Early the next morning, I sent the launch, protected by a party of marines in another boat, to take in ballast, which was wanted. This work was done before breakfast, and after it, she was sent for wood and water, and with her, the people employed in this service, under the protection of a sergeant's guard, which was now thought sufficient, as the natives seemed to be pretty well reconciled to us. I was told that they asked our people to go home with them, on condition they stripped naked as they were. This shows that they had no design to rob them, whatever other they might have. On the ninth, I sent the launch for more ballast, and the guard and wooders to the usual place. With these I went myself, and found a good many of the natives collected together, whose behaviour, though armed, was courteous and obliging, so that there was no longer any occasion to mark out the limits by a line. They observed them without this precaution, as it was necessary for Mr. Wales's instruments to remain on shore all the middle of the day, the guard did not return to dinner, as they had done before, till relieved by others. When I came off, I prevailed on a young man, whose name was Wa Agu, to accompany me. Before dinner, I showed him every part of the ship, but did not observe that anything fixed his attention a moment, or caused in him the least surprise. He had no knowledge of goats, dogs, or cats, calling them all hogs, booga or bugus. I made him a present of a dog and a bitch, as he showed a liking to that kind of animal. Soon after he came on board, some of his friends followed in a canoe and inquired for him, probably doubtful of his safety. He looked out of the quarter gallery, and having spoken to them, they went ashore and quickly returned with a cock, a little sugar cane and a few coconuts as a present to me. Though he sat down with us, he did but just taste our salt pork, but ate pretty heartily of yam, and drank a glass of wine. After dinner I made him presents, and then conducted him ashore. As soon as we landed, the youth and some of his friends took me by the hand, with a view, as I understood, to conduct me to their habitations. We had not gone far before some of them, for what reason I know not, were unwilling I should proceed, in consequence of which the whole company stopped, and, if I was not mistaken, a person was dispatched for something or other to give me, for I was desired to sit down and wait, which I accordingly did. During this interval several of our gentlemen passed us, at which they showed great uneasiness, and importuned me so much to order them back, that I was at last obliged to comply. They were jealous of our going up the country, or even along the shore of the harbour. While I was waiting here, our friend Pao Wang came with a present of fruit and roots, carried by about twenty men, in order, as I supposed, to make it appear the greater. One had a small bunch of plantains, another a yam, a third a coconut, etc. But two men might have carried the whole with ease. This present was in return for something I had given him in the morning. However, I thought the least I could do now was to pay the porters. After I had dispatched Pao Wang, I returned to Wa Agu and his friends, who were still for detaining me. They seemed to wait with great impatience for something, and to be unwilling and ashamed to take away the two dogs without making me a return. As night was approaching, I pressed to be gone, with which they complied, and so we parted. 
The preceding day, Mr. Forster learned from the people the proper name of the island, which they call Tanner. And this day I learned from them the names of those in the neighbourhood. The one we touched at last is called Eromango. The small isle, which we discovered the morning we landed here, Ima. The table island to the east, discovered at the same time, Eronan, or Futuna. And an island which lies to the southeast, Anatom. All these islands are to be seen from Tana. They gave us to understand, in a manner which I thought admitted of no doubt, that they eat human flesh, and that circumcision was practised among them. They began the subject of eating human flesh of their own accord by asking us if we did. Otherwise, I should never have thought of asking them such a question. I have heard people argue that no nation could be cannibals if they had other flesh to eat or did not want food, thus deriving the custom from necessity. The people of this island can be under no such necessity. They have fine pork and fowls and plenty of roots and fruits. But since we have not actually seen them eat human flesh, it will admit of doubt with some whether they are cannibals. When I got on board, I learned that when the launch was on the west side of the harbour taking in ballast, one of the men employed in this work had scalded his fingers in taking a stone up out of some water. This circumstance produced the discovery of several hot springs at the foot of the cliff and rather below high water mark. This day Mr. Wales and two or three of the officers advanced a little for the first time into the island. They met with a small straggling village, the inhabitants of which treated them with great civility, and the next morning Mr. Forster and his party made another excursion inland. They met with several fine plantations of plantains, sugar canes, yams, etc., and the natives were courteous and civil. Indeed, by this time the people, especially those in our neighbourhood, were so well reconciled to us that they showed not the least dislike of our rambling about in the skirts of the woods, shooting, etc. In the afternoon, some boys having got behind thickets and having thrown two or three stones at our people who were cutting wood, they were fired at by the petty officers present on duty. Being ashore at that time, I was alarmed at hearing the report of the muskets, and seeing two or three boys run out of the wood. When I knew the cause, I was much displeased at so wanton an use being made of our firearm, and took measures to prevent it for the future. Wind southerly with heavy showers of rain. During the night, and also all the 11th, the volcano was exceedingly troublesome and made a terrible noise, throwing up prodigious columns of fire and smoke at each explosion, which happened every three or four minutes, and at one time great stones were seen high in the air. Besides the necessary work of wooding and watering, we struck the main topmast to fix new trestle trees and backstays. Mr. Forster and his party went up the hill on the west side of the harbour, where he found three places from whence smoke of a sulphurous smell issued through cracks and fissures in the earth. The ground about these was exceedingly hot and parched or burnt, and they seemed to keep pace with the volcano, for at every explosion of the latter, the quantity of smoke or steam in these was greatly increased and forced out so as to rise in small columns, which we saw from the ship and had taken for common fires made by the natives. At the foot of this hill are the hot springs before mentioned. In the afternoon, 
Mr. Forster having begun his botanical researches on the other side of the harbour, fell in with our friend Pao Wang's house, where he saw most of the articles I had given him, hanging from the adjoining trees or bushes, as if they were not worthy of being under his roof. On the 12th, some of the officers accompanied Mr. Forster to the hot places he had been at the preceding day. A thermometer placed in a little hole made in one of them rose from 80, at which it stood in the open air, to 170. Several other parts of the hill emitted smoke or steam all the day, and the volcano was unusually furious, insomuch that the air was loaded with its ashes. The rain which fell at this time was a compound of water, sand and earth, so that it might properly be called showers of mire. Whichever way the wind was, we were plagued with the ashes, unless it blew very strong indeed from the opposite direction. Notwithstanding, the natives seemed well enough satisfied with the few expeditions we had made in the neighbourhood, they were unwilling we should extend them farther. As a proof of this, some undertook to guide the gentlemen, when they were in the country, to a place where they might see the mouth of the volcano. They very readily embraced the offer, and were conducted down to the harbour, before they perceived the cheat. The thirteenth wind at northeast gloomy weather. The only thing worthy of note this day was that Pao Wang being at dinner with us on board, I took the opportunity to show him several parts of the ship and various articles in hopes of finding out something which they might value and be induced to take from us in exchange for refreshments. For what we got of this kind was trifling but he looked on everything that was shown him with the utmost indifference nor did he take notice of any one thing except a wooden sandbox which he seemed to admire and turned it two or three times over in his hand next morning after breakfast a party of us set out for the country to try if we could not get a nearer and better view of the volcano we went by the way of one of those smoking hot places before mentioned and dug a hole in the hottest part into which a thermometer of fahrenheit's construction was put and the mercury presently rose to one hundred degrees it remained in the hole two minutes and a half without either rising or falling the earth about this place was a kind of white clay had a sulphurous smell, and was soft and wet, the surface only excepted, over which was spread a thin dry crust that had upon it some sulphur and a vitriolic substance tasting like alum. The place affected by the heat was not above eight or ten yards square, and near it were some fig trees which spread their branches over part of it, and seemed to like their situation. We thought that this extraordinary heat was caused by the steam of boiling water, strongly impregnated with sulphur. I was told that some of the other places were larger than this, though we did not go out of the road to look at them, but proceeded up the hill through a country so covered with trees, shrubs and plants, that the breadfruit and coconut trees, which seem to have planted here by nature, were in a manner choked up. Here and there we met with a house, some few people, and plantations. These latter we found in different states, some of long standing, others lately cleared, and some only clearing, and before anything had been planted. The clearing of a piece of ground for cultivation seemed to be a work of much labour, considering the tools they had to work with, which, though much inferior to those at the Society Islands, are of the same kind. 
Their method is, however, judicious and as expeditious as it can well be. They lop off the small branches of the large trees, dig under the roots, and there burn the branches and small shrubs and plants which they root up. The soil in these parts is a rich black mould. In other parts, it seemed to be composed of decayed vegetables and of the ashes the volcano sends forth throughout all its neighbourhood. Happening to turn out of the common path, we came into a plantation where we found a man at work who, either out of good nature or to get us the sooner out of his territories, undertook to be our guide. We followed him accordingly, but had not gone far before we came to the junction of two roads, in one of which stood another man with a sling and a stone, which he thought proper to lay down when a musket was pointed at him. The attitude in which we found him, the ferocity appearing in his looks, and his behaviour after, convinced us that he meant to defend the path he stood in. He, in some measure, gained his point, for our guide took the other road and we followed, but not without suspecting he was leading us out of the common way. The other man went with us likewise, counting us several times over, and hallooing, as we judged, for assistance, for we were presently joined by two or three more, among whom was a young woman with a club in her hand. By these people we were conducted to the brow of a hill and shown a road leading down to the harbour which they wanted us to take. Not choosing to comply, we returned to that we had left, which we pursued alone, our guide refusing to go with us. After ascending another ridge, as thickly covered with wood as those we had come over, we saw yet other hills between us and the volcano, which seemed as far off as at our first setting out. This discouraged us from proceeding farther, especially as we could get no one to be our guide. We therefore came to a resolution to return, and had but just put this in execution when we met between twenty and thirty people, whom the fellow before mentioned had collected together with the design, as we judged, to oppose our advancing into the country. But as they saw us returning, they suffered us to pass unmolested. Some of them put us into the right road, accompanied us down the hill, made us stop by the way to entertain us with coconuts, plantains and sugar cane. And what we did not eat on the spot they brought down the hill with us. Thus we found these people hospitable, civil and good-natured, when not prompted to a contrary conduct by jealousy, a conduct I cannot tell how to blame them for, especially when I consider the light in which they must view us. It was impossible for them to know our real design. We enter their ports without their daring to oppose, we endeavour to land in their country as friends, and it is well if this succeeds. We land nevertheless, and maintain the footing we have got by the superiority of our firearms. Under such circumstances, what opinion are they to form of us? Is it not as reasonable for them to think that we are come to invade their country as to pay them a friendly visit? Time and some acquaintance with us can only convince them of the latter. These people are yet in a rude state, and if we may judge from circumstances and appearances, are frequently at war, not only with their neighbours but among themselves, consequently must be jealous of every new face. I will allow there are some exceptions to this rule to be found in this sea, but there are few nations who would willingly suffer visitors like us to advance far into their country. End of section 5
Section 6 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3 Chapter 5, Part 2, An Intercourse Established with the Natives, Continued. Before this excursion, some of us had been of opinion that these people were addicted to an unnatural passion, because they had endeavoured to entice some of our men into the woods, and in particular I was told that one who had the care of Mr. Forster's plant bag had been once or twice attempted. As the carrying of bundles, etc., is the office of the women in this country, it had occurred to me, and I was not singular in this, that the natives might mistake him and some others for women. My conjecture was fully verified this day, for this man, who was one of the party, and carried the bag as usual, following me down the hill, by the words which I understood of the conversation of the natives, and by their actions, I was well assured that they considered him as a female, till, by some means, they discovered their mistake, on which they cried out, Eramanga! Eramanga! It is a man! It is a man! The thing was so palpable that every one was obliged to acknowledge that they had before mistaken his sex, and that, after they were undeceived, they seemed not to have the least notion of what we had suspected. This circumstance will show how liable we are to form wrong conjectures of things among people whose language we are ignorant of. Had it not been for this discovery, I make no doubt that these people would have been charged with this vile custom. In the evening I took a walk with some of the gentlemen into the country on the other side of the harbour, where we had very different treatment from what we had with in the morning. The people we now visited, among whom was our friend Pao Wang, being better acquainted with us, showed a readiness to oblige us in everything in their power. We came to the village which had been visited on the ninth. It consisted of about twenty houses, the most of which need no other description than comparing them to the roof of a thatched house in England, taken off the walls and placed on the ground. Some were open at both ends, others partly closed with reeds, and all were covered with palm thatch. A few of them were thirty or forty feet long, and fourteen or sixteen broad. Beside these they have other mean hovels, which I conceived were only to sleep in. Some of these stood in a plantation, and I was given to understand that in one of them lay a dead corpse. They made signs that described sleep or death, and circumstances pointed out the latter. Curious to see all I could, I prevailed on an elderly man to go with me to the hut, which was separated from the others by a reed fence, built quite round it at a distance of four or five feet. The entrance was by a space in the fence, made so low as to admit one to step over. The two sides and one end of the hut were closed or built up in the same manner and with the same materials as the roof. The other end had been open, but was now well closed with mats, which I could not prevail on the man to remove or suffer me to do it. There hung at this end of the hut a matted bag or basket, in which was a piece of roasted yam and some sort of leaves, all quite fresh. 
I had a strong desire to see the inside of the hut, but the man was peremptory in refusing this, and even showed an unwillingness to permit me to look into the basket. He wore round his neck, fastened to a string, two or three locks of human hair, and a woman present had several about her neck. I offered something in exchange for them, but they gave me to understand they could not part with them, as it was the hair of the person who lay in the hut. Thus I was led to believe that these people dispose of the dead in a manner similar to that of Otaheite. The same custom of wearing the hair is observed by the people of that island and also by the New Zealanders. The former make tamau of the hair of their deceased friends, and the latter make earrings and necklaces of their teeth. Near most of their large houses were fixed, upright in the ground, the stems of four coconut trees in a square position about three feet from each other. Some of our gentlemen who first saw them were inclined to believe they were thus placed on a religious account, but I was now satisfied that it was for no other purpose but to hang coconuts on to dry. For when I asked, as well as I could, the use of them, a man took me to one, loaded with coconuts from the bottom to the top, and no words could have informed us better. Their situation is well chosen for this use, as most of their large houses are built in an open airy place, or where the wind has a free passage from whatever direction it blows. Near most, if not all of them, is a large tree or two, whose spreading branches afford an agreeable retreat from the scorching sun. This part of the island was well cultivated, open and airy. The plantations were laid out by line, abounding with plantains, sugar canes, yams and other roots, and stocked with fruit trees. In our walk, we met with our old friend Pao Wang, who, with some others, accompanied us to the waterside and brought with them, as a present, a few yams and coconuts. On the 15th, having finished wooding and watering, a few hands only were on shore making brooms the rest being employed on board, setting up the rigging, and putting the ship in a condition for sea. Mr. Forster, in his botanical excursion this day, shot a pigeon, in the craw of which was a wild nutmeg. He took some pains to find the tree, but his endeavours were without success. In the evening, a party of us, walked to the eastern seashore in order to take the bearing of Anatom and Eranan or Fortuna. The horizon proved so hazy that I could see neither, but one of the natives gave me, as I afterwards found, the true direction of them. We observed that in all or most of their sugar plantations were dug holes or pits four feet deep and five or six in diameter. And on our inquiring their use, we were given to understand that they caught rats in them. These animals, which are very destructive to the canes, are here in great plenty. The canes, I observed, were planted as thick as possible round the edge of these pits, so that the rats in coming at them are the more liable to tumble in. Next morning we found the tiller sprung in the rudder head, and by some strange neglect we had not a spare one on board, which we were ignorant of till now it was wanting. I knew but of one tree in the neighbourhood fit for this purpose, which I sent the carpenter on shore to look at, and an officer with a party of men to cut it down, provided he could obtain leave of the natives. If not, 
he was ordered to acquaint me. He understood that no one had any objection and set the people to work accordingly. But as the tree was large, this required some time. And before it was down, word was brought to me that our friend Pao Wang was not pleased. Upon this, I gave orders to desist, as we found that, by scarfing a piece to the inner end of the tiller and letting it farther into the rudder head, it would still perform its office. But as it was necessary to have a spare one on board, I went on shore, sent for Pao Wang, made him a present of a dog and a piece of cloth, and then explained to him that our great steering paddle was broken and that I wanted that tree to make a new one. It was easy to see how well pleased everyone present was with the means I took to obtain it. With one voice they gave their consent, Pao Wang joining his also, which he perhaps could not have done without the others, for I do not know that he had either more property or more authority than the rest. This point being obtained, I took our friend on board to dinner, and after it was over, went with him ashore to pay a visit to an old chief who was said to be king of the island, which was a doubt with me. Pao Wang took little or no notice of him. I made him a present, after which he immediately went away, as if he got all he came for. His name was Georgi, and they gave him the title of Arika, he was very old, but had a merry open countenance. He wore around his waist a broad red and white checkered belt, the materials and manufacture of which seemed to be the same as that of Otahiti cloth, but this was hardly a mark of distinction. He had with him a son, not less than 45 or 50 years of age, a great number of people were at this time at the landing place, most of them from distant parts. The behaviour of many was friendly, while others were daring and insolent, which I thought proper to put up with, as our stay was nearly at an end. On the 17th, about 10 o'clock, I went ashore and found in the crowd old Georgi and his son, who soon made me understand that they wanted to dine with me, and accordingly I brought them and two more on board. They all called them Arikas, or kings, but I doubt if any of them had the least pretensions to that title over the whole island. It had been remarked that one of these kings had not authority enough to order one of the people up into a coconut tree, to bring him down some nuts. Although he spoke to several, he was at last obliged to go himself, and, by way of revenge, as it was thought, left not a nut on the tree, taking what he wanted himself, and giving the rest to some of our people. When I got them on board, I went with them all over the ship, which they viewed with uncommon surprise and attention. We happened to have for their entertainment a kind of pie or pudding made of plantains and some sort of greens which we had got from one of the natives. On this and on yams they made a hearty dinner, for as to the salt beef and pork, they would hardly taste them. In the afternoon, having made each of them a present of a hatchet, a spike nail, and some medals, I conducted them ashore. Mr. Forster and I then went over to the other side of the harbour, and having tried with Fahrenheit's thermometer, the head of one of the hot springs, we found that the mercury rose to 191 degrees. At this time, the tide was up within two or three feet of the spring, so that we judged it might, in some degree, be cooled by it. We were mistaken, however, 
for on repeating the experiment next morning, when the tide was out, the mercury rose no higher than 187 degrees, but at another spring, where the water bubbled out of the sand from under the rock at the southwest corner of the harbour, the mercury in the same thermometer rose to 202 and a half degrees, which is but little colder than boiling water. The hot places before mentioned are from about three to four hundred feet perpendicular above these springs, and on the slope of the same ridge with the volcano. That is, there are no valleys between them, but such as are formed in the ridge itself. Nor is the volcano on the highest part of the ridge, but on the southeast side of it. This is, I have been told, contrary to the general opinion of philosophers, who say that volcanoes must be on the summits of the highest hills. So far is this from being the case on this island, that some of its hills are more than double the height of that on which the volcano is, and close to it. To these remarks I must add that, in wet or moist weather, the volcano was most violent. There seems to be room for some philosophical reasoning on these phenomena of nature, but not having any talent that way, I must content myself with stating facts as I found them, and leave the causes to men of more abilities. The tiller was now finished, but as the wind was unfavourable for sailing, the guard was sent on shore on the 19th as before, and a party of men to cut up and bring off the remainder of the tree from which we had got the tiller. Having nothing else to do, I went on shore with them, and finding a good number of the natives collected about the landing place as usual, I distributed among them all the articles I had with me, and then went on board for more. In less than an hour I returned, just as our people were getting some large logs into the boat. At the same time, four or five of the natives stepped forward to see what we were about, and as we did not allow them to come within certain limits, unless to pass along the beach, the sentry ordered them back, which they readily complied with. At this time, having my eyes fixed on them, I observed the sentry present his piece, as I thought at these men, and was just going to reprove him for it, because I had observed that, whenever this was done, some of the natives would hold up their arms, to let us see they were equally ready. But I was astonished beyond measure, when the sentry fired, for I saw not the least cause. At this outrage, most of the people fled. It was only a few I could prevail on to remain. As they ran off, I observed one man to fall, and he was immediately lifted up by two others, who took him into the water and washed his wound, and then led him off. Presently after, some came and described to me the nature of his wound, and as I found he was not carried far, I sent for the surgeon. As soon as he arrived, I went with him to the man, whom we found expiring. The ball had struck his left arm, which was much shattered, and then entered his body by the short ribs, one of which was broken. The rascal who fired pretended that a man had laid an arrow across his bow, and was going to shoot at him, so that he apprehended himself in danger. But this was no more than they had always done, and with no other view than to show they were armed as well as we. At least I had reason to think so, as they never went farther. What made this incident the more unfortunate was, it not appearing to be the man who bent the bow, that was shot, but one who stood by him. 
This affair threw the natives into the utmost consternation, and a few that were prevailed on to stay ran to the plantations and brought coconuts, etc., which they laid down at our feet. So soon were those daring people humbled. When I went on board to dinner, they all retired, and only a few appeared in the afternoon, amongst whom were Pao Wang and Wa Agu. I had not seen this young man since the day he had dined on board. Both he and Pao Wang promised to bring me food, etc., the next morning, but our early departure put it out of their power. End of section 6「Section 7 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2 by James Cook. Book 3 Chapter 6 Departure from Tanner with some account of its inhabitants, their manners and arts. 1774 August During the night the wind had veered round to south-east. As this was favourable for getting out of the harbour, at four o'clock in the morning on the 20th we began to unmoor and at eight having weighed our last anchor, put to sea. As soon as we were clear of the land, I brought to, waiting for the launch, which was left behind to take up a kedge anchor and hawser, we had out to cast by. About daybreak, a noise was heard in the woods, nearly abreast of us, on the east side of the harbour, not unlike singing of psalms. I was told that the like had been heard at the same time every morning, but it never came to my knowledge till now, when it was too late to learn the occasion of it. Some were of opinion that at the east point of the harbour, where we observed in coming in some houses, boats, etc., was something sacred to religion, because some of our people had attempted to go to this point, and were prevented by the natives. I thought, and do still think, it was owing to a desire they showed on every occasion of fixing bounds to our excursions. So far as we had once been, we might go again, but not farther with their consent. But by encroaching a little every time, our country expeditions were insensibly extended without giving the least umbrage. Besides, these morning ceremonies, whether religious or not, were not performed down at that point, but in a part where some of our people had been daily. I cannot say what might have been the true cause of these people showing such dislike to our going up into their country. It might be owing to a naturally jealous disposition or perhaps to their being accustomed to hostile visits from their neighbours, or quarrels among themselves. Circumstances seem to show that such must frequently happen, for we observed them very expert in arms, and well accustomed to them, seldom or never travelling without them. It is possible all this might be on our account, but I hardly think it, we never gave them the least molestation, nor did we touch any part of their property, not even the wood and water, without first having obtained their consent. The very coconuts hanging over the heads of the workmen were as safe as those in the middle of the island. It happened rather fortunately that there were so many coconut trees near the skirts of the harbour which seemed not to be private property, 
so that we could generally prevail on the natives to bring us some of these nuts, when nothing would induce them to bring any out of the country. We were not wholly without refreshments, for besides the fish, which our sen now and again provided us with, we procured daily some fruits or nuts from the natives, though but little in proportion to what we could consume. The reason why we got no more might be our having nothing to give them in exchange, which they thought valuable. They had not the least knowledge of iron. Consequently, nails and iron tools, beads, etc., which had so great a run at the more eastern isles, were of no consideration here, and cloth can be of no use to people who go naked. The produce of this island is breadfruit, plantains, coconuts, a fruit like a nectarine, yams, tara, a sort of potato, sugar cane, wild figs, a fruit like an orange, which is not eatable, and some other fruit and nuts, whose names I have not. Nor have I any doubt that the nut made before mentioned was the produce of this island. The breadfruit, coconuts, and plantains are neither so plentiful nor so good as at Ohotahiti. On the other hand, sugarcane and yams are not only in greater plenty, but of superior quality and much larger. We got one of the latter which weighed 56 pounds, every ounce of which was good. Hogs did not seem to be scarce, but we saw not many fowls. These are the only domestic animals they have. Land birds are not more numerous than at Otahiti and the other islands, but we met with some small birds with a very beautiful plumage, which we had never seen before. There is as great a variety of trees and plants here as at any island we touched at, where our botanists had time to examine. I believe these people live chiefly on the produce of the land, and that the sea contributes but little to their subsistence. Whether this arises from the coast not abounding with fish, or from their being bad fishermen, I know not. Both causes perhaps concur. I never saw any sort of fishing tackle amongst them, nor anyone out fishing except on the shoals, or along the shores of the harbour, where they would watch to strike with a dart such fish as came within their reach, and in this they were expert. They seemed much to admire our catching fish with a sail, and I believe were not well pleased with it at last. I doubt not they have other methods of catching fish besides striking them. We understood that the little isle of Ima was chiefly inhabited by fishermen, and that the canoes we frequently saw pass, to and from that isle and at the east point of the harbour, were fishing canoes. These canoes were of unequal sizes, some thirty feet long, two broad and three deep, and they are composed of several pieces of wood, clumsily sewn together with bandages. The joints are covered on the outside by a thin batten chamfered off at the edges, over which the bandages pass. They are navigated either by paddles or sails. The sail is Latin, extended to a yard and boom, and hoisted to a short mast. Some of the large canoes have two sails, and all of them outriggers. At first we thought the people of this island, as well as those of Eromango, were a race between the natives of the Friendly Islands and those of Malikolo. But a little acquaintance with them convinced us that they had little or no affinity to either, except it be in their hair, which is much like what the people of the latter island have. The general colours of it are black and brown, growing to a tolerable length, and very crisp and curly. They separate it into small locks, 
which they wooled or cue round with a rind of a slender plant down to about an inch of the ends and as the hair grows the wooling is continued each of these cues or locks is somewhat thicker than common whipcord and they look like a parcel of small strings hanging down from the crown of their heads their beards which are strong and bushy are generally short the women do not wear their hair so but cropped nor do the boys till they approach manhood some few men women and children were seen who had hair like ours but it was obvious that these were of another nation and i think we understood they came from Aranan. it is to this island they ascribe one of the two languages which they speak and which is nearly if not exactly the same as that spoken in the friendly islands it is therefore more than probable that the Aranan was peopled from that nation and that by long intercourse with Tanna and the other neighbouring islands, each had learnt the other's language, which they use indiscriminately. The other language which the people of Tanna speak, and, as we understood, those of Eromango and Anatom, is properly their own. It is different from any we had met before, and bears no affinity to that of Malikolo so that it should seem the people of these islands are a distinct nation of themselves malikolo api etc were names entirely unknown to them they even knew nothing of sandwich island which is much nearer i took no small pains to know how far their geographical knowledge extended and did not find that it exceeded the limits of their horizon these people are of the middle size rather slender than otherwise many a little but few tall or stout the most of them have good features and agreeable countenances are like all the tropical race active and nimble and seem to excel in the use of arms but not to be fond of labor they never would put a hand to assist in any work we were carrying on which the people of the other islands used to delight in but what i judge most from is their making the females do the most laborious work as if they were pack horses i have seen a woman carrying a large bundle on her back or a child on her back and a bundle under her arm and a fellow strutting before her with nothing but a club or spear or some such thing we have frequently observed little troops of women pass to and fro along the beach laden with fruit and roots escorted by a party of men under arms though now and then we have seen a man carry a burden at the same time but not often i know not on what account this was done nor that an armed troop was necessary at first we thought they were moving out of the neighbourhood with their effects but we afterwards saw them both carry out and bring in every day i cannot say the women are beauties but i think them handsome enough for the men and too handsome for the use that is made of them both sexes are of a very dark colour but not black nor have they the least characteristic of the negro about them they make themselves blacker than they really are by painting their faces with a pigment of the colour of black lead they also use another sort which is red and a third sort brown or a colour between red and black all these but especially the first they lay on with a liberal hand not only on the face but on the neck, shoulders, and breast. The men wear nothing but a belt and the wrapping leaf as at Mali Kolo. The women have a kind of petticoat made of the filaments of the plantain tree, flags or some such thing, which reaches below the knee. Both sexes wear ornaments such as bracelets, earrings, necklaces, and amulets. The bracelets are chiefly worn by the men, some made of seashells 
and others of those of the coconut tree. The men also wear amulets, and those of most value being made of a greenish stone, the green stone of New Zealand is valued by them for this purpose. Necklaces are chiefly used by the women, and made mostly of shells. Earrings are common to both sexes, and those valued most are made of tortoiseshell. Some of our people, having got some at the Friendly Islands, brought it to a good market here, where it was of more value than anything we had besides, from which I conclude that these people catch but few turtle, though I saw one in the harbour just as we were getting under sail. I observe that, towards the latter end of our stay, they began to ask for hatchets and large nails so that it is likely they had found that iron is more serviceable than stone, bone, or shells, of which all their tools I have seen are made. Their stone hatchets, at least all those I saw, are not in the shape of adzes, as at the other islands, but more like an axe, in the helve, which is pretty thick, is made a hole into which the stone is fixed. These people, besides the cultivation of ground, have few other arts worth mentioning. They know how to make a coarse kind of matting and a coarse cloth of the bark of a tree, which is used chiefly for belts. The workmanship of their canoes, I have before observed, is very rude, and their arms, with which they take the most pains in point of neatness, come far short of some others we have seen. Their weapons are clubs, spears or darts, bows and arrows and stones. The clubs are of three or four kinds, and from three to five feet long. They seem to place most dependence on the darts, which are pointed with three bearded edges. In throwing them, they make use of a becket, that is, a piece of stiff plaited cord, about six inches long, with an eye in one end and a knot at the other. The eye is fixed on the forefinger of the right hand, and the other end is hitched round the dot, where it is nearly on an equipoise. They hold the dart between the thumb and remaining fingers, which serve only to give it direction, the velocity being communicated by the becket and forefinger. The former flies off from the dart the instant its velocity becomes greater than that of the hand. But it remains on the finger ready to be used again. With darts they kill both birds and fish and are sure of hitting a mark within the compass of the crown of a hat at a distance of eight or ten yards. But at double that distance it is chance if they hit a mark the size of a man's body, though they will throw the weapon at sixty or seventy yards. They always throw with all their might, let the distance be what it will. Darts, bows and arrows are to them what muskets are to us. The arrows are made of reeds pointed with hard wood. Some are bearded and some not, and those for shooting birds have two, three and sometimes four points. The stones they use are, in general, the branches of coral rocks, from eight to fourteen inches long, and from an inch to an inch and a half in diameter. I know not if they employ them as missive weapons. Almost every one of them carries a club, and besides that, either darts or a bow and arrows, but never both. Those who had stones kept them generally in their belts. I cannot conclude this account of their arms without adding an entire passage out of Mr. Wales's journal. As this gentleman was continually on shore amongst them, he had a better opportunity of seeing what they could perform than any of us. The passage is as follows. I must confess I have been often led to think the feats which Homer represents his heroes as performing with their spears, a little too much of the marvellous 
to be admitted into an heroic poem. I mean when confined within the straight stays of Aristotle. Nay, even so great an advocate for him as Mr. Pope acknowledges them to be surprising. But since I have seen what these people can do with their wooden spears, and them badly pointed, and not of a very hard nature, I have not the least exception to any one passage in that great poet on this account. But if I see fewer exceptions, I can find infinitely more beauties in him, as he has, I think, scarce an action circumstance or description of any kind whatever relating to a spear which i have not seen and recognized among these people as their whirling motion and whistling noise as they fly their quivering motion as they stick in the ground when they fall their mediating their aim when they are going to throw and their shaking them in their hand as they go along etc etc i know no more of their cookery than that it consists of roasting and baking for they have no vessel in which water can be boiled nor do i know that they have any other liquor but water and the juice of the coconut we are utter strangers to their religion and but little acquainted with their government they seem to have chiefs among them at least some were pointed out to us by that title. But as I have before observed, they appeared to have very little authority over the rest of the people. Old Geogi was the only one the people were ever seen to take the least notice of. But whether this was owing to high rank or old age, I cannot say. On several occasions I have seen the old man respected and obeyed. Our friend Pao Wang was so, and yet I never heard him called chief, and have many reasons to believe that he had not a right to any more authority than many of his neighbours, and few, if any, were bound to obey him, or any other person in the neighbourhood. For if there had been such a one, we certainly should, by some means, have known it, I named the harbour Port Resolution after the ship, she being the first which ever entered it. It is situated on the north side of the most easterly point of the island, and about east-north-east from the volcano. In the latitude of 19 degrees 32 minutes 25 and a half seconds south, and in the longitude of 169 degrees 44 minutes 35 seconds east. It is no more than a little creek running in south by west or half west, three quarters of a mile, and is about half that in breadth. A shoal of sand and rocks lying on the east side makes it still narrower. The depth of water in the harbour is from three to six fathoms, and the bottom is sand and mud. No place can be more convenient for taking in wood and water, for both are close to the shore. The water stunk a little after it had been a few days on board, but it afterwards turned sweet. And even when it was at the worst, the tin machine would in a few hours recover a whole cask. This is an excellent contrivance for sweetening water at sea, and is well known in the navy. Mr. Wales, from whom I had the latitude and longitude, found the variation of the needle to be 7 degrees 14 minutes 12 seconds east, and the dip of its south end 45 degrees 2 and 3 quarter minutes. He also observed the time of high water on the full and change days, to be about 5 hours 45 minutes, and the tide to rise and fall 3 feet. End of section 7. Section 8 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 7, Part 1. The survey of the islands continued, and a more particular description of them. 1774 August. As soon as the boats were hoisted in, we made sail and stretched to the eastward with a fresh gale at south-east, in order to have a nearer view of Aranan, and to see if there was any land in its neighbourhood. We stood on till midnight, when, having passed the island, we tacked, and spent the remainder of the night making two boards. At sunrise on the 21st we stood southwest, in order to get to the south of Tanner, and nearer to Anatom, to observe if any more land lay in that direction, for an extraordinary clear morning had produced no discovery to any of the east. At noon, having observed in latitude 20 degrees 33 minutes 30 seconds, the situation of the lands around us was as follows. Port Resolution bore north 86 degrees west, distant 6.5 leagues. The island of Tanna extended from south 88 degrees west to north 64 degrees west, Traitor's Head, north 58 degrees west, distant 20 leagues. The island of Eranan, north 80 degrees east, distant 5 leagues. And Anatom, from south a half east to south a half west, distant 10 leagues. We continued to stretch to the south till 2 o'clock p.m., when seeing no more land before us, we bore up round the southeast end of Tanner, and with a fine gale at east-south-east ran along the south coast at one league from shore. It seemed a bold one without the guard of any rocks, and the country full as fertile as in the neighbourhood of the harbour, and making a fine appearance. At six o'clock the highland of Eromango appeared over the west end of Tanna, in the direction of ten degrees west. At eight o'clock we were past the island and steered north-northwest for Sandwich Island, in order to finish the survey of it. Footnote. The word survey is not here to be understood in its literal sense. Surveying a place, according to my idea, is taking a geometric plan of it, in which every place is to have its true situation, which cannot be done in a work of this nature. End footnote. Of it and of the isles to the northwest. On the 22nd at 4 o'clock p.m., we drew near the southeast end, and ranging the south coast, found it to trend in the direction of west and west-northwest for about nine leagues. Near the middle of this length and close to the shore are three or four small isles, behind which seemed to be a safe anchorage. But not thinking I had any time to spare to visit this fine island, I continued to range the coast to its western extremity, and then steered north-northwest from the south-east end of Malicolo, which, at half-past six next morning, bore north 14 degrees east, distant seven or eight leagues, and three hills island at south 82 degrees east. Soon after, we saw the islands Api, Palm, and Ambrin. What we had comprehended under the name of Palm appeared now to be two isles, something like a separation being seen between the hill and the land to the west of it. We approached the southwest side of Malicolo to within half a league and ranged it at that distance. From the southeast point, the direction of the land is west a little southerly for six or seven leagues and then northwest by west three leagues, to a pretty high point or headland, situated in latitude 16 degrees 29 minutes, and which obtained the name of South West Cape. The coast, which is low, 
seem to be indented into creeks and projecting points, or else these points were small isles lying under the shore. We were sure of one which lies between two and three leagues east of the Cape. Close to the west side or point of the Cape lies, connected with it by breakers, a round rock or islet, which helps to shelter a fine bay formed by an elbow in the coast from the raining winds. The natives appeared in troops on many parts of the shore, and some seemed desirous to come off to us in canoes, but they did not, and probably our not shortening sail was the reason. From the southwest cape, the direction of the coast is north by west, but the most advanced land wore from it northwest by north, at which the land seemed to terminate. Continuing to follow the direction of the coast, at noon it was two miles from us, and our latitude by observation was 16 degrees 22 minutes 30 seconds south. This is nearly the parallel to Port Sandwich, and our never-failing guide, the watch, showed that we were 26 minutes west of it, a distance which the breadth of Malikolo cannot exceed in this parallel. The southeast cape bore south 26 degrees east, distance 7 miles, and the most advanced point of land for which we steered bore northwest by north. At 3 o'clock we were the length of it, and found the land continued and trending more and more to the north. We coasted it to its northern extremity, which we did not reach till after dark, at which time we were near enough to the shore to hear the voices of people who were assembled round a fire they had made on the beach. There we sounded and found twenty fathoms and a bottom of sand, but on edging off from the shore we soon got out of sounding, and then made a trip back to the south till the moon got up. After this we stood again to the north, hauled round the point, and spent the night in Bougainville's passage, being assured of our situation before sunset, by seeing the land on the north side of the passage, extending as far as northwest to half-west. The south coast of Ballycollow, from the south-east end to the south-west cape, is luxuriantly clothed with wood and other productions of nature, from the seashore to the very summits of the hills. To the northwest of the cape, the country is less woody, but more agreeably interspersed with lawns, some of which appeared to be cultivated. The summits of the hills seemed barren, and the highest lies between Port Sandwich and the southwest cape. Farther north, the land falls insensibly lower and is less covered with wood. I believe it is a very fertile island and well inhabited, for we saw smoke by day and fire by night in all parts of it. Next morning at sunrise, we found ourselves nearly in the middle of the passage, the northwest end of Malikolo extending from south 30 degrees east to south 58 degrees west, the land to the north from north 70 west to north 4 degrees east, and the Isle of Lepers bearing north 30 degrees east, distant 11 or 12 leagues. We now made sail and steered north by east and afterwards north along the east coast of the northern land with a fine breeze at southeast. We found that this coast, which at first appeared to be continued, was composed of several low woody isles, the most of them of small extent, except the southernmost, which on account of the day I named St. Bartholomew. It is six or seven leagues in circuit, and makes the northeast point of Bougainville's passage. At noon the breeze began to slacken. We were at this time between two and three miles from the land, and observed in latitude 15 degrees 23 minutes, the Isle of Lepers bearing from east by north to south, distance seven leagues, and a high bluff head, at which the coast we were upon seemed to terminate, north-northwest to half-west, distant ten or eleven leagues, but from the masthead we could see land to the east. This we judged to be an island, and it bore north by west to half-west. 
as we advanced to north-northwest along a fine coast covered with woods we perceived low land that extended off from the bluff head towards the island above mentioned but did not seem to join it it was my intention to have gone through the channel but the approach of night made me lay it aside and steer without the island during the afternoon we passed some small isles lying under the shore and observed some projecting points of unequal height but were not able to determine whether or no they were connected with the mainland behind them was a ridge of hills which terminated at the bluff head there were cliffs in some places of the coast and white patches which we judged to be chalk at ten o'clock being the length of the isle which lies off the head we shortened sail and spent the night in making short boards at daybreak on the twenty fifth we were on the north side of the island which is of a moderate height and three leagues in circuit and steered west for the bluff head along the low land under it at sunrise an elevated coast came into sight beyond the bluff head extending to the north as far northwest by west after doubling the head we found the land to trend south a little easterly and to form a large deep bay bounded on the west by the coast just mentioned everything conspired to make us believe this was the bay of st philip and st jago discovered by quiros in 1606 to determine this point it was necessary to proceed farther up for at this time we saw no end to it the wind being at south we were obliged to ply and first stretched over for the west shore from which we were three miles at noon when our latitude was 14 degrees 55 minutes 30 seconds south longitude 167 degrees 3 minutes east the mouth of the bay extending from north 64 degrees west to south 86 degrees east which last direction was the bluff head distant three leagues in the afternoon the wind veering to east south east we could look up to the head of the bay but as the breeze was faint a northeast swell hurtled us over to the west shore so that at half past four o'clock p m we were no more than two miles from it and tacked in one hundred and twenty fathoms water and a soft muddy bottom the bluff head or east point of the bay bore north fifty three degrees east we had no sooner tacked than it fell calm and we were left to the mercy of the swell which continued to hurtle us towards the shore where large troops of people were assembled some ventured off in two canoes but all the signs of friendship we could make did not induce them to come alongside or near enough to receive any present from us at last they took sudden fright at something and returned to shore they were naked except for having some long grass like flags fastened to a belt and hanging down before and behind nearly as low as the knee their colour was very dark and their hair woolly or cut short which made it seem so the canoes were small and had outriggers the calm continued till near eight o'clock in which time we drove into eighty-five fathoms water and so near the shore that i expected we should be obliged to anchor a breeze of wind sprung up at east south east and first took us on the wrong side but contrary to all our expectations and when we had hardly room to veer the ship came about and having filled on the starboard tack we stood off northeast thus we were relieved from the apprehensions of being forced to anchor in a great depth on a lee shore and in a dark and obscure night we continued to ply upwards with variable light breezes between east south east and south till ten next morning when it fell calm we were at this time about seven or eight miles from the head of the bay 
which is terminated by a low beach, and behind that is an extensive flat covered with wood, and bounded on each side by a ridge of mountain. At noon we found the latitude to be 15 degrees 5 minutes south, and were detained here by the calm till 1 o'clock p.m., when we got a breeze at north by west, with which we steered up to within two miles at the head of the bay, and then I sent Mr. Cooper and Mr. Gilbert to sound and reconnoitre the coast, while we stood to and fro with the ship. This gave time to three sailing canoes, which had been following us some time, to come up. There were five or six men in each, and they approached near enough to receive such things as were thrown to them fastened to a rope, but would not advance alongside. They were the same sort of people as those we had seen the preceding evening. Indeed, we thought they came from the same place. They seemed to be stouter and better shaped men than those of Malicolo, and several circumstances concurred to make us think they were of another nation. They named the numerals as far as five or six in the language of Anamoka, and understood us when we asked the names of the adjacent lands in that language. Some indeed had black, short, frizzled hair, like the natives of Malicolo, but others had it long, tied up on the crown of the head, and ornamented with feathers like the New Zealanders. Their other ornaments were bracelets and necklaces. One man had something like a white shell on his forehead, and some were painted with a blackish pigment. I did not see that they had any other weapon but darts and gigs, intended only for striking a fish. Their canoes were much like those of Tanner, and navigated in the same manner, or nearly so. They readily gave us the names of such parts as we pointed to, but we could not obtain from them the name of the island. At length, seeing our boats coming, they paddled in for the shore, notwithstanding all we could say or do to detain them. When the boats returned, Mr. Cooper informed me that they had landed on the beach, which is at the head of the bay, near a fine river or stream of fresh water, so large and deep that they judged boats might enter it at high water. They found three fathoms depth close to the beach, and fifty-five and fifty, two cables length off. Farther out they did not sound, and where we were in the ship we had no soundings with a hundred and seventy fathoms line. Before the boats got on board, the wind had shifted to the south-southeast. As we were in want of nothing, and had no time to spare, I took the advantage of this shift of wind, and steered down the bay. During the forepart of the night, the country was illuminated with fires, from the seashore to the summits of the mountains but this was only on the west side of the shore. I cannot pretend to say what was the occasion of these fires, but have no idea of their being on our account. Probably they were burning or clearing the ground for new plantation. At daybreak on the 27th, we found ourselves two-thirds down the bay, and as we had but little wind, it was noon, before we were the length of the northwest point, which at this time bore north 82 degrees west, distant five miles. Latitude observed 14 degrees 39 minutes 30 seconds. End of section 8. Section 9 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. 
Section 9. Book 3, Chapter 7, Part 2. The survey of the islands continued, and a more particular description of them. Some of our gentlemen were doubtful of this being the Bay of St. Philip and St. Jago, as there was no place which they thought could mean the port of Vera Cruz. For my part, I found general points to agree so well with Quiroz's description that I had not the least doubt about it. As to what he calls the port of Vera Cruz, I understand that to be the anchorage at the head of the bay, which in some places may extend farther off than where our boats landed. There is nothing in his account of the port which contradicts this supposition. Footnote. See Quiros's Voyage in Dalrymple's Collection, Volume 1, pages 136-137. End footnote. It was but natural for his people to give a name to the place, independent of so large a bay, where they lay so long at anchor. A port is a vague term like many others in geography, and has been very often applied to places far less sheltered than this. Our officers observed that grass and other plants grew on the beach close to high water mark, which is always a sure sign of Pacific anchorage, and an undeniable proof that there never is a great surf on the shore. They judged that the tide rose about four or five feet, and that boats and such craft might at high water enter the river, which seemed to be pretty deep and broad within, so that this, probably, is one of those mentioned by Quiros, and if we were not deceived, we saw the other. The bay hath twenty leagues sea coast, six on the east side, which lies in the direction of south half west and north half east, two at the head and twelve on the west side, the direction of which is south by east and north by west, from the head down to two-thirds of its length, and then northwest by north to the northwest point. The two points which form the entrance lie in the direction of south 53 degrees east and north 53 degrees west from each other, distant 10 leagues. The bay is everywhere free from danger and of an unfathomable depth, except near the shores, which are for the most part low. This, however, is only a very narrow strip between the seashore and the foot of the hills, for the bay, as well as the flat land at the head of it, is bounded on each side by a ridge of hills, one of which, that to the west, is very high and double, extending the whole length of the island. An uncommonly luxuriant vegetation was everywhere to be seen. The sides of the hills were checkered with plantations, and every valley watered by a stream. Of all the productions of nature, this country was adorned with, the coconut trees were the most conspicuous. The columns of smoke we saw by day, and fires by night, all over the country, led us to believe that it is well inhabited and very fertile. The east point of this bay, which I named Cape Quiros, in memory of its first discoverer, is situated in latitude 14 degrees 56 minutes south, longitude 167 degrees 13 minutes east. The northwest point, which I named Cape Cumberland, in honour of His Royal Highness the Duke, lies in the latitude of 14 degrees 38 minutes 45 seconds south, longitude 166 degrees 49 and a half minutes east, and is the northwest extremity of this archipelago. For after doubling it, we found the coast to trend gradually round to the south and south-southeast. On the 28th and 29th, we had light airs and calm, so that we advanced but little. In this time, we took every opportunity, 
when the horizon was clearer than usual to look out for more land but none was seen by quiros's track to the north after leaving the bay above mentioned it seems probable that there is none nearer than queen charlotte's island discovered by captain cataret which lies about ninety leagues north northwest from cape cumberland and i take to be the same with quiros's santa cruz on the thirtieth the calm was succeeded by a fresh breeze at south south east which enabled us to ply up the coast at noon we observed in fifteen degrees twenty minutes afterwards we stretched in east to within a mile of the shore and then tacked in seventy-five fathoms before a sandy flat on which several of the natives made their appearance we observed on the sides of the hills several plantations that were laid out by line and fenced round on the thirty-first at noon the south or southwest point of the island bore north sixty-two degrees east distant four leagues this forms the northwest point of what i call bougainville's passage the northeast point at this time bore north eighty-five degrees east and the northwest end of malicolo from south fifty-four degrees east to south seventy-two degrees east latitude observed fifteen degrees forty-five minutes south in the afternoon in stretching to the east we weathered the south southwest point of the island from which the coast trends east northerly it is low and seemed to form some creeks or coves and as we got farther into the passage we perceived some small low isles lying along it which seemed to extend beyond saint bartholomew island having now finished the survey of the whole archipelago the season of the year made it necessary for me to return to the south while i had yet some time left to explore any land i might meet with between this and new zealand where i intended to touch that i might refresh my people and recruit our stock of wood and water for another southern course with this view at five p m we tacked and hauled to the southward with a fresh gale at south east at this time the northwest point of the passage or the southwest point of the island terra del espiritu santo the only remains of quiros's continent bore north eighty two degrees west distant three leagues i named it cape lisburn and its situation is in latitude 15 degrees 40 minutes, longitude 165 degrees 59 minutes east. The foregoing account of these islands, in the order in which we explored them, not being particular enough either as to situation or description, it may not be improper now to give a more accurate view of them which will convey to the reader a better idea of the whole group the northern islands of this archipelago were first discovered by that great navigator quiros in 1606 and not without reason were considered as part of the southern continent which at that time and until very lately was supposed to exist they were next visited by Monsieur de Bougainville in 1768, who, besides landing on the Isle of Lepers, did no more than discover that the land was not connected, but composed of islands, which he called the Great Cyclades. But as, besides ascertaining the extent and situation of these islands, we added to them several new ones, which were not known before, and explored the whole, I think we have obtained a right to name them, and shall in future distinguish them by the name of the New Hebrides. They are situated between the latitude of 14 degrees 29 minutes and 20 degrees 4 minutes south, 
and between 166 degrees 41 minutes and 170 degrees 21 minutes east longitude and extend an 125 leagues in the direction of north northwest a half west and south southeast a half east the most northerly ireland is that called by monsieur de bougainville peak of the etoile it is situated according to his account in latitude 14 degrees 29 minutes longitude 168 degrees 9 minutes and north by west eight leagues from aurora the next island which lies farthest north is that of tierra del espiritu santo it is the most western and largest of all the hebrides being 22 leagues long in the direction of north northwest a half west and south southeast a half east 12 in breadth and 60 in circuit we have obtained the true figure of this island very accurately the land of it especially the west side is exceedingly high and mountainous and in many places the hills rise directly from the sea except the cliffs and beaches every other part is covered with wood or laid out in plantations besides the bay of st philip and st jago the isles which lie along the south and east coast cannot in my opinion fail of forming some good bays or harbours the next considerable island is that of malicolo to the southeast it extends northwest and southeast and is eighteen leagues long in that direction its greatest breadth which is at the southeast end is eight leagues the northwest end is two-thirds this breadth and near the middle one-third this contraction is occasioned by a wide and pretty deep bay on the southwest side to judge of this island from what we saw of it it must be very fertile and well inhabited the land on the sea coast is rather low and lies with a gentle slope from the hills which are in the middle of the island two-thirds of the northeast coast was only seen at a great distance therefore the delineations of it can have no pretensions to accuracy but the other parts i apprehend are without any material errors saint bartholomew lies between the southeast end of tierra del espiritu santo and the north end of malicolo and the distance between it and the latter is eight miles this is the passage through which monsieur de bougainville went and the middle of it is in latitude 15 degrees 48 minutes the isle of lepers lies between espiritu santo and aurora island eight leagues from the former and three from the latter in latitude 15 degrees 22 minutes and nearly under the same meridian as the southeast end of malicolo it is of an egg-like figure very high and eighteen or twenty leagues in circuit its limits were determined by several bearings but the lines of the shore were traced out by guess except the northeast part where there is an anchorage half a mile from the land aurora whitsuntide ambrim payum and its neighbour api three hills and sandwich islands lie all nearly under the meridian of 167 degrees 29 minutes or 30 minutes east extending from the latitude of 14 degrees 51 minutes 30 seconds to 17 degrees 53 minutes 30 seconds the island of aurora lies north by west and south by east and is 11 leagues long in that direction but i believe it hardly anywhere extends two or two and a half in breadth it hath a good height its surface hilly and everywhere covered with wood except where the natives have their dwellings and plantations
Whitsuntide Isle, which is one league and a half to the south of Aurora, is of the same length, and lies in the direction of north and south, but is somewhat broader than Aurora Island. It is considerably high, and clothed with wood, except such parts as seem to be cultivated, which were pretty numerous. From the south end of Whitsuntide Island, to the north side of Ambrin is two leagues and a half. This is about seventeen leagues in circuit. Its shores are rather low, but the land rises with an unequal ascent to a tolerably high mountain in the middle of the island, from which ascended great columns of smoke. But we were not able to determine whether this was occasioned by a volcano or not. That it is fertile and well inhabited seems probable from the quantities of smoke which we saw rise out of the woods in such parts of the island as came within the compass of our sight, for it must be observed that we did not see the whole of it. We saw still much less of Paum and its neighbourhood. I can say no more of this island than that it towers up to a great height in the form of a round haystack, and the extent of it, and of the adjoining isle, if there are two, cannot exceed three or four leagues in any direction, for the distance between Ambrim and Appi is hardly five, and they lie in this space, and east from Port Sandwich, distant about seven or eight leagues. The island of Appi is not less than 20 leagues in circuit. Its longest direction is about 8 leagues, northwest and southeast. It is of considerable height, and hath a hilly surface, diversified with woods and lawns, the west and south parts especially, for the others we did not see. Shepherd's Isles are a group of small ones of unequal size, extending off from the southeast point of Appi, about five leagues in the direction of southeast. The island Three Hills lies south, four leagues from the coast of Appi, and southeast a half south, distant seventeen leagues from Port Sandwich. To this, and what hath already been said of it, I shall only add that west by north, five miles from the west point, is a reef of rocks on which the sea continually breaks. Nine leagues in the direction of south from three hills lies Sandwich Island. Two hills, the Monument and Montague Islands, lie to the east of this line and Hinchinbrook to the west, as also two or three small isles, which lie between it and Sandwich Island, to which they are connected by breakers. Sandwich Island is 25 leagues in circuit, its greatest extent is 10 leagues, and it lies in the direction of northwest by west and southeast by east. The northwest coast of this island we only viewed at a distance, therefore our chart of this part may be faulty, so far as it regards the line of the coast, but no farther. The distance from the south end of Malikolo to the northwest end of Sandwich Island is 22 leagues in the direction of south-south-east a half-east. In the same direction lie Eromango, Tana and Anatom. The first is 18 leagues from Sandwich Island and is 24 or 25 leagues in circuit. The middle of it lies in the latitude of 18 degrees 54 minutes, longitude 169 degrees 19 minutes east, and it is of a good height, as may be gathered from the distance we were off when we first saw it. Tanner lies six leagues from the south side of Eromango, extending southeast by south and northwest by north, about eight leagues long in that direction and everywhere about three or four leagues broad. The Isle of Imma lies in the direction of north by east a half east, 
four leagues from Port Resolution in Tana, and the island of Eronan or Futuna East, in the same direction, distant eleven leagues. This, which is the most eastern island of all the Hebrides, did not appear to be above five leagues in circuit, but is of a considerable height and flat on top. On the northeast side is a little peak, seemingly disjointed from the isle, but we thought it was connected by low land. Anatom, which is the southernmost island, is situated in the latitude of 20 degrees 3 minutes, longitude 170 degrees 4 minutes, and south 30 degrees east, 11 or 12 leagues from Port Resolution. It is of a good height, with an hilly surface, and more I must not say of it. Here follow the lunar observations of Mr. Wales for ascertaining the longitude of these islands, reduced by the watch to Port Sandwich in Malicolo and Port Resolution in Tanner. Port Sandwich. Mean of ten sets of observations before, 167 degrees 56 minutes 33 and a quarter seconds east. Two ditto at 168 degrees 2 minutes 37 and a half seconds longitude. 20 ditto after 167 degrees 52 minutes 57 seconds. Mean of those means, 167 degrees, 57 minutes, 22 and 3 quarter seconds. Port resolution, mean of 20 sets of observations before, 169 degrees, 37 minutes, 35 seconds east, 5 ditto, at 169 degrees 48 minutes 48 seconds, 20 ditto, after 169 degrees 47 minutes 22 and a half seconds. Mean of these means, 169 degrees 44 minutes 33 seconds. It is necessary to observe that each set of observations consisting of between six and ten observed distances of the sun and moon or moon and stars the whole number amounts to several hundreds and these have been reduced by means of the watch to all the islands so that the longitude of each is as well ascertained as that of the two ports above mentioned as a proof of this i shall only observe that the longitude of the two ports, as pointed out by the watch and by the observation, did not differ two miles. This also shows what degree of accuracy these observations are capable of, when multiplied to a considerable number, made with different instruments, and with the sun and stars, or both sides of the moon. By this last method, the errors which may be either in the instruments or lunar tables destroy one another, and likewise those which may arise from the observer himself, for some men may observe closer than others. If we consider the number of observations that may be obtained in the course of a month, if the weather is favourable, we shall perhaps find this method of finding the longitude of places as accurate as most others. At least it is the most easy and attended with the least expense to the observer. Every ship that goes to foreign parts is, or may be, supplied with a sufficient number of quadrants at a small expense. I mean good ones, proper for making these observations, for the difference of the price between a good and a bad one, I apprehend, can never be an object with an officer. The most expensive article, and what is in some measure necessary in order to arrive at the utmost accuracy, is a good watch. But for common use, and where that strict accuracy is not required, this may be dispensed with. 
I have observed before in this journal that this method of finding the longitude is not so difficult but that any man with proper application and a little practice may soon learn to make these observations as well as the astronomers themselves. I have seldom known any material difference between the observations made by Mr. Wales and those made by the officers at the same time. Footnote. See volume 1, page 40, which is nearly the same difference as the day before. End footnote. In observing the variation of the magnetic needle, we found, as usual, our compasses differ among themselves, sometimes near two degrees. The same compass, too, would sometimes make nearly this difference in the variation on different days, and even between the morning and evening of the same day, when our change of situation had been but very little. By the mean of the observations which I made about Eromango and the southeast part of these islands, the variation of the compass was 10 degrees 5 minutes 48 seconds east, and the mean of those made about Tierra del Espiritu Santo gave 10 degrees 5 minutes 30 seconds east. This is considerably more than Mr. Wales found it to be a tanner. I cannot say what might occasion this difference in the variation observed at sea and on shore, unless it be influenced by the land, for I must give the preference to that found at sea, as it is agreeable to what we observed before we made the island and after we left them. End of section 9Section 10 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 8. An account of the discovery of New Caledonia and the incidents that happened while the ship lay in Belaid, 1774 September. At sunrise on the 1st of September, after having stood to southwest all night, no more land was to be seen. The wind remaining in the southeast quarter, we continued to stand to southwest. On the 2nd at 5 o'clock p.m., being in the latitude 18 degrees 22 minutes, longitude 165 degrees 26 minutes, the variation was 10 degrees 50 minutes east, and at the same hour on the 3rd, it was 10 degrees 51 minutes. Latitude at that time, 19 degrees 14 minutes, longitude 165 degrees east. The next morning, in the latitude of 19 degrees 49 minutes, longitude 164 degrees 53 minutes, the amplitude gave 10 degrees 21 minutes, and the azimuth 10 degrees 7 minutes east. At 8 o'clock, as we were steering to the south, land was discovered bearing south-southwest, and at noon it extended from south south east to west by south, distant about six leagues. We continued to steer for it with a light breeze at east till five in the evening when we were stopped by a calm. At this time we were three leagues from the land, which extended from south east by south to west by north, round by the southwest. Some openings appeared in the west so that we could not tell whether it was one connected land or a group of islands. To the southeast, the coast seemed to terminate in a high promontory, which I named Cape Colnet, after one of my midshipmen who first discovered this land. Breakers were seen about halfway between us and the shore, and behind them 
two or three canoes under sail, standing out to sea, as if their design had been to come off to us. But a little before sunset they struck their sails, and we saw them no more. After a few hours calm, we got a breeze at southeast and spent the night standing off and on. On the 5th at sunrise, the horizon being clear, we could see the coast extend to the southeast of Cape Colnet and round by the southwest to northwest by west. Some gaps or openings were yet to be seen to the west, and a reef or breakers seemed to lie all along the coast connected with those we discovered the preceding night. It was a matter of indifference to me whether we plied up the coast to the southeast or bore down to northwest. I chose the latter, and after running two leagues down the outside of the reef, for such it proved, we came before an opening that had the appearance of a good channel, through which we might go in for the land. I wanted to get at it, not only to visit it, but also to have an opportunity to observe an eclipse of the sun, which was soon to happen. With this view we brought two, hoisted out two armed boats, and sent them to sound the channel, ten or twelve large sailing canoes being then near us. We had observed them coming off from the shore all the morning from different parts, and some were lying on the reef, fishing as we supposed. As soon as they all got together, they came down on us in a body and were pretty near when we were hoisting out our boats, which probably gave them some alarm, for, without stopping, they hauled in for the reef and our boats followed them. We now saw that what we had taken for openings in the coast was low land and that it was all connected except the western extremity which was an island known by the name of Balabia, as we afterwards learnt. The boats having made a signal for a channel, and one of them being placed on the point of the reef on the weather side of it, we stood in with a ship and took up the other boat in our way, when the officer informed me that where we were to pass was sixteen and fourteen fathoms water, a fine sandy bottom, and that having put alongside two canoes, he found the people very obliging and civil. They gave him some fish, and in return he presented them with medals, etc. In one was a stout, robust young man, whom they understood to be a chief. After getting within the reef, we hauled up south or half east for a small, low, sandy isle that we observed lying under the shore, being followed by all the canoes. Our sounding in standing in was from fifteen to twelve fathoms, a pretty even fine sandy bottom, for about two miles. Then we had six, five, and four fathoms. This was on the tail of a shoal, which lies a little without the small isle to the northeast. Being over it, we found seven and eight fathoms water, which shallowed gradually as we approached the shore, to three fathoms when we tacked and stood off a little, and then anchored in five fathoms, the bottom of fine sand mixed with mud. The little sandy isle bore east by south, three quarters of a mile distant, and we were one mile from the shore of the main, which extended from southeast by east, round to the south to west-northwest. The island of Balabia bore northwest by north, and the channel through which we came north four miles distant. In this situation, we were extremely well sheltered from the raining winds by the sandy island it shoals, and by the shoal without them. We had hardly got to an anchor before we were surrounded by a great number of the natives in sixteen or eighteen canoes the most of whom were without any sort of weapons. At first they were shy in coming near the ship, but in a short time we prevailed on the people in one boat to get close enough to receive some presents. These we lowered down to them by a rope, to which in return they tied two fish that stunk intolerably, as did those they gave us in the morning. These mutual exchanges bringing on a kind of confidence, 
two ventured on board the ship, and presently after she was filled with them, and we had the company of several at dinner in the cabin. Our peas soup, salt beef and pork, they had no curiosity to taste, but they ate of some yams, which we happened to have yet left, calling them ubi. This name is not unlike Ufi, as they are called at most of the islands, except Malikolo. Nevertheless, we found these people spoke a language new to us. Like all the nations we had lately seen, the men were almost naked, having hardly any other covering but such a wrapper as is used at Malikolo. Footnote. The particular manner of applying the wrapper may be seen in Wafer's Voyage, who mentions this singular custom as existing, though with some little variation amongst the Indians of the Isthmus of Darien. See Wafer's Voyage, page 140. End of footnote. They were curious in examining every part of the ship, which they viewed with uncommon attention. They had not the least knowledge of goats, hogs, dogs, or cats, and had not even a name for one of them. They seemed fond of large spike nails and pieces of red cloth, or indeed of any other colour, but red was their favourite. After dinner, I went on shore with two armed boats, having with us one of the natives who had attached himself to me. We landed on a sandy beach before a vast number of people who had got together with no other intent than to see us for many of them had not a stick in their hands. Consequently, we were received with great courtesy, and with the surprise natural for people to express at seeing men and things so new to them as we must be. I made presents to all those my friend pointed out, who were either old men, or such as seemed to be of some note, but he took not the least notice of some women who stood behind the crowd, folding my hand, when I was going to give them some beads and medals. Here we found the same chief, who had been seen in one of the canoes in the morning. His name, we now learnt, was Tiabuma, and we had not been on shore above ten minutes before he called for silence. Being instantly obeyed by every individual present, he made a short speech, and soon after another chief having called for silence, made a speech also. It was pleasing to see with what attention they were heard. Their speeches were composed of short sentences, to each of which two or three old men answered by nodding their heads and giving a kind of grunt, significant, as I thought, of approbation. It was impossible for us to know the purport of these speeches, but we had reason to think they were favourable to us, on whose account they doubtless were made. I kept my eyes fixed on the people all the time, and saw nothing to induce me to think otherwise. While we were with them, having inquired by signs for fresh water, some pointed to the east and others to the west, my friend undertook to conduct us to it, and embarked with us for that purpose. We rowed about two miles up the coast to the east, where the shore was mostly covered with mangrove trees, and entering amongst them by a narrow creek or river, which brought us to a little straggling village, above all the mangroves, where we landed and were shown fresh water. The ground near this village was finely cultivated, being laid out in plantations of sugar canes, plantains, yams and other roots, and watered by little rills, conducted by art from the main stream, whose source was in the hills. Here were some coconut trees which did not seem burdened with fruit. We heard the crowing of cocks but saw none. Some roots were baking on a fire in an earthen jar, which would have held six or eight gallons, nor did we doubt its being their own manufacture. As we proceeded up the creek, Mr. Forster having shot a duck flying over our heads, which was the first use these people saw made of our firearms, my friend begged to have it, and when he landed, told his countrymen in what manner it was killed. The day being far spent and the tide not permitting us to stay longer in the creek, 
we took leave of the people and got on board a little after sunset. From this little excursion, I found that we were to expect nothing from these people but the privilege of visiting their country undisturbed, for it was easy to see that they had little else than good nature to bestow. In this they exceeded all the nations we had yet met with, and although it did not satisfy the demands of nature, it at once pleased and left our minds at ease. Next morning we were visited by some hundreds of the natives, some coming in canoes and others swimming off, so that before ten o'clock our decks and all other parts of the ship were quite full with them. My friend, who was of the number, brought me a few roots, but all the others came empty in respect to eatables. Some few had with them their arms, such as clubs and darts, which they exchanged for nails, pieces of cloth, etc. After breakfast, I sent Lieutenant Pickersgill with two armed boats to look for fresh water, for what we found the day before was by no means convenient for us to get on board. At the same time, Mr. Wales, accompanied by Lieutenant Clark, went to the little isle to make preparations for observing the eclipse of the sun, which was to be in the afternoon. Mr. Pickersgill, soon returning, informed me that he had found a stream of fresh water pretty convenient to come at. I therefore ordered the launch to be hoisted out to complete our water, and then we went to the isle to assist in the observation. About 1 p.m. the eclipse came on. Clouds interposed and we lost the first contact, but were more fortunate in the end, which was observed as follows. By Mr. Wales, with Dolan's three and a half foot achromatic refractor, at three hours, twenty eight minutes, thirty nine and a quarter seconds, apparent time. By Mr. Clark, with Bird's two foot reflector, at three hours, twenty eight minutes, fifty two and a quarter seconds, apparent time and by me with an eighteen inch reflector made by watkins three hours twenty eight minutes fifty three and a quarter seconds apparent time the latitude of the isle or place of observation twenty degrees seventeen minutes thirty nine seconds south longitude per distance of the sun and moon and moon and stars forty eight sets one sixty four degrees forty one minutes twenty one seconds east ditto per watch one sixty three degrees fifty eight minutes zero seconds east mr wales measured the quantity eclipsed by a hadley's quadrant a method never before thought of i am of opinion it answers the purpose of a micrometer to a great degree of certainty and is a great addition to the use of this most valuable instrument. After all was over, we returned on board, where I found Tibuma the chief, who soon after slipped out of the ship without my knowledge, and by that means lost the present I had made up for him. In the evening I went ashore to the watering place, which was at the head of a little creek, at a fine stream that came from the hills. It was necessary to have a small boat in the creek to convey the casks from and to the beach over which they were rolled and then put into the launch as only a small boat could enter the creek and that only at high water. Excellent wood for fuel was here far more convenient than water but this was an article we did not want. About seven o'clock this evening died Simon Monk our butcher, a man much esteemed in the ship, his death being occasioned by a fall down the fore hatchway the preceding night. Early in the morning of the 7th, the watering party and a guard, under the command of an officer, were sent ashore, and soon after a party of us went to take a view of the country. As soon as we landed, we made known our design to the natives, and two of them undertaking to be our guides, 
conducted us up the hills by a tolerably good path. In our route we met several people, most of whom turned back with us, so that at last our train was numerous. Some we met who wanted us to return, but we paid no regard to their signs, nor did they seem uneasy when we proceeded. At length we reached the summit of one of the hills, from which we saw the sea in two places, between some advanced hills, on the opposite or southwest side of the land. This was a useful discovery, as it enabled us to judge of the breadth of the land, which in this part did not exceed ten leagues. Between those advanced hills and the ridge we were upon was a large valley, through which ran a serpentine river. On the banks of this were several plantations and some villages, whose inhabitants we had met on the road, and found more on the top of the hill, gazing at the ship, as might be supposed. The plain or flat of land, which lies along the shore we were upon, appeared from the hills to great advantage. The winding streams which ran throughout the plantations, the little straggling villages, the variety in the woods, and the shoals on the coast, so variegating the scene, that the whole might afford a picture for romance. Indeed, if it were not for those fertile spots on the plains, and some few on the sides of the mountains, the whole country might be called a dreary waste. The mountains and other high places are, for the most part, incapable of cultivation, consisting chiefly of rocks, many of which are full of mundics. The little soil that is upon them is scorched and burnt up with the sun. It is, nevertheless, coated with coarse grass and other plants, and here and there trees and shrubs. The country, in general, bore great resemblance to some parts of New Holland, under the same parallel of latitude, several of its natural productions seeming to be the same, and the woods being without underwood, as in that country. The reefs on the coast and several other similarities were obvious to every one who had seen both countries. We observed all the northeast coast to be covered with shoals and breakers, extending to the northward, beyond the Isle of Balabir till they were lost in the horizon. Having made these observations, and our guides not choosing to go farther, we descended the mountains by a road different from that by which we ascended. This brought us down through some of their plantations in the plains, which I observed were laid out with great judgment, and cultivated with much labour. Some of them were lying in fallow, some seemingly lately laid down, and others of longer date, pieces of which they were again beginning to dig up. The first thing I observed they did was to set fire to the grass, etc., which had overrun the surface. Recruiting the land by letting it lie some years untouched is observed by all the nations in this sea, but they seem to have no notion of manuring it, at least I have nowhere seen it done, our excursion was finished by noon, when we returned on board to dinner, and, one of our guides having left us, we brought the other with us, whose fidelity was rewarded at a small expense. In the afternoon I made a little excursion along shore to the westward, in company with Mr. Wales. Besides making observations on such things as we met, we got the names of several places, which I then thought were islands, but upon farther inquiry I found they were districts upon the same land. This afternoon a fish being struck by one of the natives near the watering place, my clerk purchased it and sent it to me after my return on board. It was of a new species, something like a sunfish, with a large, long, ugly head. Having no suspicion of its being of a poisonous nature, we ordered it to be dressed for supper, but, very luckily, the operation of drawing and describing took up so much time that it was too late, so that only the liver and roe were dressed, 
of which the two Mr. Forsters and myself did but taste. About three o'clock in the morning we found ourselves seized with an extraordinary weakness and numbness all over our limbs. I had almost lost the sense of feeling, nor could I distinguish between light and heavy bodies of such as I had strength to move, a quart pot full of water and a feather being the same in my hand. We each of us took an emetic, and after that a sweat, which gave us much relief. In the morning, one of the pigs which had eaten the entrails was found dead. When the natives came on board and saw the fish hanging up, they immediately gave us to understand that it was not wholesome food, and expressed the utmost abhorrence of it, though no one was observed to do this when the fish was to be sold, or even after it was purchased. On the 8th, the guard and a party of men were on shore as usual. In the afternoon, I received a message from the officer, acquainting me that T. Boomer, the chief, was come with a present consisting of a few yams and sugar cane. In return, I sent him, amongst other articles, a dog and a bitch, both young but nearly full-grown. The dog was red and white, but the bitch was all red, or the colour of an English fox. I mention this because they may prove the Adam and Eve of their species in that country. When the officer returned on board in the evening, he informed me that the chief came, attended by about twenty men, so that it looked like a visit of ceremony. It was some time before he would believe the dog and bitch were intended for him, but as soon as he was convinced, he seemed lost in an excess of joy and sent them away immediately. Next morning early, I dispatched Lieutenant Pickersgill and Mr. Gilbert with the launch and cutter to explore the coast to the west judging this would be better effected in the boats than in the ship, as the reef would force the latter several leagues from land. After breakfast, a party of men were sent on shore to make brooms, but myself and the two Mr. Forsters were confined on board, though much better, a good sweat having had an happy effect. In the afternoon, a man was seen, both ashore and alongside the ship, said to be as white as a European, from the account I had of him, for I did not see him, his whiteness did not proceed from hereditary descent, but from chance or some disease, and such have been seen at Otaheite and the Society Isles. A fresh easterly wind, and the ship lying a mile from the shore, did not hinder those good-natured people from swimming off to us in shoals of twenty or thirty, and returning the same way. Footnote. Wafers met with Indians in the Isthmus of Darien of the colour of a white horse. See his description of the Isthmus, page 134. See also Mr. Depore's philosophical inquiries concerning Americans, where several other instances of this remarkable whiteness are mentioned, and the causes of it attempted to be explained. End footnote. On the 10th, a party was on shore as usual, and Mr. Forster so well recovered as to go out botanizing. In the evening of the 11th, the boats returned when I was informed of the following circumstances. From an elevation which they reached the morning they set out, they had a view of the coast. Mr. Gilbert was of opinion that they saw the termination of it to the west, but Mr. Pickersgill thought not though both agreed that there was no passage for the ship that way. From this place, accompanied by two of the natives, they went to Balabia, which they did not reach until after sunset, and left again next morning, before sunrise. Consequently, this was a fruitless expedition, and the two following days were spent in getting up to the ship. As they went down to the isle, they saw abundance of turtle but the violence of the wind and sea made it impossible to strike any. The cutter was near being lost by suddenly filling with water, which obliged them to throw several things overboard before they could free her and stop the leak she had sprung. From a fishing canoe, which they met coming in from the reefs, 
they got as much fish as they could eat, and they were received by Tiabi, the chief of the Isle of Balabia, and the people who came in numbers to see them with great courtesy. In order not to be too much crowded, our people drew a line on the ground and gave the others to understand they were not to come within it. This restriction they observed, and one of them soon after turned it to his own advantage. For happening to have a few coconuts, which one of our people wanted to buy, and he was unwilling to part with, he walked off and was followed by the man who wanted them. On seeing this, he sat down on the sand, made a circle round him, as he had seen our people do, and signified that the other was not to come within it, which was accordingly observed. As this story was well attested, I thought it not unworthy of a place in this journal. Early in the morning of the twelfth, I ordered the carpenter to work, to repair the cutter, and the water to be replaced, which we had expended the three preceding days. As Tibuma, the chief, had not been seen since he got the dogs, and I wanted to lay a foundation for stocking the country with hogs also, I took a young boar and a sow with me in the boat, and went up to the mangrove creek to look for my friend, in order to give them to him. But when we arrived there, we were told that he lived at some distance, and that they would send for him. Whether they did or not, I cannot say. But he not coming, I resolved to give them to the first man of note I met with. The guide we had to the hills happening to be there, I made him understand that I intended to leave the two pigs on shore, and ordered them out of the boat for that purpose. I offered them to a grave old man, thinking he was a proper person to entrust them with, but he shook his head, and he and all present made signs to take them into the boat again. When they saw I did not comply, they seemed to consult with one another what was to be done, and then our guide told me to carry them to the Aliki chief. Accordingly, I ordered them to be taken up, and we were conducted by him to a house, wherein were seated in a circle eight or ten middle-aged persons. To them, I and my pigs being introduced, with great courtesy, they desired me to sit down, and then I began to expatiate on the merits of the two pigs, explaining to them how many young ones the female would have at one time, and how soon these would multiply to some hundreds. My only motive was to enhance their value, that they might take the more care of them, and I had reason to think I in some measure succeeded. In the meantime, two men having left the company, soon returned with six yams, which were presented to me, and then I took my leave and went on board. I have already observed that here was a little village. I now found it much larger than I expected, and about it a good deal of cultivated land, regularly laid out, planted and planting with taro or eddy root, yams, sugar canes, and plantains. The taro plantations were prettily watered by little rills, continually supplied from the main channel at the foot of the mountains, from whence these streams were conducted in artful meanders. They have two methods of planting these roots. Some are in square or oblong patches, which lie perfectly horizontal and sink below the common level of the adjacent land, so that they can let in on them as much water as they think necessary. I have generally seen them covered two or three inches deep, but I do not know that this is always necessary. Others are planted in ridges about three or four feet broad, and two or two and a half high. On the middle or top of the ridge is a narrow gutter, in and along which is conveyed, as above described, a little rill that waters the roots, planted in the ridge on each side of it. And these plantations are so judiciously laid out that the same stream waters several ridges. These ridges are sometimes the divisions to the horizontal plantations, and when this method is used, which is for the most part observed where a pathway or something of that sort is requisite, 
not an inch of ground is lost. Perhaps there may be some difference in the roots which may make these two methods of raising them necessary. Some are better tasted than others, and they are not all of a colour. But be this as it may, they are very wholesome food, and the tops make good greens, and are eaten as such by the natives. On these plantations, men, women, and children were employed. In the afternoon, I went on shore, and on a large tree, which stood close to the shore, near the watering place, had an inscription cut, setting forth the ship's name, date, etc., as a testimony of our being the first discoverers of this country, as I had done at all others, at which we had touched, where this ceremony was necessary. This being done, we took leave of our friends and returned on board, where I ordered all the boats to be hoisted in, in order to be ready to put to sea in the morning. End of section 10. Section 11 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 9. A description of the country and its inhabitants, their manners, customs, and arts. 1774 September. I shall conclude our transactions at this place with some account of the country and its inhabitants. They are a strong, robust, active, well made people, courteous and friendly and not in the least addicted to pilfering, which is more than can be said of any other nation in this sea. They are nearly of the same colour as the natives of Tanna, but have better features, more agreeable countenances, and are a much stouter race, a few being seen who measured six feet four inches. I observed some who had thick lips, flat noses and full cheeks, and in some degree the features and look of a negro. Two things contributed to the forming of such an idea. First, their rough mop heads, and secondly, their besmearing their faces with black pigment. Their hair and beards are in general black. The former is very much frizzled, so that at first sight, it appears like that of a negro. It is, nevertheless, very different, though both coarser and stronger than ours. Some who wear it long tie it up on the crown of the head. Others suffer only a large lock to grow on each side, which they tie up in clubs. Many others, as well as all the women, wear it cropped short. These rough heads most probably want frequent scratching, for which purpose they have a most excellent instrument. This is a kind of comb made of sticks of hard wood from seven to nine or ten inches long and about the thickness of knitting needles. A number of these, seldom exceeding twenty, but generally fewer, is fastened together at one end, parallel to and near one-tenth of an inch from each other. The other ends, which are a little pointed, will spread out or open like the sticks of a fan, by which means they can beat up the quarters of an hundred lice at a time. These combs or scratchers, for I believe they serve both purposes, they always wear in their hair on one side of their head. The people of Tanna have an instrument of this kind for the same use, but theirs is forked, I think, never exceeding three or four prong, and sometimes only a small pointed stick. Their beards, which are of the same crisp nature as their hair, are, for the most part, worn short. Swelled and ulcerated legs and feet are common among the men, 
as also a swelling of the scrotum. I know not whether this is occasioned by disease or by the mode of applying the wrapper before mentioned, and which they use as a tanner and malicolo. This is their only covering, and is made generally of the bark of a tree, but sometimes of leaves. The small pieces of cloth, paper, etc., which they got from us, were commonly applied to this use. We saw coarse garments amongst them, made of a sort of matting, but they seemed never to wear them, except when out in their canoes and unemployed. Some had a kind of concave, cylindrical, stiff black cap, which appeared to be a great ornament among them, and we thought was only worn by men of note or warriors. A large sheet of strong paper, when they got one from us, was generally applied to this use. The women's dress is a short petticoat made of the filaments of the plantain tree, laid over a cord to which they are fastened and tied round the waist. The petticoat is made at least six or eight inches thick, but not one inch longer than necessary for the use design. The outer filaments are dyed black, and, as an additional ornament, the most of them have a few pearl oyster shells fastened on the right side. The general ornaments of both sexes are earrings of tortoiseshell, necklaces or amulets made both of shells and stones, and bracelets made of large shells which they wear above the elbow. They have punctures or marks on the skin on several parts of the body, but none, I think, are black, as at the eastern island. I know not if they have any other design than ornament, and the people of Tanna are marked much in the same manner. Were I to judge of the origin of this nation, I should take them to be a race between the people of Tanna and of the Friendly Isles, or between those of Tanna and the New Zealanders, or all three, their language in some respects being a mixture of them all. In their disposition they are like the natives of the Friendly Isles, but in affability and honesty they excel them. Notwithstanding their pacific inclination, they must sometimes have wars, as they are well provided with offensive weapons, such as clubs, spears, darts, and slings for throwing stones. The clubs are about two feet and a half long and variously formed. Some like a scythe, others like a pickaxe. Some have a head like an hawk, and others have round heads, but all are neatly made. Many of their darts and spears are no less neat and ornamented with carvings. The slings are as simple as possible, but they take some pains to form the stones that they use into a proper shape which is something like an egg, supposing both ends to be like the small one. They use a becket in the same manner as at Tanner in throwing the dart, which I believe is much used in striking fish, etc. In this they seem very dexterous, nor indeed do I know that they have any other method of catching large fish, for I neither saw hooks nor lines among them. It is needless to mention their working tools, as they are made of the same materials, and nearly in the same manner as at the other islands. Their axes, indeed, are a little different, some at least which may be owing to fancy as much as custom. Their houses, or at least most of them, are circular, something like a beehive, and full as close and warm. The entrance is by a small door or long square hole just big enough to admit a man bent double. The side walls are about four feet and a half high, but the roof is lofty and peaked to a point at the top, above which is a post or stick of wood, which is generally ornamented either with carving or shells or both. The framing is of small spars, reeds, etc., and both sides and roof are thick and close, covered with thatch, made of coarse, long grass. In the inside of the house are set up posts, to which cross spars are fastened, and platforms made, 
for the conveniency of laying anything on. Some houses have two floors, one above the other. The floor is laid with dry grass, and here and there mats are spread for the principal people to sleep or sit on. In most of them we found two fireplaces, and commonly a fire burning, and as there was no vent for the smoke but by the door, the whole house was both smoky and hot, insomuch that we, who were not used to such an atmosphere, could hardly endure it a moment. This may be the reason why we found these people so chilly when in the open air and without exercise. We frequently saw them make little fires anywhere and hustle round them with no other view than to warm themselves. Smoke within doors may be a necessary evil as it prevents the mosquitoes from coming in, which are pretty numerous here. In some respects their habitations are neat, for, besides the ornaments at top, I saw some with carved doorposts. Upon the whole, their houses are better calculated for a cold than a hot climate, and as there are no petitions in them, they can have little privacy. They have no great variety of household utensils, the earthen jars before mentioned being the only article worth notice. Each family has at least one of them in which they bake their roots and perhaps their fish, etc. The fire, by which they cook their victuals is on the outside of each house in the open air. There are three or five pointed stones fixed in the ground, their pointed ends being about six inches above the surface. Those of three stones are only for one jar, those of five stones for two. The jars do not stand on their bottom, but lie inclined on their sides. The use of these stones is obviously to keep the jars from resting on the fire, in order that it may burn the better. They subsist chiefly on roots and fish, and the bark of a tree, which I am told grows also in the West Indies. This they roast, and are almost continually chewing. It has a sweetish, insipid taste, and was liked by some of our people. Water is their only liquor, at least I never saw any other made use of. Plantains and sugar canes are by no means in plenty. Breadfruit is very scarce, and the coconut trees are small and but thinly planted, and neither one nor the other seems to yield much fruit. To judge merely by the numbers of the natives we saw every day, one might think the island very populous but I believe that at this time the inhabitants were collected from all parts on our account. Mr. Pickersgill observed that down the coast to the west there were but few people, and we knew they came daily from the other side of the land over the mountains to visit us, but although the inhabitants upon the whole may not be numerous, the island is not thinly populated on the sea coast, and in the plains and valleys that are capable of cultivation. It seems to be a country unable to support many inhabitants. Nature has been less bountiful to it than to any other tropical island we know in this sea. The greatest part of its surface, or at least what we saw of it, consists of barren rocky mountains, and the grass etc. growing on them is useless for people who have no cattle. The sterility of the country will apologize for the natives not contributing to the wants of the navigator. The sea may perhaps in some measure compensate for the deficiency of the land, for a coast surrounded by reefs and shoals, as this is, cannot fail of being stored with fish. I have before observed that the country bears great resemblance to New South Wales or New Holland and that some of its natural productions are the same. In particular, we found here the tree which is covered with a soft white ragged bark, easily peeled off, and is, as I have been told, the same that in the East Indies is used for caulking of ships. The wood is very hard, the leaves are long and narrow, of a pale dead green, and a fine aromatic, 
so that it may properly be said to belong to that continent nevertheless here are several plants etc common to the eastern and northern islands and even a species of the passion flower which i am told has never before been known to grow wild anywhere but in america our botanist did not complain for want of employment at this place every day bringing something new in botany or other branches of natural history land birds indeed are not numerous but several are new one of these is a kind of crow at least so we call it though it is not half so big and its feathers are tinged with blue they also have some very beautiful turtle doves and other small birds such as i never saw before all our endeavours to get the name of the whole island proved ineffectual probably it is too large for them to know by one name whenever we made this inquiry they always gave us the name of some district or place which we pointed to and as before observed i got the names of several with the name of the king or chief of each hence i conclude that the country is divided into several districts each governed by a chief but we know nothing of the extent of his power balade was the name of the district we were at and t Booma, the chief he lived on the other side of the ridge of hills so that we had but little of his company and therefore could not see much of his power t seems a title prefixed to the names of all or most of their chiefs or great men my friend honoured me by calling me t cook they deposit their dead in the ground i saw none of their burying places but several of the gentlemen did in one they were informed lay the remains of a chief who was slain in battle and his grave which bore some resemblance to a large molehill was decorated with spears darts paddles etc all stuck upright in the ground round about it the canoes which these people use are somewhat like those of the friendly isles but the most heavy clumsy vessels i ever saw they are what i call double canoes made out of two large trees hollowed out having a raised gunwale about two inches high and closed at each end with a kind of bulkhead of the same height so that the whole is like a long square trough about three feet shorter than the body of the canoe that is a foot and a half at each end two canoes thus fitted are secured to each other about three feet asunder by means of cross spars which project about a foot over each side over these spars is laid a deck or very heavy platform made of plank and small round spars on which they have a fire hearth and generally a fire burning and they carry a pot or jar to dress their victuals in the space between the two canoes is laid with plank and the rest with spars on one side of the deck and close to the edge is fixed a row of knees pretty near to each other the use of which is to keep the masts yards etc from rolling overboard they are navigated by one or two latine sails extended to a small latine yard the end of which fixes in a notch or hole in the deck the foot of the sail is extended to a small boom the sail is composed of pieces of matting the ropes are made of the coarse filaments of the plantain tree twisted into cords of the thickness of a finger and three or four more such cords mauled together served them for shrouds etc i thought they sailed very well but they are not at all calculated for rowing or paddling their method of proceeding when they cannot sail is by sculling and for this purpose there are holes in the boarded deck or platform through these they put the skulls which are of such a length that when the blade is in the water the loom or handle is four or five feet above the deck the man who works it stands behind and with both his hands sculls the vessel forward this method of proceeding is very slow and for this reason 
the canoes are but ill calculated for fishing especially for striking of turtle which i think can hardly ever be done in them their fishing implements such as i have seen are turtle nets made i believe of the filaments of the plantain tree twisted and small hand nets with very minute meshes made of fine twine and fish gigs their general method of fishing i guess is to lie on the reefs in shoal water and to strike the fish that may come in their way they may however have other methods which we had no opportunity to see as no boat went out while we were here all their time and attention being taken up with us their canoes are about thirty feet long and the deck or platform about twenty-four in length and ten in breadth we had not at this time seen any timber in the country so large as that of which their canoes were made it was observed that the holes made in the several parts in order to sew them together were burnt through but with what instrument we never learnt most probably it was of stone which may be the reason why they were so fond of large spikes seeing at once they would answer this purpose i was convinced they were not wholly designed for edge tools because every one showed a desire for the iron belaying pin which were fixed in the quarter-deck rail and seemed to value them far more than a spike nail although it might be twice as big these pins which are round perhaps have the very shape of the tool they wanted to make of the nails i did not find that a hatchet was quite so valuable as a large spike small nails were of little or no value and beads looking-glasses etc they did not admire the women of this country and likewise those of tanna are so far as i could judge far more chaste than those of the more eastern islands i never heard that one of our people obtained the least favour from any one of them i have been told that the ladies here would frequently divert themselves by going a little aside with our gentlemen as if they meant to be kind to them and then would run away laughing at them whether this was chastity or coquetry i shall not pretend to determine nor is it material since the consequences were the same end of section eleven section twelve of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two by james cook book three chapter ten part one proceedings on the coast of new caledonia with geographical and nautical observations seventeen seventy four september everything being in readiness to put to sea at sunrise on the thirteenth of september we weighed and with a fine gale at east by south stood out for the same channel we came in by at half past seven we were in the middle of it observatory isle bore south five degrees east distant four miles and the isle of balabir west northwest as soon as we were clear of the reef we hauled the wind to the starboard tack with a view of plying into the southeast but as mr gilbert was of opinion that he had seen the end or northwest extremity of the land and that it would be easier to get round by the northwest i gave over plying and bore up along the outside of the reef steering north northwest northwest and northwest by west as it trended at noon the island of balabir bore south by west distant thirteen miles and what we judged to be the west end of the great land bore southwest a half south 
and the direction of the reef was northwest by west. Latitude observed 19 degrees 53 minutes 20 seconds. Longitude from observatory aisle 14 minutes west. We continued to steer northwest by west along the outside of the reef till three o'clock, at which time the Isle of Balabir bore south by east a half east. In this direction, we observed a partition in the reef, which we judged to be a channel by the strong tide which set out of it. From this place, the reef inclined to the north for three or four leagues, and then to the northwest. We followed its direction, and as we advanced to northwest, raised more land, which seemed to be connected with what we had seen before, so that Mr. Gilbert was mistaken and did not see the extremity of the coast. At five o'clock, this land bore west by north a half north, distant twenty miles, but what we could see of the reef trended in the direction of northwest by north. Having hauled the wind to the starboard tack, and spent the night plying on the 14th at sunrise, the island of Balabir bore south six degrees east, and the land seen the preceding night west, but the reef still trended northwest, along which we steered with a light breeze at east-southeast. At noon we observed in latitude 19 degrees 28 minutes, longitude from observatory isle 27 minutes west. We had now no sight of Balabir, and the other land, that is, the northwest part of it, bore west by south a half south, but we were not sure if this was one continued coast or separate islands. For though some partitions were seen from space to space, which made it look like the latter, a multitude of shoals rendered a near approach to it exceedingly dangerous, if not impracticable. In the afternoon, with a fine breeze at east-south-east, we ranged the outside of these shoals, which we found to trend in the direction of northwest by west, northwest by north, and north-northeast. At three o'clock we passed a low sandy isle, lying on the outer edge of the reef in latitude 19 degrees 25 minutes, and in the direction of northeast from the northwesternmost land, six or seven leagues distant. So much as we could see of this space was strewn with shoals, seemingly detached from each other, and the channel leading in amongst them appeared to be on the southeast side of the sandy isle. At least there was a space where the sea did not break. At sunset, we could but just see the land, which bore southwest by south, about ten leagues distant. A clear horizon produced the discovery of no land to the westward of this direction. The reef, too, trended away west by north a half north, and seemed to terminate in a point which was seen from the masthead. Thus everything conspired to make us believe that we should soon get round these shoals, and with these flattering expectations we hauled the wind, which was at east-north-east, and spent the night making short boards. Next morning at sunrise, seeing neither land nor breakers, we bore away northwest by west, and, two hours after we saw the reef extending northwest farther than the eye could reach, no land was to be seen. It was therefore probable that we had passed its northwest extremity, and, as we had seen from the hills of Balade, its extent to the southwest, it was necessary to know how far it extended to the east or southeast while it was in our power to recover the coast. For, by following the direction of the shoals, we might have been carried so far to leeward as not to be able to beat back without considerable loss of time. We were already far out of sight of land, and there was no knowing how much farther we might be carried before we found an end to them. These considerations, 
together with the risk we must run in exploring a sea strewn with shoals and where no anchorage without them is to be found induced me to abandon the design of proceeding round by the northwest and to ply up to the southeast in which direction i knew there was a clear sea with this view we tacked and stood to the southeast with the wind at northeast by east a gentle breeze at this time we were in the latitude of nineteen degrees seven minutes south longitude one sixty three degrees fifty seven minutes east in standing to the south-east we did but just weather the point of the reef we had passed the preceding evening to make our situation the more dangerous the wind began to fail us and at three in the afternoon it fell calm and left us to the mercy of a great swell setting directly on the reef which was hardly a league from us we sounded but found no bottom with a line of two hundred fathoms i ordered the pinnace and cutter to be hoisted out to tow the ship but they were of little use against so great a swell we however found that the ship did not draw near the reef so fast as might be expected and at seven o'clock a light air at north north east kept her head to the sea but it lasted no longer than midnight when it was succeeded by a dead calm at daybreak on the 16th we had no sight of the reef, and at 11, a breeze springing up at south-south-west, we hoisted in the boats and made sail to south-east. At noon, we observed in 19 degrees 35 minutes south, which was considerably more to the south than we expected, and showed that a current or tide had been in our favour all night and accounted for our getting so unexpectedly clear of the shoals at two o'clock p m we had again a calm which lasted till nine when it was succeeded by a light air from east north east and east with which we advanced but slowly on the seventeenth at noon we observed in latitude nineteen degrees fifty four minutes when the isle of balabia bore south sixty eight degrees west ten and a half leagues distant we continued to ply with variable light winds between northeast and southeast without meeting with anything remarkable till the twentieth at noon when cape colnet bore north seventy eight degrees west distant six leagues from this cape the land extended round by the south to east south east till it was lost in the horizon and the country appeared with many hills and valleys latitude observed twenty degrees forty one minutes longitude made from observatory isle one degree eight minutes east we stood in shore with a light breeze at east till sunset when we were between two and three leagues off the coast extended from south forty two and a half degrees east to north fifty nine degrees west two small islets lay without this last direction distant from us four or five miles some others lay between us and the shore and to the east where they seemed to be connected by reefs in which appeared some openings from space to space the country was mountainous and had much the same aspect as about balade on one of the western small isles was an elevation like a tower and over a low neck of land within the isle were seen many other elevations resembling the masts of a fleet of ships next day at sunrise after having stood off all night with the light breeze at south-east we found ourselves about six leagues from the coast and in this situation we were kept by a calm till ten in the evening when we got a faint land breeze at south-west with which we steered south-east all night on the twenty-second at sunrise the land was clouded but it was not long before the clouds went off and we found by our landmarks that we had made a good advance at ten o'clock the land breeze being succeeded by a sea breeze at east by south this enabled us to stand in for the land 
which at noon extended from north 78 degrees west to south 31 and a half degrees east round by the south in this last direction the coast seemed to trend more to the south in a lofty promontory which on account of the day received the name of cape coronation latitude twenty two degrees two minutes longitude one sixty seven degrees seven and a half minutes east some breakers lay between us and the shore and probably they were connected with those we had seen before during the night we had advanced about two leagues to the southeast and at daybreak on the twenty third an elevated point appeared in sight beyond cape coronation bearing south twenty three degrees east it proved to be the southeast extremity of the coast and obtained the name of queen charlotte's foreland latitude twenty two degrees sixteen minutes south longitude one sixty seven degrees fourteen minutes east about noon having got a breeze from the northeast we stood to south southeast and as we drew towards cape coronation saw in the valley to the south of it a vast number of those elevated objects before mentioned and some low land under the foreland was wholly covered with them we could not agree in our opinions of what they were i suppose them to be a singular sort of trees being too numerous to resemble anything else and a great deal of smoke kept rising all the day from amongst those near the cape our philosophers were of opinion that this was the smoke of some internal and perpetual fire my representing to them that there was no smoke here in the morning would have been of no avail had not this eternal fire gone out before night and no more smoke been seen after they were still more positive that the elevations were pillars of basalts like those which compose the giant's causeway in ireland at sunset the wind veering round to the south we tacked and stood off it not being safe to approach the shore in the dark at daybreak we stood in again with a faint land breeze between east south east and south south east at noon observed in latitude twenty one degrees fifty nine minutes thirty seconds cape coronation being west southerly distant seven leagues and the foreland south thirty eight degrees west as we advanced south south west the coast beyond the foreland began to appear in sight and at sunset we discovered a low island lying south south east about seven miles from the foreland it was one of those which are generally surrounded with shoals and breakers at the same time a round hill was seen bearing south twenty four degrees east ten leagues distant during night having had variable light winds we advanced but little either way on the twenty fifth about ten o'clock a m having got a fair breeze at east south east we stood to the south south west in hopes of getting round the foreland but as we drew near we perceived more low isles beyond the one already mentioned which at last appeared to be connected by breakers extending towards the foreland and seeming to join the shore we stood on till half past three o'clock when we saw from the deck rocks just peeping above the surface of the sea on the shoal above mentioned it was now time to alter the course as the day was too far spent to look for a passage near the shore and we could find no bottom to anchor in during the night we therefore stood to the south to look for a passage without the small isles we had a fine breeze at east south east but it lasted no longer than five o'clock when it fell to a dead calm having sounded a line of a hundred and seventy fathoms did not reach the bottom or, though we were but a little way from the shoals which instead of following the coast to south west took a south east direction towards the hill we had seen the preceding evening 
and seemed to point out to us that it was necessary to go round that land. At this time, the most advanced point on the main bore south 68 degrees west, distant 9 or 10 leagues. About 7 o'clock we got a light breeze at north, which enabled us to steer out east-south-east and to spend the night with less anxiety. On some of the low isles were many of those elevations already mentioned. Every one was now satisfied they were trees, except our philosophers, who still maintained that they were basalts. About daybreak on the 26th, the wind having shifted to south-southwest, we stretched to south-east for the hill before mentioned. It belonged to an island which at noon extended from south 16 degrees east to south 7 degrees west, distant 6 leagues. Latitude observed 22 degrees 16 minutes south. In the p.m. the wind freshened and veering to south-south-east, we stretched to the east till 2 a.m. on the 27th, when we tacked and stood to south-west, with hopes of weathering the island, but we fell about two miles short of our expectations, and had to tack about a mile from the east side of the island, the extremes bearing from northwest by north to southwest, the hill west, and some low isles lying off the southeast point, south by west. These seemed to be connected with the large island by breakers. We sounded when in stays, but had no ground with a line of eighty fathoms. The skirts of this island were covered with the elevations more than once mentioned. They had much the appearance of tall pines, which occasioned my giving that name to the island. The round hill, which is on the southwest side, is of such a height as to be seen 14 or 16 leagues. The island is about a mile in circuit and situated in latitude 22 degrees 38 minutes south, longitude 167 degrees 40 minutes east. Having made two attempts to weather the Isle of Pines before sunset, with no better success than before, this determined me to stretch off till midnight. This day at noon the thermometer was at 68 and three quarter degrees, which is lower than it had been since the 27th of February. Having tacked at midnight, assisted by the currents and a fresh gale at east, south, east and south, east, next morning at daybreak we found ourselves several leagues to windward of the Isle of Pines and bore away large round the south-east and south sides. The coast from the south-east round by the south to the west was strewed with sandbanks, breakers, and small low isles, most of which were covered with the same lofty trees that ornamented the borders of the greater one. We continued to range the outside of these small isles and breakers, at three-fourths of a league distance, and as we passed one raised another, so that they seemed to form a chain extending to the isles which lie off the foreland. At noon we observed in latitude 22 degrees 44 minutes 36 seconds south, the Isle of Pines extending from north by east a half east to east by north, and Cape Coronation north 32 degrees 30 minutes west, distant 17 leagues. In the afternoon, with a fine gale at east, we steered northwest by west along the outside of the shoals with a view of falling in with the land a little to southwest of the foreland. At two o'clock, two low islets were seen bearing west by south, and as they were connected by breakers, which seemed to join those on our starboard, this discovery made it necessary to haul off southwest in order to get clear of them all. At three, more breakers appeared, extending from the low isles towards the southeast. We now hauled out close to the wind, and in an hour and a half, 
were almost on board the breakers and obliged to tack. From the masthead they were seen to extend as far as east-south-east, and the smoothness of the sea made it probable that they extended to the north of east, and that we were in a manner surrounded by them. At this time the hill on the Isle of Pines bore north 71.5 degrees east, the foreland north one quarter west, and the most advanced point of land on the southwest coast bore northwest, distant 15 or 16 leagues. This direction of the southwest coast, which was rather within the parallel of the northeast, assured us that this land extended no farther to the southwest. After making a short trip to north northeast, we stood again to the south in expectation of having a better view of the shoals before sunset. We gained nothing by this but the prospect of a sea strewed with shoals, which we could not clear but by returning in the track by which we came. We tacked nearly in the same place where we had tacked before, and on sounding found a bottom of fine sand. But anchoring in a strong gale, with a chain of breakers to leeward, being the last resource, I rather chose to spend the night in making short boards over that space we had, in some measure made ourselves acquainted with in the day. And thus it was spent, but under the terrible apprehension, every moment, of falling on some of the many dangers which surrounded us. End of section 12. Section 13 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2 by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 10, Part 2. Proceedings on the coast of New Caledonia with geographical and nautical observations. Continued. Daylight showed that our fears were not ill-founded and that we had been in the most imminent danger having had breakers continually under our lee and at a very little distance from us. We owed our safety to the interposition of Providence, a good lookout, and the very brisk manner in which the ship was managed. For, as we were standing to the north, the people on the lee gangway and forecastle saw breakers under the lee bow, which we escaped by quickly tacking the ship. I was now almost tired of a coast which I could no longer explore, but at the risk of losing the ship and ruining the whole voyage. I was, however, determined not to leave it till I knew what trees those were which had been the subject of our speculation, especially as they appeared to be of a sort useful to shipping and had not been seen anywhere but in the southern part of this land. With this view, after making a trip to the south, to weather the shoals under our lee, we stood to the north in hopes of finding anchorage under some of the islets on which these trees grow. We were stopped by eight o'clock by the shoals which lie extended between the Isle of Pines and Queen Charlotte's Foreland, and found soundings off them in fifty-five, forty, and thirty-six fathoms, a fine sandy bottom. The nearer we came to these shoals, the more we saw of them, and we were not able to say if there was any passage between the two lands. Being now but a few miles to windward of the low isles lying off the foreland, mentioned on the 25th and 26th, I bore down to the one next to us, as we drew near it, I perceived that it was unconnected with the neighbouring shoals, 
and that it is probable we might get to an anchor under its lee or west side. We therefore stood on, being conducted by an officer at the masthead, and after hauling round the point of the reef which surrounds the isle, we attempted to ply to windward in order to get nearer the shore. Another reef to the north confined us to a narrow channel, through which ran a current against us that rendered this attempt fruitless, so that we were obliged to anchor in thirty-nine fathoms water, the bottom fine coral sand, the isle bearing west by north one mile distant. As soon as this was done, we hoisted out a boat in which I went on shore, accompanied by the botanists. We found the tall trees to be a kind of spruce pine, very proper for spars, of which we were in want. After making this discovery, I hastened on board in order to have more time after dinner, when I landed again with two boats accompanied by several of the officers and gentlemen, having with us the carpenter and some of his crew to cut down such trees as were wanting. While this was doing, I took the bearings of several lands round. The hill on the Isle of Pines bore south, 59 degrees 30 minutes east, the low point of Queen Charlotte's foreland, north 14 degrees 30 minutes west, the high land over it, seen over two low isles, north 20 degrees west, and the most advanced point of land to the west bore west, half a point south, distant six or seven leagues. We had from several bearings ascertained the true direction of the coast from the foreland to this point, which I shall distinguish by the name of Prince of Wales Foreland. It is situated in the latitude of 22 degrees 29 minutes south, longitude 166 degrees 57 minutes east, is of considerable height, and, when it first appears above the horizon, looks like an island. From this cape, the coast trended nearly northwest. This was rather too northerly a direction to join that part, which we saw from the hills of Ballade. But as it was very high land which opened off the cape in that direction, it is very probable that lower land, which we could not see, opened sooner or else the coast more to the northwest takes a more westerly direction in the same manner as the northeast coast. Be this as it may, we pretty well know the extent of the land by having it confined within certain limits. However, I still entertained hopes of seeing more of it, but was disappointed. The little isle upon which we landed is a mere sandbank not exceeding three-fourths of a mile in circuit, and on it, beside these pines, grew the Atoa tree of Otaheite, and a variety of other trees, shrubs, and plants. These gave sufficient employment to our botanists all the time we stayed upon it, and occasioned my calling it Botany Isle. On it were several water snakes, some pigeons and doves, seemingly different from any we had seen. One of the officers shot a hawk, which proved to be of the very same sort as our English fishing hawks. Several fireplaces, branches and leaves very little decayed. Remains of turtle, etc., showed that people had lately been on the isle. The hull of a canoe precisely of the same shape as those we had seen at Belaid, lay wrecked in the sand. We were now no longer at a loss to know of what trees they make their canoes, as they can be no other than these pines. On this little isle were some which measured twenty inches diameter, and between sixty and seventy feet in length, and would have done very well for a foremast to the resolution had one been wanting. Since trees of this size are to be found on so small a spot, it is reasonable to expect to find some much larger on the main and larger isles, and if appearances did not deceive us, we can assert it.
if i except new zealand i at this time knew of no island in the south pacific ocean where a ship could supply herself with a mast or yard were she ever so much distressed for want of one thus far the discovery is or may be valuable my carpenter who was a mast maker as well as a shipwright two trades he learnt in Deptford yard was of opinion that these trees would make exceedingly good masts the wood is white close-grained tough and light turpentine had exuded out of most of the trees and the sun had inspissated it into a rosin which was found sticking to the trunks and lying about the roots these trees shoot out their branches like all other pines with this difference that the branches of these are much smaller and shorter so that the knots become nothing when the tree is wrought for use i took notice that the largest of them had the smallest and shortest branches and were crowned as it were at the top by a spreading branch like a bush this was what led some on board into the extravagant notion of their being basalts indeed no one could think of finding such trees here the seeds are produced in cones but we could find none that had any in them or that were in a proper state for vegetation or botanical examination besides these there was another tree or shrub of the spruce fir kind but it was very small we also found on the isle a sort of scurvy grass and a plant called by us lamb's quarters which when boiled each like spinach having got ten or twelve small spars to make studding sail booms boat masts etc and night approaching we returned with them on board the purpose for which i anchored under this isle being answered i was now to consider what was next to be done we had from the top masthead taken a view of the sea around us and observed the whole to the west to be strewn with small islets sandbanks and breakers to the utmost extent of our horizon they seemed indeed not to be all connected and to be divided by winding channels but when i considered that the extent of this southwest coast was already pretty well determined the great risk attending a more accurate survey and the time it would require to accomplish it on account of the many dangers we should have to encounter i determined not to hazard the ship down to leeward where we might be so hemmed in as to find it difficult to return and by that means lose the proper season for getting to the south i now wished to have had the little vessel set up the frame of which we had on board i had some thoughts of doing this when we were last at otaheite but found it could not be executed without neglecting the caulking and other necessary repairs of the ship or staying longer there than the route i had in view would admit it was now too late to begin setting her up and then to use her in exploring this coast and in our voyage to the south she could be of no service these reasons induced me to try to get without the shoals that is to the southward of them next morning at daybreak we got under sail with a light breeze at east by north we had to make some trips to weather the shoals to leeward of botany isle but when this was done the breeze began to fail and at three p m it fell calm the swell assisted by the current set us fast to southwest towards the breakers which were yet in sight in that direction thus we continued till ten o'clock at which time a breeze springing up at north northwest we steered east southeast the contrary course we had come in not daring to steer farther south till daylight seventeen seventy four october 
At three o'clock next morning, the wind veered to southwest, blew hard and in squalls, attended with rain, which made it necessary to proceed with our courses up and topsails on the cap till daybreak, when the hill on the Isle of Pines bore north, and our distance from the shore in that direction was about four leagues. We had now a very strong wind at south-southwest, attended by a great sea, so that we had reason to rejoice at having got clear of the shoals before this gale overtook us. Though everything conspired to make me think this was the westerly monsoon, it can hardly be comprehended under that name for several reasons. First, because it was near a month too soon for these winds. Secondly, because we know not if they reach this place at all. And lastly, because it is very common for westerly winds to blow within the tropics. However, I never found them to blow so hard before or so far southerly. Be these things as they may, we had now no other choice but to stretch to south-east, which we accordingly did with our starboard tacks aboard, and at noon we were out of sight of land. The gale continued with very little alteration till noon next day, at which time we observed in latitude 23 degrees 18 minutes, longitude made from the Isle of Pines, 1 degree 54 minutes east. In the afternoon we had little wind from the south and a great swell from the same direction, and many boobies, tropic and men-of-war birds were seen. At eleven o'clock, a fresh breeze sprung up at west by south, with which we stood to the south. At this time, we were in the latitude of 23 degrees 18 minutes, longitude 169 degrees 49 minutes east, and about 42 leagues south of the Hebrides. At eight o'clock in the morning, on the third, the wind veered to southwest and blew a strong gale by squalls, attended with rain. I now gave over all thought of returning to the land we had left. Indeed, when I considered the vast ocean we had to explore to the south, the state and condition of the ship, already in want of some necessary stores, that summer was approaching fast, and that any considerable accident might detain us in this sea another year, I did not think it advisable to attempt to regain the land. Thus I was obliged, as it were by necessity, for the first time to leave a coast I had discovered before it was fully explored. I called it New Caledonia, and if we accept New Zealand, it is perhaps the largest island in the South Pacific Ocean for it extends from the latitude of 19 degrees 37 minutes to 22 degrees 30 minutes south, and from the longitude of 163 degrees 37 minutes to 167 degrees 14 minutes east. It lies nearly northwest a half west and south east a half east, and is about 87 leagues long in that direction but its breadth is not considerable, not anywhere exceeding ten leagues. It is a country full of hills and valleys, of various extent both for height and depth. To judge of the whole by the parts we were on, from these hills spring vast numbers of little rivulets, which greatly contribute to fertilize the plain, and to supply all the wants of the inhabitants. The summits of most of the hills seem to be barren, though some few are clothed with wood, as are all the plains and valleys. By reason of these hills, many parts of the coast, when at a distance from it, appeared indented, or to have great inlets between the hills. But when we came near the shore, we always found such places shut up with low land, and also observed lowland to lie along the coast 
between the seashore and the foot of the hills. As this was the case in all such parts as we came near enough to see, it is reasonable to suppose that the whole coast is so. I am likewise of opinion that the whole or greatest part is surrounded by reefs or shoals which render the access to it very dangerous, but at the same time guard the coast from the violence of the wind and sea, make it abound with fish, secure an easy and safe navigation along it for canoes, etc., and, most likely, form some good harbours for shipping. Most, if not every part of the coast is inhabited, the Isle of Pines not excepted, for we saw either smoke by day or fires by night wherever we came. In the extent which I have given to this island is included the broken or unconnected lands to the northwest. That they may be connected, I shall not pretend to deny. We were, however, of opinion that they were isles, and that New Caledonia terminated more to south-east though this at most is but a well-founded conjecture. But whether these lands be separate isles or connected with New Caledonia, it is by no means certain that we saw their termination to the west. I think we did not, as the shoals did not end with the land we saw, but kept their northwest direction farther than Bougainville's track in the latitude of 15 degrees or 15 and a half degrees. Nay, it seems not improbable that a chain of isles, sandbanks and reef may extend to the west as far as the coast of New South Wales. The eastern extent of the isles and shoals off that coast between the latitude of 15 degrees and 23 minutes were not known. The resemblance of the two countries Bougainville's meeting with the shoal of Diana above 60 leagues from the coast. Footnote, see his voyage, English translation, page 303, end footnote, and the signs he had of land to the southeast all tend to increase the probability. I must confess that it is carrying probability and conjecture a little too far to say what may lie in the space of 200 leagues, but it is in some measure necessary were it only to put some future navigator on his guard. Mr. Wales determined the longitude of that part of New Caledonia we explored by 96 sets of observations, which were reduced to one another by our trusty guide, the watch. I found the variation of the compass to be 10 degrees 24 minutes east. This is the mean variation given by the three azimuth compasses we had on board, which would differ from each other a degree and a half, and sometimes more. I did not observe any difference in the variation between the northwest and southeast parts of this land except when we were at anchor before Belaid, where it was less than 10 degrees. But this I did not regard, as I found such an uniformity out at sea, and it is there where navigators want to know the variation. While we were on the northeast coast, I thought the currents set to southeast and west or northwest on the other side, but they are by no means considerable and may, as probably, be channels of tides as regular currents. In the narrow channels which divide the shoals and those which communicate with the sea, the tides run strong, but their rise and fall are inconsiderable, not exceeding three feet and a half. The time of high water at the full and change at Belade is about six o'clock, but at Botany Isle we judged it would happen about ten or eleven o'clock. End of section thirteen. Section fourteen of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, 
Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 3, Chapter 11. Sequel of the Passage from New Caledonia to New Zealand, with an account of the discovery of Norfolk Island, and the incidents that happened while the ship lay in Queen Charlotte's Sound. 1774 October the wind continuing at southwest west southwest and west blowing a fresh gale and now and then squalls with showers of rain we steered to south south east without meeting with any remarkable occurrence till near noon on the sixth when it fell calm at this time we were in the latitude of twenty seven degrees fifty minutes south longitude 171 degrees 43 minutes east the calm continued till noon the next day during which time we observed the variation to be 10 degrees 33 minutes east i now ordered the carpenters to work to caulk the decks as we had neither pitch tar nor rosin left to pay the seams this was done with varnish of pine and afterwards covered with coral sand which made a cement far exceeding my expectation in the afternoon we had a boat in the water and shot two albatrosses which were geese to us we had seen one of this kind of birds the day before which was the first we observed since we had been within the tropic on the seventh at one p m a breeze sprung up at south soon after it veered to and fixed at south-east by south and blew a gentle gale attended with pleasant weather we stretched to west-south-west and next day at noon were in the latitude of twenty eight degrees twenty five minutes longitude one seventy degrees twenty six minutes east in the evening mr cooper having struck a porpoise with a harpoon it was necessary to bring two and have two boats out before we could kill it and get it on board it was six feet long a female of that kind which naturalists call dolphin of the ancients and which differs from the other kind of porpoise in the head and jaw having them long and pointed this had eighty-eight teeth in each jaw the haslet and lean flesh were to us a feast the latter was a little liverish but had not the least fishy taste it was eaten roasted broiled and fried first soaking it in warm water indeed little art was wanting to make anything fresh palatable to those who had been living so long on salt meat we continued to stretch to west south west till the tenth when at daybreak we discovered land bearing south west which on a nearer approach we found to be an island of good height and five leagues in circuit i named it norfolk isle in honour of the noble family of howard it is situated in the latitude of twenty nine degrees two minutes thirty seconds south and longitude 168 degrees 16 minutes east. The latter was determined by lunar observations made on this, the preceding and following days, and the former by a good observation at noon, when we were about three miles from the isle. Soon after we discovered the isle, we sounded in 22 fathoms on a bank of coral sand. After this we continued to sound, and found not less than twenty-two or more than twenty-four fathoms except near the shore and the same bottom mixed with broken shells after dinner a party of us embarked in two boats and landed on the island without any difficulty behind some large rocks which lined part of the coast on the northeast side we found it uninhabited and were undoubtedly the first that ever set foot on it 
we observed many trees and plants common at New Zealand, and in particular the flax plant, which is rather more luxuriant here than in any part of that country. But the chief produce is a sort of spruce pine, which grows in great abundance and to a large size, many of the trees being as thick, breast high, as two men could fathom, and exceedingly straight and tall. This pine is a sort between that which grows in New Zealand and that in New Caledonia, the foliage differing somewhat from both, and the wood not so heavy as the former, nor so light and close-grained as the latter. It is a good deal like the Quebec pine, for about 200 yards from the shore, the ground is covered so thick with shrubs and plants as hardly to be penetrated further inland. The woods were perfectly clear and free from underwood, and the soil seemed rich and deep. We found the same kind of pigeons, parrots and parakeets as in New Zealand, rails and some small birds. The sea fowl are white boobies, gulls, tern, etc., which breed undisturbed on the shores and in the cliffs of the rocks. On the isle is fresh water and cabbage palm, wood sorrel, sow thistle and samphire. Abounding in some places on the shore, we brought on board as much of each sort as the time we had to gather them would admit. These cabbage trees or palms were not thicker than a man's leg and from 10 to 20 feet high. They are of the same genus with the coconut tree. Like it, they have large pinnated leaves and are the same as the second sort found in the northern parts of New South Wales. Footnote Vide Hawksworth Voyages, Volume 3, page 624. End footnote. The cabbage is, properly speaking, the bud of the tree. Each tree producing but one cabbage, which is at the crown, where the leaves spring out and is enclosed in the stem. The cutting off the cabbage effectually destroys the tree, so that no more than one can be had from the same stem. The coconut tree and some others of the palm kind produce cabbage as well as these. This vegetable is not only wholesome, but exceedingly palatable, and proved the most agreeable repast we had for some time. The coast does not want fish. While we were on shore, the people in the boats caught some which were excellent. I judged that it was high water at the fall and change, about one o'clock and that the tide rises and falls upon a perpendicular about four or five feet. The approach of night brought us all on board when we hoisted in the boats and stretched to east-north-east with a wind at south-east till midnight when we tacked and spent the remainder of the night making short boards. Next morning at sunrise we made sail stretching to south-south-west and weathered the island, on the south side of which lie two isles that serve as roosting and breeding places for birds. On this, as also on the south-east side, is a sandy beach, whereas most of the other shores are bounded by rocky cliffs which have twenty and eighteen fathoms water close to them. At least so we found it on the northeast side, and with good anchorage. A bank of coral sand mixed with shells, on which we found from nineteen to thirty-five or forty fathoms water, surrounds the isle, and extends especially to the south, seven leagues off. The morning we discovered the island, the variation was found to be thirteen degrees nine minutes east but I think this observation gave too much, as others which we had, both before and after, gave two degrees less. After leaving Norfolk Isle, I steered for New Zealand, my intention being to touch at Queen Charlotte's Sound, 
to refresh my crew and put the ship in a condition to encounter the southern latitudes. On the 17th at daybreak, we saw Mount Egmont, which was covered with everlasting snow, bearing southeast to half east. Our distance from the shore was about eight leagues, and on sounding, we found seventy fathoms water, a muddy bottom. The wind soon fixed in the western board, with which we steered south-south-east for Queen Charlotte Sound, with a view of falling in with Cape Stevens. At noon, Cape Egmont bore east-north-east, distant three or four leagues, and though the mount was hid in the clouds, we judged it to be in the same direction as the Cape. Latitude observed 39 degrees 24 minutes. The wind increased in such a manner as to oblige us to close reef our topsails and strike topgallant yards. At last we could bear no more sail than the two courses and two close reefed topsails, and under them we stretched for Cape Stevens, which we made at eleven o'clock at night. At midnight we tacked and made a trip to the north till three o'clock next morning, when we bore away for the sound. At nine we hauled round Point Jackson, through a sea which looked terrible, occasioned by a rapid tide and a high wind, but as we knew the coast it did not alarm us. At eleven o'clock we anchored before Ship Cove, the strong flurries from off the land, not permitting us to get in. In the afternoon, as we could not move the ship, I went into the cove with the Seine to try to catch some fish. The first thing I did after landing was to look for the bottle I left hid when last there, in which was the memorandum. It was taken away, but by whom it did not appear. Two hauls with the Seine, producing only four small fish, we, in some measure, made up for this deficiency by shooting several birds, which the flowers in the garden had drawn thither, as also some old shags, and by robbing the nests of some young ones. Being little wind next morning, we weighed and warped the ship into the cove, and there moored with the two bowers. We unbent the sails to repair them, several having been split and otherwise damaged in the late gale. The main and four courses, already worn to the very uttermost, were condemned as useless. I ordered the top masts to be struck and unrigged, in order to fix to them movable chocks or knees, for want of which the trestle trees were continually breaking. The forge to be set up to make bolts and repair our ironwork, and tents to be erected on shore for the reception of a guard, coopers, sailmakers, etc. I likewise gave orders that vegetables, of which there were plenty, should be boiled every morning with oatmeal and portable broth for breakfast, and with peas and broth every day for dinner for the whole crew over and above their usual allowance of salt meat. In the afternoon, as Mr. Wales was setting up his observatory, he discovered that several trees, which were standing when we last sailed from this place, had been cut down with saws and axes, and a few days after, the place where an observatory, clock, etc., had been set up was also found in a spot different from that where Mr. Wales had placed his. It was, therefore, now no longer to be doubted that the adventure had been in this cove after we had left it. Next day, wind southerly, hazy, clouded weather. Everybody went to work at their respective employments, one of which was to cork the ship's sides, a thing much wanted. The seams were paid with putty, made from cook's fat and chalk, the gunner happening to have a quantity of the latter on board. The 21st, wind southerly with continual rains. 
the weather being fair in the afternoon of the 22nd, accompanied by the botanists, I visited our gardens on Motuara, which we found almost in a state of nature, having been wholly neglected by the inhabitants. Nevertheless, many articles were in a flourishing condition and showed how well they liked the soil in which they were planted. None of the natives having yet made their appearance, we made a fire on the point of the island in hopes, if they saw the smoke, they might be induced to come to us. Nothing remarkable happened till the 24th, when, in the morning, two canoes were seen coming down the sound, but as soon as they perceived the ship, they retired behind a point on the west side. After breakfast, I went in a boat to look for them, and as we proceeded along the shore, we shot several birds. The report of the muskets gave notice of our approach, and the natives discovered themselves in Shag Cove by hallooing to us. But as we drew near to their habitations, they all fled to the woods, except two or three men who stood on a rising ground near the shore with their arms in their hands. The moment we landed, they knew us. Joy then took place of fear, and the rest of the natives hurried out of the woods and embraced us over and over again, leaping and skipping about like madmen. But I observed that they would not suffer some women, whom we saw at a distance, to come near us. After we had made them presents of hatchets, knives, and what else we had with us, they gave us in return a large quantity of fish, which they had just caught. There were only a few amongst them whose faces we could recognize, and on our asking why they were afraid of us, and inquiring for some of our old acquaintances by name, they talked much about killing, which was so variously understood by us, that we could gather nothing from it, so that after a short stay, we took leave and went on board. Next morning early, our friends, according to a promise they had made us the preceding evening, paying us a visit, brought with them a quantity of fine fish, which they exchanged for Otaheitan cloth, etc., and then returned to their habitations. On the 26th, we got into the afterhold, four boatload of shingle ballast, and struck down six guns, keeping only six on deck. Our good friends, the natives, having brought us a plentiful supply of fish, afterwards went on shore to the tents, and informed our people there that a ship like ours had been lately lost in the strait, that some of the people got on shore, and that the natives stole their clothes, etc., for which several were shot. And afterwards, when they could fire no longer, the natives having got the better, killed them with their patapatoos and eat them, but that they themselves had no hand in the affair, which, they said, happened at Vana Aroa, near Terawita, on the other side of the strait. One man said it was two moons ago, but another contradicted him and counted on his fingers about twenty or thirty days. They described by actions how the ship was beat to pieces by going up and down against the rocks, till at last it was all scattered abroad. The next day some others told the same story, or nearly to the same purport, and pointed over the East Bay, which is on the east side of the Sound, as to the place where it happened. These stories making me very uneasy about the adventure, I desired Mr. Wales and those on shore to let me know if any of the natives should mention it again, or to send them to me, for I had not heard anything from them myself. When Mr. Wales came on board to dinner, he found the very people who had told him the story on shore, and pointed them out to me. I inquired about the affair, and endeavoured to come at the truth by every method I could think of. All I could get from them was, Corey, no, 
and they not only denied every syllable of what they had said on shore, but seemed wholly ignorant of the matter, so that I began to think our people had misunderstood them, and that the story referred to some of their own people and boats. On the 28th, fresh gales westerly and fair weather, we rigged and fitted the topmasts. Having gone on a shooting party to West Bay, we went to the place where I left the hogs and fowls, but saw no vestiges of them, nor of anybody having been there since. In our return, having visited the natives, we got some fish in exchange for trifles which we gave them. As we were coming away, Mr. Forster thought he heard the squeaking of a pig in the woods, close to their habitations. Probably they may have those I left with them when last here. In the evening we got on board with about a dozen and a half of wild fowl, shags and sea pies. The sportsmen who had been out in the woods near the ship were more successful among the small birds. On the 29th and 30th nothing remarkable happened, except that in the evening of the latter all the natives left us. The 31st being a fine pleasant day, our botanists went over to Long Island, where one of the party saw a large black boar. As it was described to me, I thought it might be one of those which Captain Furneaux left behind, and had been brought over to this isle by those who had it in keeping. Since they did not destroy those hogs when first in their possession, we cannot suppose they will do it now, so that there is little fear but that this country will in time be stocked with these animals, both in a wild and domestic state. 1774 November. Next day we were visited by a number of strangers who came up from the sound and brought with them but little fish. Their chief commodity was green stone or talc, an article which never came to a bad market, and some of the largest pieces of it I had ever seen were got this day. On the second, I went over to the east side of the sound, and, without meeting anything remarkable, returned on board in the evening, when I learnt that the same people who visited us the preceding day had been on board most of this with their usual article of trade. On the third, Mr. Pickersgill met with some of the natives, who related to him the story of a ship being lost and the people being killed, but added, with great earnestness, it was not done by them. On the fourth, fine, pleasant weather. Most of the natives now retired up the sound. Indeed, I had taken every gentle method to oblige them to be gone, for since these newcomers had been with us, our old friends had disappeared, and we had been without fish. Having gone over to Long Island to look for the hog which had been seen there, I found it to be one of the sows left by Captain Furneaux, the same that was in the possession of the natives when we were last here. From the supposition of its being a boar, I had carried over a sow to leave with him, but on seeing my mistake brought her back, as the leaving her there would answer no end. Early in the morning of the 5th, our old friends made us a visit, and brought a seasonable supply of fish. At the same time, I embarked in the pinnace with Messrs. Forsters and Sparman, in order to proceed up the sound. I was desirous of finding the termination of it, or rather of seeing if I could find any passage out to sea by the south-east as I suspected from some discoveries I had made when first here. In our way up we met with some fishers, of whom we made the necessary inquiry, and they all agreed that there was no passage to the sea by the head of the sound. As we proceeded, we, some time after, met a canoe conducted by four men coming down the sound. These confirmed what the others had said in regard to there being no passage to the sea the way we were going, but gave us to understand that there was one to the east in the very place where I expected to find it. 
I now laid aside the scheme of going to the head of the sound and proceeded to this arm, which is on the southeast side, about four or five leagues above the Isle of Matuara. A little within the entrance on the southeast side, at a place called Koti Gehuni, we found a large settlement of the natives, the chief whose name is Tringo Buhi, and his people, whom we found to be some of those who had lately been on board the ship, received us with great courtesy. They seemed to be pretty numerous both here and in the neighbourhood. Our stay with them was short, as the information they gave us encouraged us to pursue the object we had in view. Accordingly, we proceeded down the arm east-north-east and east-by-north, leaving several fine coves on both sides, and at last found it to open into the strait by a channel about a mile wide, in which ran out a strong tide, having also observed one setting down the arm all the time we had been in it. It was now about four o'clock in the afternoon, and in less than an hour after, this tide ceased and was succeeded by the flood, which came in with equal strength. The outlet lies southeast by east and northwest by west, and nearly in the direction of east southeast and west northwest from Cape Terawita. We found thirteen fathoms water a little within the entrance, clear ground. It seemed to me that a leading wind was necessary to go in and out of this passage on account of the rapidity of the tides. I, however, had but little time to make observations of this nature, as night was at hand, and I had resolved to return on board. On that account, I omitted visiting a large hippo, or stronghold, built on an elevation on the north side, and about a mile or two within the entrance. The inhabitants of it, by signs, invited us to go up to them, but without paying any regard to them, we proceeded directly for the ship, which we reached by ten o'clock, bringing with us some fish we had got from the natives, and a few birds we had shot. Amongst the latter were some of the same kinds of ducks we found in Dusky Bay, and we have reason to believe that they are all to be met with here, for the natives knew them all by the drawings, and had a particular name for each. On the 6th, wind at northeast, gloomy weather with rain, our old friends having taken up their abode near us, one of them, whose name was Padero, a man of some note, made me a present of a staff of honour, such as the chiefs generally carry. In return, I dressed him in a suit of old clothes, of which he was not a little proud. He had a fine person and a good presence, and nothing but his colour distinguished him from a European. Having got him and another into a communicative mood, we began to inquire of them if the adventure had been there during my absence and they gave us to understand, in a manner which admitted of no doubt, that soon after we were gone she arrived, that she stayed between ten and twenty days, and had been gone ten months. They likewise asserted that neither she nor any other ship had been stranded on the coast, as had been reported. This assertion, and the manner in which they related the coming and going of the adventure, made me easy about her, but did not wholly set aside our suspicions of a disaster having happened to some other strangers. Besides what has been already related, we had been told that a ship had lately been here, and was gone to a place called Tarato, which is on the north side of the strait. Whether this story related to the former or no, I cannot say. Whenever I question the natives about it, they always denied all knowledge of it, and for some time past had avoided mentioning it. It was but a few days before that one man received a box on the ear for naming it to some of our people. After breakfast, I took a number of hands over to Long Island in order to catch the sow, to put her to the boar, and remove her to some other place. But we returned without seeing her, 
Some of the natives had been there not long before us, as their fires were yet burning, and they had undoubtedly taken her away. Padero dined with us, ate of everything at table, and drank more wine than any one of us, without being in the least affected by it. The seventh, fresh gales at northeast with continual rain. The eighth, four-part rain, remained a fair weather. We put two pigs, a boar and a sow, on shore in the cove next without Cannibal Cove, so that it is hardly possible all the methods I have taken to stock this country with these animals should fail. We had also reason to believe that some of the cocks and hens which I left here still existed, although we had not seen any of them, for an hen's egg was, some days before, found in the woods almost new laid. On the ninth, wind westerly or northwest, squally with rain. In the morning we unmoored and shifted our berth further out of the cove, for the more ready getting to sea the next morning, for at present the caulkers had not finished the sides, and till this work was done we could not sail. Our friends having brought us a very large and seasonable supply of fish, I bestowed on Pedero a present of an empty oil jar, which made him as happy as a prince. Soon after, he and his party left the cove and retired to their proper place of abode with all the treasure they had received from us. I believe that they gave away many of the things they, at different times, got from us to their friends and neighbours, or else parted with them to purchase peace of their more powerful enemies, for we never saw any of our presents after they were once in their possession. And every time we visited them, they were as much in want of hatchets, nails, etc., to all appearance, as if they never had had any among them. I am satisfied that the people in this sound, who are upon the whole pretty numerous, are under no regular form of government, or so united as to form one body politic. The head of each tribe or family seems to be respected, and that respect may, on some occasions, command obedience. But I doubt if any amongst them have either a right or power to enforce it. The day we were with Tringo Buhi, the people came from all parts to see us, which he endeavoured to prevent. But though he went so far as to throw stones at some, I observed that very few paid any regard either to his words or actions, and yet this man was spoken of as a chief of some note. I have, before, made some remarks on the evils attending these people, for want of union among themselves, and the more I was acquainted with them, the more I found it to be so. Notwithstanding they are cannibals, they are naturally of a good disposition, and have not a little humanity. In the afternoon, a party of us went ashore into one of the coves, where were two families of the natives, variously employed some sleeping, some making mats, others roasting fish and fur roots, and one girl, I observed, was heating of stones. Curious to know what they were for, I remained near her. As soon as the stones were made hot, she took them out of the fire and gave them to an old woman who was sitting in the hut. She placed them in a heap, laid over them a handful of green celery, and over that a coarse mat, and then squatted herself down on her heels on the top of all, thus making a kind of Dutch warming pan, on which she sat as close as a hair on her seat. I should hardly have mentioned this operation if I had thought it had no other view than to warm the old woman's backside. I rather suppose it was intended to cure some disorder she might have on her, which the steams arising from the green celery might be a specific for. I was led to think so 
by there being hardly any celery in the place, we having gathered it long before, and grass of which there was great plenty would have kept the stones from burning, the mat full as well, if that had been all that was meant. Besides, the woman looked to me sickly and not in a good state of health. Mr. Wales, from time to time, communicated to me the observations he had made in this sound for determining the longitude, the mean results of which gave 174 degrees 25 minutes 7.5 seconds east for the bottom of Ship Cove, where the observations were made, and the latitude of it is 41 degrees 5 minutes 50.5 seconds south. In my chart constituted in my former voyage, this place is laid down in 184 degrees 54 minutes 30 seconds west, equal to 175 degrees 5 minutes 30 seconds east. The error of the chart is therefore 0 degrees 40 minutes 0 seconds, and nearly equal to what was found at Dusky Bay by which it appears that the whole of Tavai Puanumi is laid down 40 minutes too far east in the said chart, as well as in the journal of the voyage. But the error in Iahaino Mobi is not more than half a degree or 30 minutes, because the distance between Queen Charlotte Sound and Cape Palliser has been found to be greater by 10 minutes of longitude than is laid down in the chart. I mention these errors not from a fear that they will affect either navigation or geography, but because I have no doubt of their existence. For, from the multitude of observations which Mr. Wales took, the situation of few parts of the world is better ascertained than Queen Charlotte's sound. Indeed, I might with equal truth say the same of all the other places where we made any stay. For Mr. Wales, whose abilities are equal to his assiduity, lost no one observation that could possibly be obtained. Even the situation of those islands which we passed without touching at them is, by means of Kendall's watch, determined with almost equal accuracy. The error of the watch from Otaheite to this place was only 43 minutes, 39 and a half seconds in longitude, reckoning at the rate it was found to go at, at that island and at Tanner. But by reckoning at the rate it was going when last at Queen Charlotte Sound, and from the time of our leaving it to our return to it again, which was near a year, the error was 19 minutes, 31 seconds. 25 in time, or 4 degrees 52 minutes 48 and a quarter seconds in longitude. This error cannot be thought great if we consider the length of time and that we had gone over a space equal to upwards of three fourths of the equatorial circumference of the earth and through all the climates and latitudes from 9 degrees to 71 degrees. Mr. Wales found its rate of going here to be that of gaining 12.576 seconds on mean time per day. The mean result of all the observations he made for ascertaining the variation of the compass and the dip of the south end of the needle, the three several times we had been here, gave 14 degrees 9 and one fifth minutes east for the former, and 64 degrees 36 and two-thirds minutes for the latter. He also found from very accurate observations that the time of high water preceded the moon southing on the full and change days by three hours, and that the greatest rise and fall of the water was five feet ten inches and a half. But there were evident tokens on the beach of its having risen two feet higher than ever it did in the course of his experiments.
End of section 14 and end of book 3. Section 15 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 4 from leaving new zealand to our return to england chapter one the run from new zealand to terra del fuego with the range from cape de seda to christmas sound and description of that part of the coast 1774 november at daybreak on the 10th with a fine breeze at west northwest we weighed and stood out of the sound and after getting round the two brothers, steered for Cape Campbell, which is at the southwest entrance of the strait. All sails set with a fine breeze at north. At four in the afternoon we passed the Cape at a distance of four or five leagues, and then steered south, southeast, a half east, with the wind at northwest, a gentle gale, and cloudy weather. Next morning the wind veered round by the west to south, and forced us more to the east than I intended. At seven o'clock in the evening, the snowy mountains bore west by south, and Cape Palliser north a half west, distant sixteen or seventeen leagues, from which Cape I for the third time took my departure. After a few hours calm, a breeze springing up at north, we steered south by east, all sail set, with a view of getting into the latitude of 54 or 55 degrees, my intention being to cross this vast ocean nearly in these parallels, and so to pass over those parts which were left unexplored the preceding summer. In the morning of the 12th, the wind increased to a fine gale. At noon, we observed in latitude 43 degrees 13 minutes 30 seconds south, longitude 176 degrees 41 minutes east an extraordinary fish of the whale kind was seen which some called a sea monster i did not see it myself in the afternoon our old companions the pindado petrels began to appear on the 13th in the morning the wind veered to west southwest at seven seeing the appearance of land to southwest we hauled up towards it and soon found it to be a fog bank. Afterwards we steered southeast by south and soon after saw a seal. At noon, latitude by account, 44 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 177 degrees 31 minutes east. Foggy weather which continued all the afternoon. At six in the evening, the wind veered to northeast by north and increased to a fresh gale attended with thick, hazy weather. Course steered southeast one quarter south. On the 14th a.m. saw another seal. At noon, latitude 45 degrees 54 minutes, longitude 179 degrees 29 minutes east. On the 15th a.m., the wind veered to the westward, the fog cleared away, but the weather continued cloudy. At noon, latitude 47 degrees 30 minutes, longitude 178 degrees 19 minutes west, for having passed the meridian of 180 degrees east, I now reckon my longitude west of the first meridian, viz. Greenwich. In the evening heard penguins, and the next morning saw some sea or rock weed. At noon, a fresh gale from the west and fine weather. Latitude observed 49 degrees 33 minutes, longitude 175 degrees 31 minutes west. Next morning, fresh gales and hazy weather, saw a seal and several pieces of weed. 
At noon, latitude 51 degrees 12 minutes, longitude 173 degrees 17 minutes west. The wind veered to the north and northeast by north, blew a strong gale by squalls, which split an old topgallant sail, and obliged us to double reef the topsails. But in the evening, the wind moderated and veered to west northwest when we loosed a reef out of each topsail and found the variation of the compass to be 9 degrees 52 minutes east, being then in the latitude 51 degrees 47 minutes, longitude 172 degrees 21 minutes west, and at the next morning, the 18th, in the latitude of 52 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 170 degrees 45 minutes west. It was 10 degrees 26 minutes east. Towards noon had moderate but cloudy weather and a great swell from the west. Some penguins and pieces of seaweed seen. On the 19th steered east-south-east with a very fresh gale at north, hazy dirty weather. At noon, latitude 53 degrees 43 minutes, longitude 166 degrees 15 minutes west. On the 20th, steered east by south with a moderate breeze at north, attended with thick hazy weather. At noon, latitude 54 degrees 8 minutes, longitude 162 degrees 18 minutes west. On the 21st, winds mostly from the northeast, a fresh gale attended with thick, hazy, dirty weather. Course southeast by south, latitude at noon 55 degrees 31 minutes, longitude 160 degrees 29 minutes, abundance of blue petrels and some penguins seen. Fresh gales at northwest by north and north by west and hazy till towards noon of the 22nd, when the weather cleared up and we observed in latitude 55 degrees 48 minutes south, longitude 156 degrees 56 minutes west. In the afternoon had a few hours calm. After that, the wind came at south, southeast and southeast by south, a light breeze with which we steered east northerly. In the night, the aurora australis was visible but very faint and in no ways remarkable. On the 23rd, in the latitude of 55 degrees 46 minutes south, longitude 156 degrees 13 minutes west, the variation was 9 degrees 42 minutes east. We had a calm from 10 in the morning till 6 in the evening, when a breeze sprung up at west. At first it blew a gentle gale, but afterwards freshened. Our course was now east a half north. On the 24th, a fresh breeze at northwest by west and north by west. At noon, in latitude 55 degrees 38 minutes south, longitude 153 degrees 37 minutes west. Foggy in the night, but next day had a fine gale at northwest, attended with clear, pleasant weather. Course steered east by north. In the evening, being in the latitude of 55 degrees 8 minutes south, longitude 148 degrees 10 minutes west, the variation by the mean of two compasses was 6 degrees 35 minutes east. Having a steady fresh gale at north-northwest on the 26th and 27th, we steered east and at noon on the latter were in latitude 55 degrees 6 minutes south, longitude 138 degrees 56 minutes west. I now gave up all hopes of finding any more land in this ocean, and came to a resolution to steer directly for the west entrance of the Straits of Muggle House, with a view of coasting the out or south side of Terra del Fuego round Cape Horn to the Strait Le Maire. As the world has but a very imperfect knowledge of this shore, I thought the coasting of it would be of more advantage, both to navigation and to geography, 
than anything I could expect to find in a higher latitude. In the afternoon of this day, the wind blew in squalls and carried away the main topgallant mast. A very strong gale northerly, with hazy rainy weather on the 28th, obliged us to double reef the fore and main topsail, to hand the mizzen topsail, and get down the fore topgallant yard. In the morning, the bolt rope of the main topsail broke and occasioned the sail to be split. I have observed that the ropes to all our sails, the square sails especially, are not of a size and strength sufficient to wear out the canvas. At noon, latitude 55 degrees 20 minutes south, longitude 134 degrees 16 minutes west, a great swell from northwest, albatrosses and blue petrels seen. Next day, towards noon, the wind abating, we loosed all the reefs out of the topsails, rigged another topgallant mast, and got the yards across. P.M. Little wind and hazy weather. At midnight, calm, that continued till noon the next day, when a breeze sprung up at east, with which we stretched to the northward. At this time we were in the latitude 55 degrees 32 minutes south, longitude 128 degrees 45 minutes west, some albatrosses and petrels seen. At 8 p.m., the wind veering to northeast, we tacked and stood to east-south-east. 1774 December. On the 1st of December, thick hazy weather with drizzling rain and a moderate breeze of wind, which, at 3 o'clock p.m., fell to a calm. At this time, in latitude 55 degrees 41 minutes south, longitude 127 degrees 5 minutes west. After four hours calm, the fog cleared away, and we got a wind at southeast, with which we stood northeast. Next day, a fresh breeze at southeast and hazy foggy weather, except a few hours in the morning, when we found the variation to be 1 degree 28 minutes east, latitude 55 degrees 17 minutes, longitude 125 degrees 41 minutes west. The variation after this was supposed to increase, for on the 4th in the morning, being in latitude 53 degrees 31 minutes, longitude 121 degrees 31 minutes west, it was 3 degrees 16 minutes east. In the evening, in latitude 53 degrees 13 minutes, longitude 119 degrees 46 minutes west, it was 3 degrees 28 minutes east. And on the 5th, at 6 o'clock in the evening, in latitude 53 degrees 8 minutes, longitude 115 degrees 58 minutes west, it was 4 degrees 1 minute east. For more than 24 hours, having had a fine gale at south, this enabled us to steer east, with very little deviation to the north, and the wind now altering to southwest and blowing a steady fresh breeze, we continued to steer east, inclining a little to south. On the 6th had some snow showers, in the evening being in latitude 53 degrees 13 minutes, longitude 111 degrees 12 minutes, the variation was 4 degrees 58 minutes east, and the next morning being in latitude 58 degrees 16 minutes, longitude 109 degrees 33 minutes, it was 5 degrees 1 minute east. The wind was now at west, a fine pleasant gale, sometimes with showers of rain. Nothing remarkable happened till the ninth at noon, when being in the latitude of 53 degrees 37 minutes, longitude 103 degrees 44 minutes west, the wind veered to northeast and afterwards came insensibly round to the south by the east and southeast attended with cloudy, hazy weather and some showers of rain. 
On the 10th, a little before noon, latitude 54 degrees, longitude 102 degrees 7 minutes west, passed a small bed of seaweed. In the afternoon, the wind veered to southwest, blew a fresh gale, attended with dark, cloudy weather. We steered east half a point north, and the next day at six in the evening, being in latitude 53 degrees 35 minutes, longitude 95 degrees 52 minutes west, the variation was 9 degrees 58 minutes east, many and various sorts of albatrosses about the ship. On the 12th, the wind veered to the west, northwest, and in the evening to north, and at last left us to a calm that continued till midnight, when we got a breeze at south, which, soon after, veering to and fixing at west, we steered east, and on the 14th in the morning, found the variation to be 13 degrees 25 minutes east, latitude 53 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 87 degrees 53 minutes west, and in the afternoon being in the same latitude and the longitude of 86 degrees 2 minutes west, it was 15 degrees 3 minutes east, and increased in such a manner that, on the 15th, in the latitude of 53 degrees 30 minutes, longitude 82 degrees 23 minutes west, it was 17 degrees east, and the next evening, in the latitude of 53 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 78 degrees 40 minutes, it was 17 degrees 38 minutes east. About this time, we saw a penguin and a piece of weed and the next morning a seal and some diving petrels. For the last three days the wind had been at west, a steady fresh gale attended now and then with showers of rain or hail. At six in the morning of the 17th, being nearly in the same latitude as above, and in the longitude of 77 degrees 10 minutes west, the variation was 18 degrees 33 minutes east, and in the afternoon it was 21 degrees 38 minutes, being at that time in latitude 53 degrees 16 minutes south, longitude 75 degrees 9 minutes west. In the morning as well as in the afternoon, I took some observations to determine the longitude by the watch, and the results reduced to noon gave 76 degrees 18 minutes 30 seconds west. At the same time, the longitude, by my reckoning, was 76 degrees 17 minutes west. But I have reason to think that we were about half a degree more to the west than either the one or the other. Our latitude at the same time was 53 degrees 21 minutes south. We steered east by north and east a half north all this day, under all the sail we could carry, with a fine fresh gale at northwest by west, in expectation of seeing the land before night. But not making it till ten o'clock, we took in the studding sails, top gallant sails, and a reef in each topsail, and steered east north east in order to make sure of falling in with Cape de Seda. Two hours after, we made the land extending from northeast by north to east by south, about six leagues distant. On this discovery, we wore and brought two, with the ship's head to the south, and having sounded, found 75 fathoms water, the bottom stone and shells. The land now before us could be no other than the west coast of Terra del Fuego and near the west entrance of the Straits of Magalhaes. As this was the first run that had been made directly across this ocean in a high southern latitude, footnote, it is not to be supposed that I could have known at this time that the adventure had made the passage before me. End footnote. 
I have been a little particular in noting every circumstance that appeared in the least material, and, after all, I must observe that I never made a passage anywhere of such length, or even much shorter, where so few interesting circumstances occurred. For, if I accept the variation of the compass, I know of nothing else worth notice. The weather had been neither unusually stormy nor cold. Before we arrived in the latitude of 50 degrees, the mercury in the thermometer fell gradually from 60 to 50, and after we arrived in the latitude of 55 degrees, it was generally between 47 and 45. Once or twice it fell to 43. These observations were made at noon. I have now done with the Southern Pacific Ocean, and flatter myself that no one will think that I have left it unexplored, or that more could have been done in one voyage towards obtaining that end than has been done in this. Soon after we left New Zealand, Mr. Wales contrived and fixed up an instrument which very accurately measured the angle the ship rolled when sailing large and in a great sea, and that in which she lay down when sailing upon a wind. The greatest angle he observed her to roll was 38 degrees. This was on the 6th of this month when the sea was not unusually high, so that it cannot be reckoned the greatest roll she had made. The most he observed her to heel or lie down when sailing upon a wind was 18 degrees, and this was under double reef topsails and courses. On the 18th, at three in the morning, we sounded again and found 110 fathoms, the same bottom as before. We now made sail with a fresh gale at northwest and steered southeast by east along the coast. It extended from Cape de Seda, which bore north seven degrees east to east southeast, a pretty high ragged isle which lies near a league from the main, and south, 18 degrees east, six leagues east from Cape de Seda, bore north 49 degrees east, distant four leagues, and it obtained the name of landfall. At four o'clock we were north and south of the highland of Cape de Seda, distant about nine leagues, so that we saw none of the low rocks said to lie off it, the latitude of this cape is about 53 degrees south, longitude 74 degrees 40 minutes west. Continuing to range the coast at about two leagues distance, at 11 o'clock we passed a projecting point, which I called Cape Gloucester. It shows a round surface of considerable height and has much the appearance of being an island. It lies south south east a half east, distant seventeen leagues from the Isle of Landfall. The coast between them forms two bays, strewed with rocky islets, rocks, and breakers. The coast appeared very broken with many inlets, or rather it seemed to be composed of a number of islands. The land is very mountainous, rocky, and barren, spotted here and there with tufts of wood and patches of snow. At noon, Cape Gloucester bore north, distant eight miles, and the most advanced point of land to the southeast, which we judged to be Cape Noir, bore southeast by south, distant seven or eight leagues. Latitude observed 54 degrees 13 minutes south, longitude made from Cape to Seda 54 minutes east. From Cape Gloucester, off which lies a small rocky island, the direction of the coast is nearly southeast, but to Cape Noir, for which we steered, the course is south southeast, distant about ten leagues. At three o'clock we passed Cape Noir, which is a steep rock of considerable height, and the southwest point of a large island that seemed to lie detached a league or a league and a half from the mainland. The land of the Cape, when at a distance from it, 
appeared to be an island disjoined from the other, but on a nearer approach we found it connected by a low neck of land. At the point of the cape are two rocks, the one peak like a sugar loaf, the other not so high, and showing around the surface, and south by east two leagues from the cape are two other rocky islets. This cape is situated in the latitude of 54 degrees 30 minutes south, longitude 73 degrees 33 minutes west. After passing the two islets, we steered east-south-east, crossing the Great Bay of St. Barbara. We but just saw the land in the bottom of it, which could not be less than seven or eight leagues from us. There was a space lying in the direction of east-north-east from Cape Noir, where no land was to be seen. This may be the channel of St. Barbara, which opens into the Strait of Megalhens, as mentioned by Frisia. We found the Cape to agree very well with his description, which shows that he laid down the channel from good memoirs. At ten o'clock, drawing near the southeast point of the bay, which lies nearly in the direction of south 60 degrees east from Cape Noir, 18 leagues distant, we shortened sail and spent the night standing off and on. At two o'clock in the morning of the 19th, having made sail, we steered southeast by east along the coast and soon passed the southeast point of the Bay of St. Barbara, which I called Cape Desolation, because near it commenced the most desolate and barren country I ever saw. It is situated in the latitude of 54 degrees 55 minutes south, longitude 72 degrees 12 minutes west. About four leagues to the east of this cape is a deep inlet, at the entrance of which lies a pretty large island, and some others of less note. Nearly in this situation, some charts place a channel leading into the Straits of Magalhens, under the name of Straits of Jalusal. At ten o'clock, being about a league and a half from the land, we sounded and found sixty fathoms water, a bottom of small stones and shells. The wind, which had been fresh at north by west, began to abate and at noon it fell calm, when we observed in latitude 55 degrees 20 minutes south, longitude made from Cape de Seda, 3 degrees 24 minutes east. In this situation we were about three leagues from the nearest shore, which was that of an island. This I named Gilbert Isle after my master. It is nearly of the same height with the rest of the coast, and shows a surface composed of several peak rocks unequally high. A little to the south-east of it are some smaller islands, and without them, breakers. I have before observed that this is the most desolate coast I ever saw. It seems entirely composed of rocky mountains, without the least appearance of vegetation. These mountains terminate in horrible precipices, whose craggy summits spire up to a vast height, so that hardly anything in nature can appear with a more barren and savage aspect than the whole of this country. The inland mountains were covered with snow, but those on the sea coast were not. We judged the former to belong to the main of Terra del Fuego, and the latter to be islands so ranged as apparently to form a coast. After three hours calm, we got a breeze at southeast by east, and having made a short trip to south, stood in for the land, the most advanced point of which, that we had in sight, bore east, distant ten leagues. This is a lofty promontory lying east-south-east nineteen leagues from Gilbert Isle, and situated in latitude 55 degrees 26 minutes south, longitude 70 degrees 25 minutes west. Viewed from the situation we now were in, it terminated in two high towers, and within them a hill shaped like a sugar loaf. This wild rock, therefore, 
obtained the name of York Minster. Two leagues to the westward of this head appeared a large inlet, the west point of which we fetched in with by nine o'clock, when we tacked in forty-one fathoms water half a league from the shore. To the westward of this inlet was another, with several islands lying in the entrance. During the night between the 19th and 20th, we had little wind easterly, which in the morning veered to northeast and north-northeast, but it was too faint to be of use, and at 10 we had a calm when we observed the ship to drive from off the shore out to sea. We had made the same observation the day before. This must have been occasioned by a current, and the melting of the snow increasing, the inland waters will cause a stream to run out of most of these inlets. At noon, we observed in latitude 55 degrees 39 minutes 30 seconds south, York Minster then bearing north 15 degrees east, distant five leagues, and Round Hill just peeping above the horizon which we judged to belong to the Isles of St. Ildefonso, east 25 degrees south, 10 or 11 leagues distant. At 10 o'clock, a breeze springing up at east by south, I took this opportunity to stand in for the land, being desirous of going into one of the many ports which seemed open to receive us, in order to take a view of the country, and to recruit our stock of wood and water. In standing in for an opening which appeared on the east side of York Minster, we had 40, 37, 50 and 60 fathoms water, a bottom of small stones and shells. When we had the last soundings, we were nearly in the middle, between the two points that form the entrance to the inlet, which we observed to branch into two arms, both of them lying in nearly north and disjoined by an high rocky point. We stood for the eastern branch as being clear of islets, and after passing a black rocky one lying without the point just mentioned, we sounded and found no bottom with a line of an hundred and seventy fathoms. This was altogether unexpected and a circumstance that would not have been regarded if the breeze had continued, but at this time it fell calm, so that it was not possible to extricate ourselves from this disagreeable situation. Two boats were hoisted out and sent ahead to tow, but they would have availed little had not a breeze sprung up about eight o'clock at southwest, which put it in my power either to stand out to sea or up the inlet. Prudence seemed to point out the former, but the desire of finding a good port and of learning something of the country, getting the better of every other consideration, I resolved to stand in, and as night was approaching, our safety depended on getting to an anchor. With this view, we continued to sound, but always had an unfathomable depth. Hauling up under the east side of the land which divided the two arms, and seeing a small cove ahead, I sent a boat to sound, and we kept as near the shore as the flurries from the land would permit, in order to be able to get into this place, if there should be anchorage. The boat soon returned, and informed us that there were thirty and twenty-five fathoms water, a full cable's length from the shore. Here we anchored in thirty fathoms, the bottom sand and broken shells, and carried out a kedge and hawser to steady the ship for the night. End of section 15